Margot Wall, A Conspiracy of Astronomical Proportions Written and narrated by Miles Danko Preface To the reader, salutations. What you're about to embark on is a sort of an unconventional idea that may seem rather ambiguous, but it shall only seem ambiguous if you do not understand the thought process behind it. I have always pondered life's greatest questions. Where do we come from? Why are we here? And where did I leave my car keys? These questions have surely been pondered millions of times prior to my consciousness by other individuals dating back probably to the first humans. These have been pondered tirelessly, yet to date, we as humans have failed to come to a consensus on the matter, aside from perhaps the location of my car keys. I have pondered and pondered upon these questions and was never satisfied with the answers provided. Both science and religion provided their insights, but I always felt that every answer given generated more questions in the end. After hours upon hours of research, I'd find myself even getting more confused and full of doubt than in the beginning of my journey. The question shifted from where do we come from to how can I know for certain where we come from? And from why are we here to is there even a reason behind our existence? Could we even be certain that our existence exists? The question about my car keys usually remained steadfast and generated far fewer queries. So, how could I ever know for certain? I battled long to finally conclude that my quest for certainty will likely not materialize. No matter how certain anyone is, there is always the off chance they are wrong. Even if you are 99.99999% sure, there is that pesky 0.00001% chance that throws that certainty out the window. How could you ever find the true answer and prove it to 100% accuracy? How could you even deny all other possibilities? The chances that they are true are low, but those are chances nonetheless. With that in mind, I started thinking, what if science and religion were both completely wrong in their assessment of the universe? If I denied both, what would my theory look like? I, of course, could not prove my theory for certain, but why should I accept another person's theory? Were the first humans Adam and Eve? Were the first humans those fossilized remains? Where did the first humans leave their car keys? Perhaps everything is a lie and it's up to me to find out the truth. I came up with a few outlandish theories that had most people label me as a conspiracy theory nutjob. I took it as a compliment. I think most misunderstood my quest. The quest was to find the most outlandish what-if scenarios about the cosmos. Bear that in mind when reading through. I don't believe the text in this book to be gospel or a hypothesis of any kind. This is merely a work of literary fiction to tackle one important question. Where did I leave my car keys? A special thanks to my old friend Roman Yufa. If he hadn't taken me stargazing that night, I would have probably never came up with a story. Chapter 1. A Shining Star This is truly exciting. A giant Hubble mosaic of the Crab Nebula, this supernova remnant can be found in the constellation of Taurus. The professor pointed to the projected picture on the board. His voice was strong with conviction. If he was a little bit more excited, I think the podium he was standing behind would slowly start to levitate. He went on explaining the Crab Nebula as he kept swishing the slides, presenting more and more snapshots of various galaxies. The lecture hall was almost completely full. This particular one could fit up to 500 people. He seemed truly fascinated by these essentially floating masses of carbon. With every image that came up, his voice grew stronger. He was truly mesmerized by the vastness of the cosmos. This was highly ambiguous to me, the fascination that is. Here stood a grown man, about 45 or 50, who devoted his entire life to studying things he would never experience. He could never touch or feel the supernova. He could only watch it through telescopes or read about it in textbooks or astronomical magazines, perhaps. Yet he was fascinated to death with this phenomenon. For all he knew, the photo was actually doctored and put in place for people like him to buy into it. A photoshopped picture designed to sell better. I found it similar to a teenage girl who sits in her room all day idolizing some actor or musician. She'll probably never get to meet them. She does not know whether this person is real or just a character portrayed to market itself better but she idolizes it like the professor with the supernova. The funny thing is that if they should ever talk to each other, they would not understand what the other person sees in their idealization. The girl would think the supernova is just plain idiocy and the professor would probably disregard the current actor to be unnecessary. They did share a connection though. They were both interested in stars, whether in our galaxy or not. 
I guess I was never really fascinated by anything to that degree. I would find things interesting on a broad level, but once it started getting to the specifics, I would lose interest. This trait of mine would likely also explain my lack of success with women. I did find them interesting until they began speaking. Believe me, I know it is my fault and not women everywhere. I have developed this apathetical view on existence where nothing excites or disappoints me. A sort of emotional flatline, no peaks, no troughs. I was not certain when this nihilistic view of existence started with me. I was given all the opportunities one could hope or dream of. My family has been very supportive of any activity I was looking to participate in, but I was never interested in pursuing anything further. I should have really paid attention in class instead of thinking about these trivial useless observations. Maybe I would have not been failing if I did that more often. I wish I had the passion this professor had. I thought he probably carried the same wish. Looking at the lecture hall, one person was sleeping, another one was on their phone, one was playing games on his laptop. This one was just looking out the window. I always found it weird why people went to class just to sleep. This is university. Nobody took attendance. Nobody cared if you were here. You were better off sleeping at home. The sleep would have been better and you would have been more refreshed, but excuse me for using logic. Logic is overrated anyways. It is all about doing the first thing that comes to mind, no matter how irrational. Most of the people at the lecture hall seemed to be paying attention to what the professor was saying. I was sitting somewhere around the middle of all the seats. I never liked sitting too much in the front or too much in the back. I had no particular explanation for my rationale behind this decision. It was merely a preference. To my side was my friend Oblivio, who was doing much better than me in this class, and dare I say, life in general. We knew each other since first grade. I wish there was an interesting story behind how our friendship started, but there was not. We were kids, and he was the first person I met. The rest of the relationship survived on inertia after that. Oblivio looked like he was interested in the lecture, but how the hell would I know? He was nodding, but that could be an expasm. He was taking notes, but he could just be writing the next great love song. He was getting more than me in class, but then again, he could have been sleeping with a professor. I knew I had to produce a controlled variable where I could have detected whether or not he was paying attention. Oblivio, do you understand what the professor is saying, I asked. Oblivio looked up, turned his head slightly to the left and stated with irritation in his voice, Be quiet, I'm trying to pay attention. I guess he was paying attention. But was he? This could have all been part of an elaborate plot. It's a possibility. One in a million, one in a trillion, but a possibility nonetheless. For all I knew, my whole life was scripted and everyone was an actor. Oblivio was just playing his part. He had to be the one who paid attention in class. And the guy right there was the one who was texting his friend. Of course, I would deny such assumptions from being correct, because a process so elaborate would require a tremendous amount of work and would raise several questions. Why was I chosen for this experiment? Why was there an experiment? Why were there not any other test subjects such as myself? Or maybe there were. What did I know? Who handled the administrative duties of the project like this? Did they get paid? If so, where did they get their funding? Where do you post ads for a job like this? Who would even apply for a job like this? What is certain? Nothing. Well, if nothing is certain, then we know one thing is certain, and that is nothing is certain. And if we know nothing is certain, then one thing is certain, but we don't even know that that is certain. Maybe everything is certain. I had to stop now before I got into an infinite regress. It would have been like the time I found out about the chicken and egg paradox. It was obviously the chicken. But was it? Maybe it was the omelette. Why are we so concerned with chicken and eggs when there are people starving in the world? The third world must look at us with disgust. They wish to have a chicken or an egg so they can eat and live to see another day. We just use them for philosophical paradigms. All these thoughts I just denied. I guess it was boredom that sparked up all these ludicrous questions in my mind. Well, either that or years of drug abuse. I didn't even know why I was taking astronomy. I hate the universe. Let's face it, there's nothing better outside of Earth. We have edible panties, we were obviously the superior species. Well, I could have always gone back to philosophy. That was much better. A major with a million questions except one important one. How can I support a family, or even myself, with this knowledge? The hand on the clock struck four. All the students were anxiously awaiting to depart the class. They all had better things to do. Sleep, eat, party, defecate in public, and consume lethal amounts of alcohol so they could be accepted by their peers. But not necessarily in that order. The professor took his time summarizing the material as the majority of the class slowly began to rise. This was probably the highest level of concentration in the class. I thought this moment would last forever. Time has literally ceased moving. Well, that could have been the malfunctioning clock. 
Every second felt like an hour, every hour like a day. I started panicking. Maybe I would never get to leave this wretched place. Maybe I was stuck here for eternity. Please, any higher powers out there, release me from this torture. I could not bear this any longer. I could have snapped momentarily. A drop of cold sweat ran down the back of my neck as a deep voice emerged around me. Class dismissed. So, how'd you find the lecture? Asked Oblivio. Eh, wasn't too bad, I replied. Chapter 2 It's a bird. It's a plane. No, it's Rabbi Rabinowitch. Just listen, will ya? A nasally voice awoke me from my pleasant slumber. My eyes were blurry. The image slowly began to clarify. I've listened to your argument a thousand times and it's always the same drivel followed by more drivel. Another voice was heard. This one was familiar. Definitely, that one was oblivious to my left. Wait, how could I have made such an assertion before my eyes have regained full visibility? Surely, it sounded like him. It sounded as though it was coming from the left. But I had no way of knowing until my eyes returned to their full function. And, even if they did, how could I trust what I have seen? It could have all been a great show put together for some person's sick, twisted entertainment. Sometimes I feel I have a very high view of my existence. Everyone, and I mean everyone, is there to study my actions. Then I remembered, nobody really gives a fuck. My eyes have cleared up and the sun was shining directly into my retina. I closed my eyes from the immense brightness and lowered my head. Opening my eyes, I saw Oblivio to my left and Certus to my right. I then remember what has caused my consciousness to cease, and that was tremendous boredom. Oblivio and Certus always argued about one thing and one thing only. Religion. Oblivio, con, Certus, pro. It would last so long I would start asking questions like, if God exists, why won't both of you just shut the hell up? I lost track of their conversation, so I had to figure out at which point of the argument they were. These would generally end in one of them throwing a fit and leaving. This makes perfect sense. How dare you question my reasoning? Something can come out of nothing. Your theory makes no sense. Certus proclaimed with increased angst in his voice. My theory makes no sense. This is coming from a guy who believes in talking snakes, people living in whales, and on several occasions has stated their rabbis can fly. Oblivio grew more and more agitated. Wait, uh, rabbis can fly? I quipped. Of course they can fly, Certus stated in an almost derogatory tone. Their soul is so powerful it can leap them off the ground without regards to their human body. The body is merely a temporary vessel. The soul is eternal. Well, now it makes much more sense, I sarcastically stated. Pardon me, Certus, but may I ask you one question? Oblivio spoke politely. Ask away, Certus answered. Are you completely out of your mind? Were you dropped on your head as a child? Oblivio continued as the passion grew in his voice. How can I listen to a guy who believes that rabbis can fly and also simultaneously believes that he makes sense? Show me a flying rabbi and I'll believe you. Yeah, especially after September 11th, Norad will shoot down any unidentified flying object. I added as both Certus and Oblivio looked at me with rage. Keep making your silly little jokes, Certus laughed sarcastically. Deep down, you know I'm correct. Well, I definitely think acidic Jews can fly, I said. It's pronounced Hasidic, Certus corrected me. Believe me, if they believe they can fly, acid is involved. Certus stood up silently and walked away. He seemed disappointed. About what though? I never understood religious people saying they do not want their faith to be ridiculed. You know you're going to heaven. Why do you care? You think God needs you to defend him, her, it? I thought God was omnipotent, could do anything. Why would he care about some 20-something-year-old guy not believing in him? Did he have self-esteem issues I was not aware of? Maybe we should have gotten him one of those self-help books. Though it may have been challenging finding one that targets omnipotent deities, as it's a very niche market. Certus is challenged, Oblivio proclaimed. Uh, what gave that away? I rhetorically answered. I love when he says he knows it's all true. You know, some people believe, and some people believe they know. Yeah, that would be the precise reason not to engage beings like that in conversation. How can you argue with someone who thinks they are always right and you're always wrong? There is no sense associating with people like that. And don't get me started on Certus. Very funny. At least I don't believe something just magically created everything. Yeah, it was obviously the Big Bang. Of course. And uh, what created that? We don't know yet. Maybe it magically appeared? Haha, <laughs> Oblivio laughed sarcastically. At least we are trying to find out instead of just creating a new being to simplify matters. Who is this we you keep mentioning? I'm pretty sure you have nothing to do with the research process. I haven't seen your name on any publications. I trust the scientists. So you put your faith in them? Exactly. No, not faith. This is truth. Unbiased, undeniable, verifiable truth. 
The scientific method has nothing to do with faith, so you read every research that is out there regarding religion. Of, of course not. So how would you assume you are correct and not certus? Sounds to me like you both took a leap of faith. I finished my sentence and Oblivio grunted. He did not wish to continue our discussion. I always loved it when there was a debate between two extremes. Take a radical Muslim and a radical Jew in a room together and listen to their arguments. It's hilarious. Both sides use the same thought process, logic, even the same book. The only difference is the original assumption. I will not boil down any argument between extremists. I am part of this group and that is why it is always correct and everyone else is wrong. A Muslim or a Jew are likely to be born into their faith. So, if someone says Islam is the only correct religion, the Muslim would say, that guy is correct. He will need no further arguments or proof. The Jew will always denounce that person as a conspiracy theorist or a radical, but will adore someone who says that Judaism is the only correct religion. Both sides try to present their arguments intelligently, but it all boils down to that. I'm Hindu, so all Hindus are correct. I'm Christian, so all Christians are correct. I'm a Scientologist, so can I please have $400? Oblivio was acting the same way. His original assumption was that science was correct and Certus assumed God was the way to go. Either way, I thought I upset Oblivio with my comments. I was obviously incorrect. We sat quietly for a while until Oblivio decided to offer me an offer I could not refuse. You wanna go stargazing tonight? Sorry, did I say I could not refuse? I meant to say I would rather watch paint dry instead of doing that. Watching balls of lights is truly great entertainment. What could be more fun than that? Anything really. Stargazing is like your arguments with Certus, best done without me. I responded with my usual quick-witted remarks. This is definitely not a quick-witted remark. And plus, do you have anything better to do? Oblivio retorted. Ah, it has been three full weeks since I last trimmed my belly hair. I thought I could maybe do that. I answered grinningly. Do you even like stars? Mm, not really. Why are you majoring in astronomy then? Isn't it obvious? No, for the ladies. Chapter 3 Goodness gracious great balls of light Driving down the back of an old beat up minivan, I noticed an almost eternal nothingness surrounding me. Merely fields upon fields of grass and asphalt. It seemed like a post-apocalyptic scene from a low-budget sci-fi movie. The sun was slowly setting, emanating a dark red color representing the end of humanity's existence. We were the only humans left, traveling in our clunker in search of resources. The infection has spread everywhere. There were no survivors. Unless, of course, you call being a zombie surviving. I mean, they are the living dead, not really dead. Alas, the situation was not nearly as badass as a zombie apocalypse. Oblivio has convinced me to go stargazing. We've been traveling for over an hour. Why do we need to go so far to see some stars? I asked Oblivio. I was getting rather bored. We need to head out of the city because the light pollution interferes with the telescope's ability to see the stars. Oblivio responded. Oh lord, you're sure you're not just planning to rape me and get rid of my body? That would make sense as to why we're driving to such a remote location. Rape? No, but if you keep this up, I'm definitely leaning towards the getting rid of the body. Haha, <laughs> what's the point of all of this again? What are you trying to find here? Well, tedium, thank you for asking. Oblivio replied with a cheerful tone. By the way, I don't think I've introduced myself. I am tedium. I thought it would have been weird if I referred to myself in the third person. People who do that tend to come off a bit pretentious. Not to worry, tedium will not be doing that. In any case, Oblivio went on explaining that Jupiter would only be visible for a short period of time and that any other day would have not worked due to the cloud coverage. This was literally the only night we could catch Jupiter this year. We arrived at our destination and left the van. I'm truly surprised to survive the trip. It was miserably cold. There was no snow on the ground, but only visible, dry, frozen land as far as the eyes can see. I thought, what did I get myself into? I have no idea why I've agreed to this. Maybe I had nothing better to do. Maybe I was fascinated by other people's fascinations. Oblivio was willing to travel all the way here and stand in the cold for hours just to get a glimpse of a tiny ball of light. I understood Jupiter was larger than it seen in a telescope, but on a telescope lens, it was a tiny ball of light. As I already spent over an hour getting there, I figured I would wait for Oblivio for further instruction. Oblivio took a better part of an hour setting the telescope up. I wanted to start a fire, but he told me that the light would interfere with the telescope. Great times, standing in the freezing cold with no fire or booze to keep me warm. I also did not trust that that van will start back up in these temperatures. I already planned my survival plan. If I got even a little bit hungry, I was going to eat Oblivio. I thought it was fair. He brought us here, he should be the one to be eaten first. If he didn't want to be eaten, he should have brought witnesses. I went on scavenging for supplies before my body became weak. 
I was gathering twigs and shrubs just in case Oblivia needed a bit of grilling. I think I had a pack of the ketchup somewhere too. Does human meat go well with ketchup? What does human meat taste like? Chicken? Anyways, I was about to find out. Oblivia noticed me and asked, Hey, I told you no fire, why are you gathering wood? I looked at him and replied, No reason, just something to do. I think he bought it. He did not suspect a thing. Hey, Oblivio, random question. At which point would you resort to cannibalism? Oblivio looked at me with confusion and said, Stop interrupting with your stupid questions, I'm trying to set this up. Perfect. I then knew I had the evolutionary advantage. If the time came where cannibalism was the only option, I had already accepted the fact Oblivio would be slowly roasted on this flame. He would hesitate before eating his best friend, thus allow me to overtake him swiftly. Now that I think about it, human meat will probably taste well. Free range, organic, free of antibiotics or hormones. I thought, why wait until I starve? There was no one around, no one would know what happened. Why are you looking at me and salivating? Oblivio asked. No reason, I answered quickly as I snapped back to reality. You are safe for now, Oblivio. For now. Oblivio was hard at work calibrating the telescope. Well, if we go to the coordinates here, we should be able to see the moon. Here it is, take a look. Oblivio was so excited. He kept on begging me to look at it. I neglectfully looked at it and proclaimed, Wow, that is actually more boring than I anticipated. Like, don't get me wrong, I thought it would be a circle of light, but I never anticipated for it to be this circle of light. Sensing my cynicism, Oblivio replied, If you didn't want to come, you could have stayed at home. You practically begged me to join you here in the freezing cold. I didn't think you would be such a nuisance. Oblivio threw his arms in the air. What's the big deal here anyways? It's a star, I get it, it's far away and it's uninhabitable. You know there are better pictures on Google. High definitions, you can see every crate. It's not the same, Oblivio cried. That's what people always say, it's not the same. Just because it's not the same does not make it worse. For example, having your wallet stolen is not the same as eating pancakes. By your logic, we should all have our wallet stolen just because it's not the same as some fancy flapjacks. You know what I mean. No, I don't. We already study this in class day after day. I want to spend my free time enjoying myself and not wasting it on this nonsense. Whatever. Oblivio did not feel like arguing. He simply went back to the telescope and watched the stars. I'm not sure exactly why I got so upset. I knew what I was getting myself into. Oblivio enjoyed this sort of thing, he shared the same passion as the professor. Why did I ridicule others' interests? I do not have any passion towards anything. Is that why I belittled others that do? Maybe I found it weird that not everyone was as apathetic as me. Who knew? All I knew was that Oblivio was my friend and I should have at least tried to have a good time here. There was no sense sitting around and pouting. I must say, with self-reflection like this I should have majored in psychology. I would have made a great shrink. Granted, this was probably the same reasoning I had when I switched to astronomy after watching Armageddon. Chapter 4. You never know who's listening. Oblivio kept on looking at different points of interest in the universe. I decided to play nice. It was almost 2am. It was the time we have all been waiting for. Jupiter. Oblivio was getting very excited, and I remained indifferent, as always. I was not going to take this moment away from Oblivio with some sarcastic remark or analogy. I was going to let him enjoy this moment, and then ridicule him later. He was my ride home, so I knew there was only so far I could push him. This was more than a hobby for Oblivio. He was seriously obsessed. He spent all his savings on the newest technology available. Morning telescope, evening telescope, different lenses. He even asked his parents for astronomy-related gifts for any occasion. His parents nearly declared bankruptcy financing this obsession. One of his birthdays, they even bought him a star on a faraway galaxy. It's not like he can go there and claim it as his own, build a few houses, open a casino and a brothel and legalize every drug possible. It was a certificate that said a star has been named after you. Humans really think they control everything. We see it and it's ours. We don't even know if there's any inhabitants or other alien life forms that claim the planet. We merely assume it is ours. I mean, I don't see your name on it. It is part of the human experience, the great spirit of exploration. Humans used to wonder what was beyond the mountain or lake, what species lived there, what terrain were we to face, did they have better looking women than our tribe. Then, one day, one curious cat went over to the other side and discovered the answers to all those queries. Granted, this mostly resulted in conflicts and civilian casualties. I often wondered, what would be the fate of mankind if we actually met an alien life form? My first instinct tells me bloodshed. Lots and lots of bloodshed. However, another part of me thinks that the alien life forms perhaps do not have blood, so there would only be half the bloodshed. I guess it is the cynic in me. However, can you prove me wrong? 
Humans have been fighting for resources since we first appeared, and we have not stopped since. In fact, we have become better at murdering one another in the pursuit of discovery. Oblivio, appropriately named, did not see it in that way. He thought that this will end well and this pursuit would push the human race to the next step of evolution. I thought he should have probably been called Naivo. So what do you plan to find out there? I asked Oblivio. Jupiter, of course. I've been talking about it for like a month. Did you forget already? He answered while fiddling with his telescope. No, this is not meant to be taking a sexual innuendo. I don't mean tonight. In the grand scheme of things, what is the purpose of all this? I don't think I follow you. Why go out here and look at stars? Is this just a waste of time or is there something else that you're searching for? Like uh, an alien life form? Oblivio was getting increasingly confused by the lines of questioning. Doesn't have to be an alien life form. What I'm looking at is more why are you so passionate towards astronomy in general? Out of all the interest one can have, why this one? Why not sports or cooking? Why the stars? Oblivio remained silent. Judging by his facial expressions, it seemed he had never truly thought about it. He seemed puzzled as he attempted to answer the question with little success, mostly uttering incoherent noises until surrendering and returning to his telescope. He was really confused. He kept on adjusting his telescope, pausing periodically to stare into the distance. I think I really got to him this time. He was really stumped. Usually when I asked him these philosophical questions, he quickly responded and promptly rejected whatever notion I was presenting. He brushed it off as idle conversation for people who had no true understanding of the universe. He really despised the spiritual word and especially spiritual people. However, I was starting to see that he had been discounting far more than the spiritual realm. He had been discounting his own self-reflection. This was a first for me. The man with all the answers had no answer. What was even more troubling was that he could not answer a question about the subject he was most familiar with, himself. I started wondering, how did all of this come to fruition? Did his parents push him into this and he never questioned it? Did he just choose this and decide to immerse himself in this lifestyle? I was beginning to feel just as puzzled as Oblivio about this question, if not more. The man had an undeniable passion towards space. It was the only thing he ever talked about. He spent countless hours researching galaxies, planets, black holes, nebulas, and could answer any question or doubt about it. He was essentially a walking, talking encyclopedia. I always thought someone with this level of commitment would surely know the reason for their interest, at the very least, the motivation behind it. I had no passions. However, at least I understood my lack of motivation or excitement was derived from that apathy. Oblivious passion was derived from what? Ignorance? Perhaps to be truly passionate to that degree, one must ignore that part of the brain questioning their motives. If one falls victim to constantly questioning their decisions and behaviors, then they would likely begin to lose interest. Let's face it, why not care more about any other subject? Oblivia could have just as easily been a political activist, historian, chef, fireman, or anything else. He would have been successful at his endeavors regardless of the field he chose. He would put in the time and effort required for him to be the best at it. Hours upon hours dedicated to pursue his dreams. But would that truly make him happy? Was that even his goal in life? To be happy? Based on my history with him, I thought he was more motivated by being miserable. Oblivio kept on fidgeting with his telescope. He was taking fewer breaks to stare into the distance, but was beginning to look increasingly frustrated. It was about 30 minutes since either one of us had said anything, so I decided to take the first step. I was getting tired being in my own head. I had to speak to someone to avoid the cannibalistic thoughts entering my brain again. What seems to be the matter? I asked. Oblivio kept on moving things around, looking at his phone, checking out the manual, and back to the telescope. What seems to be wrong? I asked again. Oblivio kept on ignoring me. He was focused on resolving whatever has been going on. He was not paying attention to anything else. I decided to take things up a notch. I had sex with your mother. My voice was heard loudly throughout the forest. Oblivio looked at me confused. There was an awkward silence in the air, but at least I had his undivided attention. You did, did what? Oblivio stammered. Well, now that I have your attention, what is the problem? I asked, hoping for a response this time around. The problem? You had sex with my mother, that's the problem! Oblivio shouted in frustration. I obviously did not. I was only trying to get your attention, and it worked. You were joking? Of course I was. Who wants your mom anyways? She's not at all attractive. All right, enough. No mom jokes. It is very juvenile to just insult my family. If you don't have anything important to say, don't say it. I was asking what is wrong, and you were ignoring me. So now, let's put your ugly mother behind us and just let me know what's going on. It's Jupiter. I, I can't seem to locate it. Oblivio went on to explain that he has been trying to find Jupiter with no success. He checked the coordinates multiple times, however, instead of a glowing light, he only saw darkness. Are you sure you have everything correct? I inquired. Yes, I checked multiple times. I've been posting questions on forums online and everyone agrees Jupiter should be visible. 
It's not there. It just doesn't make sense. Oblivio was getting increasingly frustrated. His eyes started to twitch and the vein running through his forehead began to become more and more visible. Wait a second, did you say forms? I was confused. Yes, online communities where you post questions and other enthusiasts answer it. Holy crap, you mean to tell me there are other people doing this right now? Of course, not everyone's like you, Tedium. People find this interesting. What is the internet for if not a platform for people to communicate and share ideas? I thought it was for cat videos, pornography, and hate speech. That's just the websites you visit. Other intelligent people use it to actually expand their knowledge as opposed to just waste their time. Cat videos, pornography, leaving mean comments on useless videos. That is what's wrong with our society. No one wants to learn anything. No one wants to progress humanity. Everyone just wants to share a photo of their dinner on social media. Great, you are eating food. So does everybody else. Why not use the internet to actually better yourself? Oblivio's rant left his face red with anger. I remained silent for a few seconds and then decided to reply. I mean, there are people who form communities to achieve a common goal online. I'm pretty sure it's how terrorists coordinate their attacks. I thought that was pretty funny. Oblivio did not. Hilarious. Just be quiet. Your nonsense is starting to get on my last nerve. Don't worry, next time I won't bring you. Oblivio turned back to the telescope and I looked away. That interaction cut me deep. After all, I could not bear not going stargazing again. What a useless threat. I did not even want to be there. Back to square one. It was dark, cold, and Oblivio was silent. This vast nothingness was pretty much what I imagined space to be like. Boring. I was not sure why I didn't bring something to occupy my time here while Oblivio pursued his dream with unknown motivations. Some music to listen to would have been nice. Some drugs or alcohol would have been better. But I had nothing. I was quite surprised Oblivio was able to get a signal out here and log into the internet. I could not even get regular reception, let alone access to the civilized world. I would have loved to utilize the internet for the way it was intended. Cat videos, pornography, and hate speech. Alas, I was stuck there for an indefinite amount of time with no prospects for entertainment. Nothing exciting ever happened while stargazing. No one in the history of the universe has started a story with, so I was stargazing and... And if they did, it would most likely be a story you would not want to hear. No arrests, strippers, fights, etc. If I was to tell this story to someone else, and trust me, I will do no such thing, I would probably fill it with a bunch of lies. The first lie would be about going stargazing. I would then continue to lie by stating there was a lot of excitement going around. Another 20 minutes have passed by and still nothingness. A metaphorical tumbleweed rolled over the horizon as the metaphorical crickets gathered to cricket. At that point, I wish there were actual tumbleweeds and crickets. Then at least there would have been some sign of life. I did not consider Oblivio as a living organism because he was dead inside. He has been going through his phone to the telescope for about an hour now with no results and getting angrier by the second. All of a sudden, I noticed a dim light in the distance. The light was slowly approaching us. It looked like the headlights of a car. I turned to Oblivio and said, I think we got some company. He looked behind him and replied, Oh yeah, people come here all the time to stargaze. Maybe they can help me out with my conundrum here. Something did not feel right here. Other people were interested in this nonsense? I found that hard to believe. The lights grew stronger as the vehicle approached. It looked like a fairly large vehicle, a van perhaps. I knew they probably needed that size of a car for their equipment. They were not bringing a party here. I was expecting the van to slow down, but it was still going full speed. I stood up to make sure I can get out of the way. The van stopped abruptly right next to Oblivio and I. Four people jumped out of the van, all wearing ski masks. They grabbed Oblivio and threw him into the van. I started running away, but two of them tackled me from behind and placed the bag over my head. I felt my hands being tied behind my back as I struggled. I yelled out Oblivio's name. SHUT UP! I heard a masculine voice to my right as I felt a hit to the back of my head. Who were these guys? What did they want from us? How did they know we were here? Why did they use a van? An SUV is far better equipped for this terrain. They threw me into the van and slammed the door. Oblivio? I cried. Tedium? I heard. Are you okay? Yeah, aside from the whole kidnapping thing, all is fucking dandy. No need for the attitude. You really care about attitude at a time like this? I should be the one giving you shit. You dragged me out here in the middle of nowhere and nearly bore me to death. Now, they might actually kill me to death. Wait a second, I was right, you were trying to rape me, you sick, twisted bastard, how could- Here we go again, such a high opinion of yourself. I didn't come here to rape anyone, especially not you, I have standards. Enough! If I hear another word, I will shoot you both. All of a sudden, a feminine voice emerged loudly, the atmosphere immediately silenced. I could not believe this was happening. Oblivio probably set this whole thing up. I always knew you were a rapist, I whispered and nudged Oblivio. Fuck off, you idiot, this is serious, he responded. Chapter 5. Loved and Lost It is hard to describe a scene when most of your senses are obsolete. The bag I had over my head rendered my vision useless. 
All I can see was that it was a cotton blend of some sort. It did feel pleasant against my skin, as pleasant as a kidnapping bag could feel. After the threat of being shot, it got very quiet in the vehicle. All I heard was the car engine and the wind hitting against the vehicle. We must have been going around 60 kilometers an hour. People rarely describe the taste of a scenario, but all I could say is the bag over my head definitely tasted like a sweaty armpit. I could only assume these guys have kidnapped people before and have not watched it in between victims, understandably so. I was pretty sure kidnappers did not want to keep you comfortable. The smell, as you would assume a windowless van to smell like, was atrocious. It smelled like tears, muddy boots, and spoiled cheese. Again, I'm sure the last thing on a kidnapper's mind was cleanliness. I could imagine a team of five vicious criminals planning their operations. Alright, listen up, criminal mastermind points to a photo. This is the target. We know he'll be picked up in front of the Grand Baha'i Principe Hotel at 1100 hours tomorrow. He is surrounded by an entourage of 10 armed bodyguards at three points, here, here, and here. Jonathan, we need you to be in charge of the gateway vehicle. Jonathan interrupts. Is it gonna be a windowless van again? The mastermind looks at him. Of course. A windowless van is the Mercedes-Benz of an operation like this. Jonathan rolls his eyes. I'm getting sick and tired of these windowless vans. They make us look like pedophiles. The mastermind looks at Jonathan and shakes his head and continues. Anyways, Jonathan, you get the van. Hector, you are in charge of artillery. Remember, these guards are heavily armed with assault rifles, so we need just as much firepower if we want to succeed. Hector nods and the mastermind continues. Evan, you will be in charge of creating a diversion. We need your highly specialized explosive skills to neutralize the three guards standing at point C. Evan looks at the mastermind and says, Oh, don't you worry, they're gonna go out with a bang! Evan laughs maniacally. The mastermind smirks and continues. And finally, Roberta, you are tasked with the most important of tasks. Pick up cleaning supplies and make sure the vent smells lemony fresh. We don't want our targets to have a bad time back there. Exactly. Sounds ridiculous. At least I got to entertain myself a little before all the torture began, as if the smell of the van was not torture enough. We must have been driving for about 47.2 minutes and I anticipated this was part of a much longer drive. We drove about 2 hours out just to stargaze and bad guys generally need a remote warehouse to torture their victims. Considering I had not seen anything resembling a warehouse on the way here, I could have only assumed we had a long journey ahead of us. I grasped to these seemingly last moments of life and savored them as much as I could. Meeting my maker seemed like a strong possibility around this time. I often complained about trivial things that bother me, and boy were they trivial, but realistically speaking, I loved life. It was all I have known up to that point. It was all anyone has known, despite what some out there tried to tell you. Certus. I remember as a child I experienced great difficulty coping with the notion of death. My teachers would try to comfort me with their explanations, which were always of a spiritual world or other religious propaganda, but that raised even more questions. Eventually, most just gave up and said that this is one of those things in life you could not explain, which was a cop-out if you ask me. Until this day, I think the best conversation I had about death was with another classmate when I was 12 years old. In his words, death is similar to pre-life. At some point, I was not born, which strictly in a sensory response perspective is equivalent to death. I found it humorous when he uttered, just try to remember what it was like before you were born. Remember what it was like before I was born? Seems impossible. How could I remember something before I was alive? I was not alive to think or feel. What was there to remember? Nothingness? I understood what he was getting at. At some point, all of us were not alive. Then your mother and father did the horizontal tango, and some month later, voila, you were alive. Of course, the first few years were kind of a blur, but then your brain develops enough to remember and understand what is going on. You go through life's trials and tribulations until the last day you close your eyes never to open them again. That moment, death, is equivalent to what was going on before you were born. At least according to that profound 12-year-old boy. However, I would have to disagree, it is not equivalent, not even close. What is a worse fate for someone? Death or non-birth? There is a big difference. To die, one must have lived at some point or another. To have not been born means one was never alive. I always thought about a specific scenario that presents this idea best. A young couple gets pregnant and is faced with a decision. Abortion or birth? Keep in mind, I consider adoption to fall under the birth option, and in reality, dying before the age of two would not constitute living as well. You are barely comprehending your surroundings or remembering anything that is happening. You shit in a diaper for Christ's sakes. On the one hand, the young couple can keep the baby and raise it. On the other hand, cease its existence. Pro-life supporters would use this argument quite a bit. What if you were aborted? Makes it personal. Makes you think. Well, is abortion a worse fate than birth followed by death? I say death is much worse. To die, one understand what he or she are leaving behind. 
where to not be born, one is never truly aware of life. The concept is quite abstract as how can you account for your preference of the two. Surely, anyone you ask is alive and knows what they are leaving behind. Even if we can travel back in time and stop someone from being born, they would not be able to answer because they wouldn't exist. However, in my humble opinion, this nothingness or non-existence cannot frighten one who has never known any different. It also cannot frighten someone who cannot experience fright. Getting back to the pregnant couple, let us assume they are to keep the baby. However, they cannot provide it with a good life. They end up emotionally scarring the child with constant family conflicts. The child grows up believing he or she is the reason for ruining their parents' lives. The child commits suicide at the age of 15. Has life been kind to them? Even if they live out their life to age 70, never being able to form meaningful relationship due to their upbringing, has life been kind to them? Would they perhaps prefer to have never been born? Contrarily, let's assume their life is wonderful and they pass away at the age of 70 surrounded by their children and grandchildren. Many would state that in fact, it was a good life and certainly birth and death are much more viable options. However, is that really the case? The 70 year old with the good life is actually losing the most out in this scenario. The other fictitious character in this fictitious study is losing what some would consider a bad life. The 70 year old on the other hand is losing a good life. Which one is better? What it boils down to is whether it is better to experience pleasure and have it taken away or not experiencing pleasure at all. People say it is better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. Is the same true of life? Is it better to have lived and died than to have never lived at all? I understand there is no answer to this that will easily satisfy me. It will always be a matter of opinion as one will ever have the chance to experience both scenarios at the same time and provide their expert opinion. Considering the situation I was in then, I would much rather not have been born. The fear of the unknown so greatly consumed my body I was left nearly paralyzed. I did love life and still do, which was the reason why my fear of death was so great. In my opinion, it is better to have been born and never die than to have never been born at all. Unfortunately, in our mortal existence, we are not giving that option. Chapter 6. An Ambiguously Abnormal and Awkward Abduction Why is it called kidnap? Does it not sound like something a child does when they are tired? <laughs> the kid was tired, so he took a kidnap. If he was older, it would have been called a teen nap. My thoughts wandered into other, more abstract metaphysical planes. We have been sitting in silence so long, my thoughts turned into a hacky 80s stand-up bit. To be honest, these silly, arbitrary thoughts were welcomed with open arms, even encouraged. With my senses being shut off like this, my mind went into some dark, deep territories. Death, failure, disappointment. Has my life been all for nothing? What have I achieved? Poor Oblivio too. He has to die with the guilt of knowing he dragged me out stargazing, the most boring activity known to man. I guess there was something worse than stargazing. Being deceased. What's the deal with being deceased? Do you stop stopping? Am I right? Where are you taking us? I broke the silence. I figured, what difference did it make? They were gonna kill us anyways. You'll find out soon enough. I heard a voice to my right. Why did you kidnap us? I continued my line of questioning. Listen here, bud. We are just the extraction team. Our goal is to capture you and bring you in. That's all I know. The same voice answered. Doesn't it make you at least a little bit curious to know why? I asked. I thought I said be quiet or I'll shoot you both. The original feminine voice interrupted with a slight irritation in her voice. Let me talk to the guy. We've been driving for two hours with no music or conversation. I'm bored out of my mind. What difference will it make? You think he could sweet talk his way out of this? The other kidnapper interjected. I don't get curious over things like that. I learned a long time ago that in this profession, you can't ask too many questions. By the way, allow me to introduce myself. I am Obodens. I check your hand, but it doesn't seem like you're capable at this moment. Oboden chuckled. Are, are, are you going to kill us? Oblivio finally mustered the courage to speak. Personally, I don't think they'll kill you guys. Oboden's answered. Well, that's a relief, I said. They may beat you and jail you for a lifetime, though. Oboden's continued. I did not feel relief anymore. Why have you taken us? Oblivio cried. Again, I have no clue. I just do what I'm told. I saw throughout the years many that have perished because they've asked the wrong guy the wrong question. Capiche? Obodens went on. Not to worry, I'm sure once we get there your questions will be answered. We're innocent, we haven't done anything wrong. If we were to die, the blood is on your hands. Oblivio's tone began to become more and more erratic. Blood? On my hands? You know what pal, you've convinced me. 
Obodens took a sarcastic tone. I don't want other people's actions to put blood on my hand. Shit. If there is blood on my hands, I want it to be my own doing. As Obodens finished his sentence, he pulled out his gun. Now, which one of you wants to get the first bullet? I heard a gunshot. I was not the target. I knew I was alive because my ears were ringing. I could not hear anything but that meandering buzzing in my ear. I called Oblivio's name out of panic, but there was no use. I could have not heard him anyways. As my ears slowly started to regain their use, I heard muffled conversation. It was more of an argument between what sounded like Obodens and the other woman, previously referred to as the feminine voice. I assumed it is a woman, but that may be a prejudiced assumption. It could have been a man with a feminine voice. What the hell is wrong with you? Another masculine voice filled my ear. What is this, your first time or something? Oboden scuffed. You fucked up my ears, why'd you shoot inside the car? The feminine voice inquired angrily. Tedium? I heard Oblivio's voice. Oblivio? You're okay? What the hell happened? I asked. Well, you see guys, I was nice. I shot out the window here. Just goes to show you. Ask the wrong question and someone may lose their patience. Lucky for you, I'm a nice guy. But this lady here could shoot you for sneezing with your mouth open, Obodens explained. So you just want us to be quiet, not say a word? Oblivio asked frantically. Yeah, I thought you said you were bored and wanted conversation, I added. Exactly, I want a conversation, not an interrogation. I have no clue why you are here, I can assume it's for digging around where you're not supposed to. I was hoping to keep it light, you know, what are my hobbies, where is a good place to eat, things like that, Oboden said. It almost sounded as if he was offended by the fact we wanted to know where we were going. After a small pause, he continued. You guys don't even know anything about me. Would you even think that I'm an avid gardener? Obodens explained with a sort of a mystical tone. That's not really at the tops of our mind right now. We are being kidnapped in case you haven't noticed. Oblivio raged out at Obodens' preposterous allegation. Nobody ever wants to hear about my petunias, Obodens muttered sadly. It is quite difficult to have a getting to know you conversation with your kidnappers. I decided to state the obvious. Like I said, just doing my job, there's no need to be rude. Obodens continued with his offended tone. Rude? You kidnapped us, took us against our will, and you have the audacity to speak about manners? Who the fuck are you and what is wrong with your head? Oblivio was really losing his temper, and rightfully so. He was not going to go down without a fight. All right, that's enough. You see, that's what I said, no conversation. Next word I hear, someone will really be shot and not just out the window. We got about 21.7 minutes. Sit in silence. The feminine voice proclaimed she had enough of our nonsense. The dark silence returned. At least I knew we would be there shortly. We could have been dead in 20 minutes, but at least we would have known why. This was getting more and more confusing. I had no idea why we were grabbed by these professional kidnappers in the first place. We were just some guys out in the field looking at stars. I was not even looking at the stars. I kept on running possible scenarios in my head as to what could have been the reason they wanted us. What did we see? Maybe it was a marijuana grow up we stumbled upon. That would have been a shame. I thought there were no drugs out there. If I knew I could have been getting high this whole time, stargazing would have been a more viable option. I wanted to get high one last time, especially if I was going to die. Realistically, I figured they were not drug dealers. Drug dealers would have just killed us and forgot about it. They were probably government agents. I thought maybe we were on an alien landing ground and now they were looking to cover their tracks. Oblivio probably saw an extraterrestrial and did not tell me. I know all these theories sound outlandish, but why did they want us? They would have not gotten any ransom off our families. And it's not because of the lack of funds, it's because of the lack of love. This was an ambiguously abnormal and awkward abduction if you ask me. Definitely the weirdest one I've ever been involved in. Granted, this was the only one I had been involved in to that date, so I had nothing to compare it to. Oboden seemed genuinely upset we were not willing to carry on small talk about his hobbies. Was that not strange? The other kidnappers behaved like I thought they would. No nonsense, talk and we will kill you. This guy seemed more like a guy you would run into a bar than a kidnapper. If Oblivio would have not yelled at him, we would have probably heard all about his garden. Good thing Oblivio yelled. It was bad enough I was about to die and all I did today was stargaze. Now, add gardening into the mix and I would have died of boredom long before the torture. It felt like we were slowing down. Get them out of here, another voice exclaimed. The car stopped and they pushed me out. Well folks, you're on your own now. Oboden's voice entered my ears as I hit the ground. The bag over my head slipped off a bit and I regained a portion of my sight. 
I was lying on the dirty terrain with patches of dried up brown grass. I saw Oblivio's left foot, he was on the ground as well. The ground was cold and the wind kept on throwing dust all over the place. I decided to sit up as I wrestled the rest of the bag off my head. I now had a 360 degree view of my surroundings. It did not matter as the flying dirt made it extremely difficult to see. I saw Oblivio struggling to sit up to my right. Behind me, the van. To my left, fields of dry grass. In front of me, a gray building. The building looked about 57 years old and poorly maintained. I tried to make out the writing on the building but all I saw was the letter N and S. The dirt impaired my vision, but I knew this was probably not gonna end well. Chapter 7 Captive Audience Oblivio and I sat on the dry grass for about 47 minutes in silence. We had nothing to say to each other and we were deep in our own thoughts. Oblivio and I were not religious, but I was definitely trying to smooth things over. I may have not been religious, but I did understand statistics. Right then, I wanted to increase my odds with the big guy upstairs. I was praying to all religions and gods, even Scientology. Help me, Elrond! I was never really against religion. However, I was against religious people. There is a difference. I did not have an issue with the folkloric tales riddled with moral ambiguities and contradictions or the whole notion of a supreme being. What I did have an issue with was the people who believed in it. Not all of them, but a fair majority, i.e. Certus. I found them to be very preachy and judgmental. If you did not follow their dogma to a T, you were a heathen, even though they, themselves, seldom did. They rode their moral high horse into the horizon looking down upon me, a heretic, while themselves picking and choosing the parts of the religion they wanted to follow. I will not kill, I will go to church and pray, no sex before marriage, well, that one I can ignore. It was written in a different time and cannot be used towards modern humans. Plus, oral sex is not really sex when you think about it. Pick and choose what you want and ignore the rest. Oblivio, on the other hand, was far more militant towards religious ideologies. Just earlier that day, he argued with Certus. It was one of the many arguments those two had surrounding the divine. Not only did Oblivio not adhere to any religion, he also did not believe in any god or higher power. He referred to himself as an agnostic atheist. Essentially, an atheist who accepts the off chance a supreme deity could exist. He thought every person who identified with a religion or believed in a god was to be checked into a mental institution. He was always quick to debate anyone who believed. All these people to him were either imbeciles, brainwashed, or close-minded. He saw himself as a sort of a shepherd to lead these religious people out of their dogmatic slumber into the freedom of atheism. He never excelled in the field of letting things go. Where did I fall? Well, I said I had an issue with religious people, so that automatically pushed me off religion in general. Plus, let's face it, no sex before marriage, no thanks. God worship or higher power were still on the table. I was not an atheist or agnostic, but more of a nihilist. I saw no meaning, nor did I care to find it. Most people I surrounded myself with were either agnostics or atheists, so I guess that's where I landed. If I had to give myself a fancy title, I would be an apathetic atheist. Essentially an atheist who doesn't particularly care one way or another. However, at that moment, I was praying left, right and center. The way I saw it, I was in the clear. I never denied the existence of any supreme being. I just left them alone until this moment when I truly needed them. I felt they had enough on their plate and did not want to bother them. Oblivio, on the other hand, was quite clear on where he stood. Oblivio? I hollered. Yeah? He answered with melancholy in his voice. Are you praying? I don't believe in that stuff, you know me. He scoffed. I was just wondering since we might be meeting our end, maybe you would like to just be on the safe side. I wouldn't lie, I am thinking about it. It is as they say, there are no atheists in foxholes. I have not heard any idiom surrounding agnostic atheists though. Also, this is a flat ground with no holes. Oblivio chuckled. Yeah, they may be right. I was never faced with this life or death situation, so it was easy for me to rebuttal their argument. Oh yeah, I remember when Sir just brought that up and you gave him the perfect answer, mimicking Oblivio's voice. So you're telling me that when people are faced with death and will believe anything, no matter how ridiculous or nonsensical it is, they will turn to religion. I mean, it is exactly it. You would believe anything if it would guarantee your survival. It's really your survival instincts grasping to anything they can grab. And just like that, he's back. We both chuckled. One thing I would say, if this is our last hour, it was a pleasure knowing you. We had our ups and downs, but I would not have any other friend. Friend is a strong word. Fuck off, tedium. We both laughed off our discomfort. We went on discussing possible reasons why we were captured and brought to this remote building. I told Oblivio my ideas of drug dealers and government agencies. He thought they likely confused us with somebody else, or maybe they thought we were planning an attack with a telescope. 
The thing was huge, it almost looked like a rocket launcher. Norad could have spotted us from the sky and took us in to be safe. We both agreed, if they wanted us dead, we would have been dead already. Another few minutes passed and we saw five armed guards approaching us from the building. They were walking nonchalantly with a relaxed posture. As they moved closer to us, the sound of their steps became louder. These guys had some sort of military training. They were all marching in unison in a V formation following their leader. The leader was a tall, muscular man with the highest cheekbones I have ever seen. He definitely looked like he was not going to give us any rope, unless it was to hang ourselves with. They came to us and stopped at once. Alright, you grab him and you the other. We're bringing them to see ducks. They grabbed us and walked towards the building. Even though it was a short walk, it felt like the longest walk I have ever been on. Every step felt like an eternity. The wind had calmed down, but was still howling in my ears. As we entered the building, a group of people were staring at us. They looked like regular office folk and not military personnel as the ones that were carrying us. If you were to ask for my honest opinion, which people seldom do, I would say they were kind of nerdy looking. Let's say if there was a vote for who will be bullied the most at school, these guys will definitely win. I'm not sure what they will win, but at least they will win. We were rushed quickly into a dark room, so I was not able to capture my surrounding in a meaningful way. However, this definitely seemed like a laboratory of some kind. Perhaps they were going to make us into test subjects. They sat us down and their commander said, Sit down and shut up, ducks will be in shortly. And then slammed the door behind them. They left us in the room as I heard the door shut behind us. I looked around to try to gauge what type of person this ducks would be. Again, it looked like a regular boring office, the kind of office where lower level employees are called in to be intimidated to perform better in order to keep their low paying jobs. The jobs they hate but need for the money. This was definitely not what I was expecting as a location for an interrogation. I was expecting more in the way of a table with a single flickering light bulb hanging over it, a two way mirror and masked men hurling demands at us. Every time we gave them an answer they did not like, they would raise their voice and bang their hands on the table to further assert their dominance. This setting looked more of a manager telling me I'm not a team player, which is not nearly as intimidating. More boring, really. Does this seem odd to you? I asked Oblivio. Nothing about this seems normal to me, Oblivio answered. I hope they give us some answers because I sure as hell am confused with a capital C. Doesn't this look like an office where a manager calls you in to tell you in you had too many sick days? Tell me about it. It doesn't feel like a kidnapping and an interrogation anymore. More like a kidnapping and an interview, I sneered. They'll probably ask what's our biggest weakness, Oblivio laughed. <laughs> I'll tell them mine is I don't like dying, maybe that will convince them to let us go. I tell them mine is... Oblivio was lost for words. I'll tell them I'm perfect, no weaknesses, what difference does it make? Why the hell are we here? Oblivio and I kept on talking, trying to figure out why they took us here out of all places. Oblivio kept on insisting he did not see anything. He was only looking for Jupiter, which he could not even find. As our conversation continued, so did our confusion. Oblivio seemed to be going in circles asking the same questions without a viable answer. It was actually quite refreshing to see him like this. It reminded me of me. I felt at this moment he really understood what it's like to be inside my head. Constant questioning that leads to nowhere. I heard the door opening behind us and footsteps approaching. It sounded like high heels. Step by step by step, it sounded like the infamous ducks was approaching. I hoped he or she would tell us what was going on in here. We were just a couple of idiots looking at stars. What was the offense? I mean, stargazing is an offense to one thing and one thing only. Entertainment. Ducks appeared in front of us and she just added to the confusion of the whole thing. She was quite short, around 163.4 centimeters, which explained the high heels. She had long brown hair tied in a ponytail and wore glasses. She had makeup on, but not so much anyone would notice. She looked as though she woke up late today and rushed into the office. It was like one of those times I was driving to class and I saw the lady in the car next to me brushing her teeth and applying mascara at a red light. I mean, it will get the job done, but it is quite obviously a rush job with multiple flaws. Lipstick applied unevenly, one eyebrow higher than the next, foundation not fully blended in. I always laughed at girls who complain about how time consuming this whole masterpiece takes them. I personally do not expect them to put on makeup in the morning. I think natural beauty is the way to go. I had many arguments with past love interests letting them know the whole makeup business is not a requirement for me. Every time they expressed their dislike towards the process, I'd simply say, don't put it on. I find you beautiful the way you are. Contrary to what you may think, it only infuriated them more. As much as they complained, they still found it as a requirement of daily life. Oftentimes, even ridiculing other women who face the outside world without the makeup they dread themselves. I always thought this added to this vicious cycle, and when I asked why all the hate, I was simply disregarded as difficult or stubborn. 
This was really neither here nor there, but seeing ducks reminded me of all those countless arguments I had in the past. To be quite honest, she seemed like every girl I've ever dated. Yes, I have a type. Short brunettes. I did find her quite attractive, but under these circumstances, it didn't really matter. For once, I was more interested in what she had to say than what she looked like naked. Alright, I was interested in both equally. Duck sat down and stared at us both. We stared at her back waiting for her to say something. She kept on shifting her eyes from me to Oblivio. A few seconds at me, a few seconds at Oblivio. I would say she's staring into my eyes a little longer, but maybe it's just my ego acting up. After a few minutes of this, Oblivio finally broke down. So, are you going to say something? She seemed startled by that question and replied, What do you want me to say? Oblivio and I looked at each other puzzled. I wonder if this was an interrogation technique to make us feel uneasy. We were confused. Um, Oblivio hesitated. Why did you bring us here? That would be a good start. You know damn well why you are here, Ducks asserted. You stuck your nose where it doesn't belong. Oblivio and I looked even more confused. She continued with an increasingly agitated voice. Who do you work for? The Black Holes, Universals, Milky Ways, Flat Earthers? Don't try and hide anything from me. What are you talking about? We have no clue who or what the hell those are. Oblivio replied. Wait, are these the names of gangs or something? I really could not think of a less intimidating name than the Milky Ways. Sounds more like the way you eat your cereal than anything else. I added my two cents. Ducks looked at me perplexed. Trust me, I knew the look. I've gotten it before from people who really did not approve of my humor. She was definitely a no-nonsense sort of gal who did not appreciate my attempt at levity. She would also probably not appreciate referring to her as a gal. This back and forth continued between Oblivio and Ducks for several minutes. She kept on accusing us of being part of some astronomy-related terrorist plot and Oblivio kept on frustratingly denying the allegations and asking why they have taken us. Eventually, I checked out of the conversation. These were two people that were going to ask the same questions at each other for eternity if no one interrupted. I gave them another few minutes and decided to interject. Listen, we are not terrorists or whatever you think we are. And Oblivio, she is clearly not going to tell us why we are here. So can we just move on? You two have been asking the same goddamn question for the last 20 minutes. Both retracted back into their seats. I decided to ask a different question. Can you at least tell us where we are? Her eyes shifted from side to side. With a hesitation in her voice, she said, That's confidential. I smiled and asked, Really? Because it looks to me the nameplate on your table says Ducks, Director of Operations, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So it seems to me... Oblivio interjected. Wait, 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 wait. This is NASA? Oh, NASA. I had no idea that's what it stood for. I continued. How did you not figure it out? You're in astronomy for Christ's sakes. Oblivio asked. I already told you. I just do it for the ladies. I smiled at Ducks. She did not. Oblivio, fed up with me, turned to Ducks and asked, What does NASA want with us? Are we under arrest? Can NASA even arrest us? What the hell is going on? Oblivio's face grew redder and redder. He seemed like he was going to burst. The frustration has gotten to him and consumed him. Ducks and I were frightened. I tried to calm him down by touching his shoulder, but he slapped my hand off and continued with his questioning and heavy breathing. Ducks' eyes seemed increasingly petrified. She seemed like she didn't know how to handle the situation. Oblivio stood from his chair, then started knocking things off the table, getting less and less coherent. Ducks moved her seat back and with her voice shaking proclaimed, Get him out of here! The soldiers stormed in and grabbed Oblivio and I and forced us out of the room. As they were escorting us out, they decided to yell, Hold up! I have one more question. They stopped and looked at Ducks. Okay, go ahead. Ducks, let me ask one more question. Are you single? I asked. Get them the hell out of here! Ducks yelled. I know you should not be thinking about romance at a moment like this, but I must say, I like a woman in power. It just does that for me. I could tell she did not find me as the intimidating one of the bunch, even though I was the one who found out where we were. It's funny how people do not deem you as a threat unless you're screaming and shouting like Oblivio was. She should have been scared of me. I already figured out the where. Now all I needed to do is find out the why. The soldiers escorted us out the office violently and walked us down the corridor. Seeing this was an office setting, it made me feel at ease. I mean, nobody ever got shot in an office unless it was a disgruntled employee. But I didn't work there, so I felt safe. Plus, this made the image in my head where we would be kept captive much more pleasant. I was thinking dark with snakes and regular tortures. But once we got there, it seemed more like an office meeting room. The only thing that was frightening was the condition of the chairs and computers. Come on, this was NASA. I would think they would have equipment from this century. They sat me and Oblivio down and handcuffed us to the desks. These were heavy duty and not easy to move, which made an escape plot nearly impossible. Alright, sit down and shut up. If you try to escape, you better hope our bullets will kill you. Me and the guys here like to have a little fun with those survivors. Let's just say it involves hot metal where you do not want it. 
Lieutenant Cheekbones laughed and walked away, closing the door behind him. Oblivio and I looked around the room, which seemed empty. However, out of the darkness, a sing-song voice filled the room. Chapter 8. There's nothing out there. The voice continued in a whispering sing-song manner. There's nothing out there. We could not see to the other side of the room as it was quite dark. Oblivio decided to shout hey. to get the other person's attention, but was only met with the same remark. I tried asking for clarification, but again was met with the same answer. What the hell is happening? Who is that? Oblivio asked. I have no clue, but it is very creepy, I answered. Maybe it's their way of trying to brainwash us. What are they alluding towards? There's nothing where. Think, Oblivio, why would NASA want us? Did I get here before you? I'm equally perplexed. Try to remember, you were looking for Jupiter and that's when it happened. Did you see anything there? Maybe a rocket you shouldn't have seen? I was looking for a possible explanation. No, that was the problem. There was nothing out there. There's nothing out there! There's nothing out there! The voice from the dark side of the room amplified. It was getting louder and louder, louder and louder. It was followed by a thumping and clinging sound. It sounded like the person was trying to escape using all their strength. Where? What are you talking about? Oblivio cried. There! 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 All lies! All lies! The voice continued to grow stronger and stronger. The thumping and clinging grew closer and closer. I was petrified. Oblivio did a good job pretending, but I knew he was petrified as well. Slowly, a figure of a person sitting on a chair appeared. The chants continued and the thumping kept growing louder. The person was jumping forward with their chair. It seemed as though they had been tied to it. I knew it was a prisoner like us. They probably went insane from being trapped in here all this time. As the figure approached us, I could see it was a woman. She had definitely been there for a long period of time. There was no sign of personal hygiene. Long round fingernails, unkempt greasy hair. The smell of her breath could kill a small animal. She moved closer and closer, continuing with her There's nothing out there! routine, until she was about a meter and 76 centimeters away from us. She stopped and her head collapsed forward. She was breathing heavily. It wasn't surprising. Moving a chair from one side of the room to the other while this shouting at the top of your lungs would make anyone a little fatigued. She kept on trying to catch her breath for a few minutes until she finally sat back up in her chair. She then slouched back and continued to get her breathing back to normal. Let's not use the words nothing or there just to avoid more of this lunacy, I whispered to Oblivio. He nodded in agreement. Oblivio and I kept on looking at each other and then back at the mystery lady. We were at a loss for words. We did not want another spectacle like the ones we just witnessed, so we had to choose our words carefully. Let's maybe start with her name, Oblivio whispered. I moved my hands upwards in a perhaps notion. I really had no idea what to say. Hello, I'm Oblivio, and this is Tedium. What is your name? He asked. She mumbled something incoherent under her breath. Oblivio looked at me and then decided to ask again. Sorry, I didn't catch that. What is your name? She kept on mumbling and looking all over the room. Periodically, she would frighten and look to the other direction in silence, only to mumble moments later. I don't think she knows her own name, I said. Well, what can we do? Just sit and listen to her ramble on? Oblivio asked. Do you remember who you are? I asked the woman. Yeah, yes, I remember. She muttered while fidgeting in her seat. Good, good. Who are you then? I continued questioning. S -s -s. She stuttered. That's a pretty name. I hesitated. How long have you been here? Oblivio jumped in. L -l long time, long time. She kept on moving her head back and forward and speaking in a raspy tone. What's long? Days? Months? Oblivio kept on asking her, but she kept on nodding her head in disagreement. Years? Yes, all nothing. Nothing there. She answered with a sort of sadness. Years? What the fuck? I couldn't hold my tongue, but Oblivio signaled me to calm down. Do you remember why they brought you here? Oblivio inquired. Because... She said. Yes. Oblivio nodded. Be be because I know the secrets. She answered. What is the secret? Oblivio asked. She then slowly started to sway back and forward with increased aggression. Her head started moving from side to side frantically and her legs were jumping up and down. There's nothing out there! There's nothing out there! She was yelling even louder than before, going crazier and crazier. She seemed like she was going to collapse at any moment. Her shouts became louder. Her movements became more abrupt. The chair was flying off the ground. A few moments later, Lieutenant Cheekbones stormed with a concerned look on his face. He was wondering what was all the commotion about. He grabbed her by the shoulder and held her down. He stared deeply into her eyes, not breaking eye contact. The stare was so intense, Oblivio and I began to sweat, even though it was not directed at us. He proceeded to inject her with a sedative. Her cries then became quieter and less frequent until she finally passed out. The lieutenant turned to us and said, Well, I see you met Anepta. You might have to forgive her. She's been here for about five years. 
She didn't play nice, so this is what happened to her. Jesus Christ, you can smell the piss and shit up to here. Oblivio and I looked at each other with fear. The lieutenant chuckled and walked towards the door. Before exiting, he said, Well, you folks get some rest too, and shut off the lights. Before he did, I managed to get a look at his nameplate. It said Maxilla. Maxilla seemed like a true psychopath. I was sure he got off on watching people suffer, and unfortunately, we were his test subjects. Oblivio and I were exhausted. We'd been up for 24 hours straight, and the last six were filled with stress. We were hungry, sleepy, and drenched in cold sweat. I passed out shortly after. I think Oblivio did as well. Chapter 9 Fuck you, Oblivio. It has been three full weeks since I last trimmed my belly hair. I thought I could maybe do that. I answered grinningly. Do you even like the stars? Oblivio quipped. Not really. Why are you majoring in astronomy? Isn't it obvious? No. For the ladies. Is everything a joke to you? Not everything. Just most things. This may sound a bit repetitive, but I realize I never explained how Oblivio convinced me to join him on this trip. I will take this opportunity while we are sleeping in this dingy office room. As anyone can imagine, I was not at all interested in going. However, Oblivio managed to get me to join him on his stargazing trip. I wish I could say it was his gift of the gab, but the truth was far more sinister. You see, that's the problem with you. Oblivio began speaking. Oh, I can't wait to hear your expert opinion. I interrupted with an obnoxiously sarcastic tone. You can't focus on anything. You keep changing from one thing to the next. You're interested in this new thing for exactly 5 seconds and then quickly all interest is lost. You then go start ridiculing everyone else who's interested in anything because, God forbid, they have a passion that can last longer than the end of the day. Oblivio finished his speech, which was followed by silence. He looked at me. I looked at him. I was trying to search my mind for a quick rebuttal or a snarky remark. But the truth was, I had nothing. No clever retort. No quirky outburst. Nothing. You only get so much time to come back with something, and the time definitely passed. Anything I would have said at that point, no matter how clever, would have sounded foolish. Yeah, well you can go shove that telescope up your ass, I pronounced with an irritation in my voice. Believe me, I knew it was not clever, and the mere fact I took so long to respond made me seem a hell of a lot dumber. Well there you go, tedium. What an amazing response. I'm being serious, this is the fourth major you've changed into, and you're still not happy. You have to do some soul searching and find what you really want to do as opposed to just whimsically switching to the first thing that comes up. Oblivio was just hammering the last nail in my coffin. You know what? I said. Yeah, he answered. Fuck you, Oblivio. I have to give it to Oblivio. He really took the instruction well. We sat quietly for a while. Oblivio managed to piss off two people in a matter of minutes. Me and Certus. I was at a loss for words. Oblivio really struck a chord in me. Why was it that nothing interested me? I tried. Believe me, I did. So many things, but none of them made me want to do them again. Was I doomed to this life of short bursts of interest followed by regret? I was too young to have a midlife crisis. He was absolutely right. I did ridicule others, Oblivio included, for merely having a passion or an interest in something. I think it was really my way of coping with my general apathetic approach to existence. If I could make them look foolish for caring, then I could feel superior for not. How did they do it? What made them enjoy something so much? How was it so easy for them to determine that this was the best thing for them to do? I let these thoughts marinate in my head for several minutes. I was really distraught. Tedium? I heard Oblivio's voice break through the hurricane that was going around in my head. Are you okay? I shrugged it off and looked in the other direction. I was not ready to have that conversation, especially not with him. As I gazed to the other side, I saw a familiar figure. It was Minima, our classmate. I was trying to get on her good side for quite some time, but I could never get her to give me the time of day. She had the perfect look, you guessed it, short and brunette. Her figure became larger and clearer as she was walking in our direction. I tried to think about what to say, but I was still processing what Oblivio said. I really had nothing to say, and she was fast approaching. Hello. Her soft voice pierced my ear. Hello. I stuttered while searching for a response. Her face squirmed as she looked at me and quickly switched her gaze to Oblivio. I shamefully realized the salutation was not aimed at me, but rather at Oblivio. They carried on their conversation amicably. I would even say quite flirtatiously. What did she see in him? All this guy cared about was astronomy. He was literally obsessed. Is this what women want? A man who is obsessed with nonsense? As I was trying to wrap my brain around this interaction, I realized their conversation has ended. Minima said her goodbyes and started walking away. I gave her my farewell as well, to which she responded in surprise, almost as if she has forgotten I was even there. I watched her as she moved away from us, even further disappointed with my life. My conversation with Oblivio was still fresh in my head, and now Minima did not even acknowledge my existence. I was melancholic.
What was that about? I asked Oblivio. Minima? I nodded in agreement. She was just asking me a few things about the lecture, he explained. I looked at him and cynically replied, Ah, she just wanted some help. Oblivio nodded in agreement, but then felt something off about my tone. To be honest, I was in a terrible mood and was trying to get under his skin. What does that mean? He asked. Well, you know, I replied passive-aggressively. No, I don't. Why else would I ask? If I knew, I wouldn't ask. Oblivio's voice was getting increasingly irritable. I mean, girl like that, I pointed in her direction. You, I pointed at Oblivio. You do the math. So you're basically saying I have no chance with her. Maybe not no chance, but definitely a low chance. Let's face it, she just smiles at you and keeps you around so you would help her with her homework. My tone was getting increasingly arrogant. Okay, tedium, just because she prefers me over you is no reason to behave like a child. Oblivio responded. Shots fired. I thought the situation was tense before, but things definitely escalated quickly after that. We proceeded to hurl the most juvenile insults at each other. We both had one objective, maximum destruction of the opponent's ego. We dove into some deep, dark territories. It didn't matter. No topic was off limits. He accused me of causing my parents' divorce and I accused him of causing the Holocaust. It was really not my proudest moment and I think Oblivio was also not impressed with himself. However, in the heat of the moment, we were both as militant as possible. Tell you what, Oblivio said. If I go over there and get her number, it will prove I'm superior to you. I chuckled. (laughs) Good luck. I can't wait to see how that turns out. Care to make it interesting? Oblivio grinned. Sure, what are the stakes? If I get her number... You have to come join me on the stargazing trip. If I don't, I will do all your assignments for the rest of the year. Oblivio gave me an offer I couldn't refuse. You're on. Don't come crying to me when you lose. I won't lose, he smirked. Yeah, right. Don't change the bet after you lose, too. Oblivio agreed and we shook hands to solidify our bet. I must admit, my mood definitely improved seeing as I won't have to do any work for the rest of the year. I leaned back in my chair and watched Oblivio head towards Minima. I put my feet up on the table and my hands behind my head. I felt like a king. They were too far for me to hear what they were saying, but I was watching their every move. I waited for Oblivio to turn around, walk back to our table, and have the saddest grimace ever seen in the universe. I was already preparing my speech for when he came back. I couldn't wait to kick him while he was down. The conversation took longer than I expected. How long did it take to say no? Maybe she was trying to let him down easy. That was probably it. To my surprise, she seemed quite cheery. She was even touching his arm and laughing at everything he said. This did not seem like a rejection. Then, my worst nightmare came to life. She pulled out her phone and they exchanged numbers. My heart sank to my feet. All hope was gone for me. To add insult to injury, she gave him a small kiss on the cheek. To add more insult to injury, I had to go stargazing. Oblivio returned to the table with a smile from ear to ear. He knew he held all the power in this scenario. He won the bet. He had the girl. I was hoping he would take it easy on me. However, he began obnoxiously berating me. I sat there quietly taking all the abuse. He was the clear victor. I was defeated. I fell from the high back to the low. This really wasn't my day. After a few minutes, I couldn't take it anymore. I asked Oblivio to give it a rest. He laughed and continued with his speech highlighting his greatness in this whole situation. I actually don't blame him for doing so. I would have acted the same if I had won. Also, I blamed him for the Holocaust, which may have been an exaggeration on my behalf. Uh, Oblivio. I muttered under my breath as a defeated man would. What? You finally found something to say? Oblivio retorted. Remember why I said I majored in astronomy? I timidly asked. Oh yeah, for the ladies. You thought you were so funny with that one. But you can't even get that. Oblivio was not letting go of his tirade. I wasn't being funny. And it wasn't for the ladies. It was for a lady. Minima. I replied and hung my head down staring at the floor. Oblivio's face turned red as he realized he was acting like a real jackass. He tried mumbling something, Ah, well, I didn't, but to no success. I looked him right in the eyes and proclaimed, Fuck you, Oblivio. I walked away as he hung his head in shame, and I hung my head in agony. I was thinking of just going home, skipping the rest of my classes for the day and forgetting about stargazing. But a bet is a bet. I needed some time to cool off, so I decided to head outside. I wasn't going to go to any of my classes for the rest of the day. What was the point? I found it boring and I was not even paying attention to anything that was happening. My only solace was getting closer to Minima or spending time with Oblivio. And now, all of that was down the drain like a drunk man's urine in the kitchen sink during his daughter's birthday. I will admit, similes were never my strong suit. I must have wandered around campus for a couple of hours dragging my feet on the ground. I would sometimes look up to the side, but most of the time my gaze was fixed to the ground. I was a broken man and could not be fixed. I wish I could say I had some meaningful epiphany during this walk of shame, but it was really uneventful. 
I was wallowing in my disappointment and reliving my past failures. The closest thought I had to a breakthrough was realizing I was terrible at everything. This was likely why I didn't have a passion for anything. I think most people are drawn to things that they are naturally good at, and since I was never naturally good at anything, I had no draw. I guess that over the years I developed this ridicule towards others as a defense mechanism to avoid self-reflection. If a painter was to paint me walking around campus today, they would have undoubtedly created a gloomy, raining environment to emphasize the grimness of my situation. To my luck, there was not a fucking cloud in the sky. I couldn't even have the appropriate atmosphere for my melancholy. It was actually a very sunny and pleasant day. I decided to check my phone after ignoring it for all this time. The older generations may think that two hours is not a long time without looking at your phone, but for us millennials, this seemed like an eternity. I remember one time I was trying to arrange a date with a girl I was pursuing. She messaged me around 1pm and I replied at 2. She then went missing. I don't mean in the literal sense, but she ceased answering my messages. When I ran into her a few days later and inquired what happened, she told me I was ignoring her first, which is why she ghosted me. I was baffled. She was the one ignoring me. She went on to say who doesn't check their phone at least every 30 minutes. The fact that I took a full hour to answer meant I looked at my phone and decided not to answer. I know, I dodged the bullet on that one. I saw a few messages from Oblivio trying to see if I was alright. He also wanted to know if I was still joining him for stargazing. I kept on scrolling through the messages and one caught my eye. Oblivio said that he got Minima and her friend to join us stargazing. My mood has suddenly lifted. Finally, a reason to go stargazing. I turned my frown upside down and headed towards Oblivio's van. He always parked in the same spot. I saw Oblivio looking at his phone next to his van and said, So, we going stargazing or what? Oh, Tedium, I wasn't sure if you were joining, he answered. Well, a bet's a bet. Listen, Tedium, about earlier, Oblivio started. Nope. I raised my hands. It's all good. I'd rather not talk about it. I thought about it enough. Let's go get the ladies. We both got into the van, Oblivio in the driver's seat and me in the passengers. I threw my bag in the back seat and put on the seatbelt. I felt this day was finally about to change for the better. It was time to feel happy again. As I was basking in my newly found optimism, Oblivio's phone dinged. He looked at his phone and looked at me in disappointment. He showed me the screen and it read, Sorry, have to cancel, something came up. The message was for minimum. Oblivio looked apologetic and said, I can't believe she canceled last minute. Who would do that? I just looked at him and shook my head and said, Fuck you, Oblivio. Chapter 10. Separation Anxiety My eyesight was blurry as I was gradually awakening from my slumber. I had no idea how long I was out for. I started rotating my shoulders and moving my neck around. I was quite stiff as sleeping in that position was not at all comfortable. I looked over to Oblivio and saw he was still asleep, maybe even dead. I looked at Inepta who was also asleep, or dead. As my eyesight was slowly becoming more and more clear, yesterday's events were re-entering my mind. I remembered the boring lecture, the melancholy, the stargazing, and kidnapping. Yesterday was definitely a day I will remember for the rest of my life, which, at that point, seemed to be only hours or days long. I was still confused as to the reason of our capture. I was even more confused about the Nepta's capture. What did these people want from us? I literally could not have provided them with any viable information. I wished to just go home and forget about this whole affair. I wouldn't have even informed the police, I just wanted to have my freedom back. I tried to get Oblivio to wake up by screaming his name to no success. I wasn't going to wake up Inepta because she scared me. If there's nothing out there, then why were you shouting like a lunatic? I understand if there was a monster, but there was literally nothing out there according to her. Isn't this how you calm people down when they're nervous? Imagine a child who is scared of creatures hiding under the bed or in the closet. What would their parents tell them? Yes, there's a monster or there is nothing out there. Perhaps, some people are more frightened by the concept of nothingness than existence. I remember during my brief stint as a philosophy major, this was discussed in great detail. I have never heard so much discussion questioning existence and so much discussion about nothing. Philosophy is essentially the Seinfeld of all majors, a major about nothing. The lights came on and Maxilla walked in. He seemed well rested and chanted, Wakey wakey, eggs and bakey. Rise and shine boys and girls, we got a long day ahead of us. I looked at him while the others were still passed out. Well, one of the three ain't bad I guess, Maxilla said nonchalantly. He reached in his back pocket and pulled out an air horn. He slowly walked towards Oblivio. He glanced at me grinning and winked at me playfully. It was becoming obvious this was just a game to him. He positioned the air horn right next to Oblivio's ear, cracked his neck, and pressed it with all his might. 
Oblivio jumped from his chair startled. He was frantically moving his head back and forth while trying to move his arms. Slowly he calmed down as he remembered he was restrained. Hello little Miss Sunshine, how was your sleep? Maxilla asked Oblivio. Oblivio just looked at him confused. I don't think he heard anything Maxilla said as he was still deaf in that one ear. I'm pretty sure the question was meant to be rhetoric anyways. Maxilla then walked over to Inepta and pressed the horn again. Oblivio and I flinched in agony as the horn was very loud. However, Inepta sat there motionless. Maxilla seemed confused and blew the horn again. Inepta remained motionless. Shit, maybe that dose killed her. That's too bad. I liked her. She was my type of gal. Bad shit crazy. Maxilla shrugged his shoulders and came back to us. Alright boys, seems like it's just us three. Hey, we can be the three musketeers and Inepta over there can be D'Artagnan. I have never been scared of someone so much in my entire life. He was enjoying this moment a little too much. He walked around us like a drill sergeant and said, What we're going to do today is something what some like to call divide and conquer. We are going to interview you each separately and break you down psychologically. Then you'll confess as to your real motive here, Maxilla said. Oblivio and I remained silent. We both understood this man was a psychopath who was looking for any reason to inflict pain on us. We both avoided eye contact to try to avoid the physical ramification of this lunatic. All right, I'm gonna assume that your silent means you agree with the plan. So who wants to go first? Maxilla looked at us. Come on, whoever wants to go first, raise your hand. He chuckled to himself knowing that we were tied down. Okay then, you, he pointed at me. Let's go see your girlfriend, I'm sure you want some one-on-one -on -one time with her. He grabbed the backrest of my chair and dragged me out of the room. He was pulling me effortlessly. He was incredibly strong. The chair being dragged on the floor made a loud screeching sound which made Oblivio flinch. Even outside of our little office prison, all the office workers were bothered by the sound. Except Maxilla. He seemed to be enjoying the sound. I think he genuinely enjoyed chaos, which would make him a perfect candidate for this role. I started thinking, what was the interview process for a job like this? Did they ask you questions about your qualifications, or did they merely put you in a room with a person and see how you killed them? Did he get to be the leader because his banter is the best? I could imagine him going back to his platoon and bragging about his joke telling us to raise our hands and everyone standing around laughing. As I was thinking this, he put me in Dux's office and positioned me to face towards her desk. He put me down and walked out without saying a word. The office was empty. I assume Dux will show up any minute and start asking me questions about my involvement in some sort of galactic terrorism. I really did not know what to expect. I know it may sound strange, but I was actually looking forward to see her. I thought this would be a good chance to let us get to know each other. I was glad we met, I just wished it was under different circumstances. I heard the door open behind and slam shut, the sound of her high heels hitting the ground step by step. I was giddy and excited to see her, with every step approaching my face lit up a little bit more. Her figure finally appeared in front of me, or at least what I thought was her. To my surprise, the lady sitting in the chair was neither short nor brunette, she was not ducks. I was quite disappointed that she was not good looking. This woman was probably in her 50s and overweight. Definitely not what I imagined my perfect woman to be. She looked like my high school librarian. She sat for a while shuffling the papers in front of her. She stopped to clear her throat and had a drink of water. She then went on shuffling her papers more. I was getting impatient and decided to inquire. Are you gonna begin the investigation? She became slightly startled and looked at me and smiled. She laid down her papers flat on the table and said, Oh. I'm sorry, I've never done this before. I'm the HR director and usually conduct interviews. This is quite, she chuckled, different for me, but I'm always looking to accept new challenges. This was getting more and more confusing. Were they trying to do a bad cop, good cop sort of thing? Does this tactic actually work? All the 80s movies had this interrogation technique. I would be surprised if criminals were not well versed in defusing the good cop, bad cop duo by this point. She took out her notepad and clicked her pen. Well, I see your name is Tedium, my name is Amabilia, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Before we get down to the whole question and answer period, let me tell you about myself. She went on telling me about her work experience for the last 20 years and how she ended up working for NASA. She kept on saying things like, funny story, and that was quite interesting. However, in reality, her stories were neither funny nor interesting. I thought I was going to be interrogated aggressively and not going through a job interview. After about five minutes of nonsensical ramblings, she finally turned her attention to me. So, tell me about yourself, Tedium, she asked amicably. Listen, I'm held here against my will and I don't even know why. Let's cut the pleasantries and just ask me what you want. I have nothing to hide and I did nothing wrong, I answered impatiently. Well then, she started flipping through pages one by one until she reached the desired page. Who do you work for? I don't work for anyone. I'm a student with no ties to any political or activist groups. Next question. 
I was growing more impatient. That's good. She nodded her head and jotted some notes. Have you ever been in contact with any of the following groups? The Black Holes, Galaxy Group, Universals, Milky Way? She was laundry listing the groups. Listen, I cut her off. I have no idea what those are. I don't even know what these groups stand for. I'm just a student that went stargazing with his friend, which as far as I know is not a crime. You can skip all the questions about affiliations with various groups. I don't even join clubs in university. Why would I join these ones? I was quite agitated at this point. I uh, see. She flipped through her pages again. She must have flipped through the entire set until she got to the page that seemed to be it. She squinted her eyes and asked, What were you doing at the location last night? Are you listening to me? I said we were out stargazing. Well, I tagged along. I was roped into it by Oblivio, the other person you captured. I have no interest in it and didn't even look at the telescope. I didn't even want to join them. I find astronomy boring. That's good. She nodded her head and wrote down some more notes. What were you looking for? I wasn't looking at anything. Oblivio said this is the only time Saturn will be visible. He couldn't find it anyway, so what's the point of having us here? Oh, uh, okay. She kept on making notes. When was... What do you want? I interrupted in anger. I told you everything. Let us go. We did nothing wrong. What are you writing down there anyways? This is the least important information in the universe. Who would need to know it? I was getting louder and louder. I'm not sure. She chuckled awkwardly. This is my first time doing something like that too. She started looking around as if she was looking for someone for help. She was like one of those new cashiers that are not sure what code they should punch in for banana. It's 4011, goddammit! She was quite timid in her way and looked for me for guidance. I was unable to assist her as the kidnapping occupied most of my time. I was also not aware of what was going on. If Maxilla was the perfect man for a job like this, then she was the worst. No authority, no intimidation, no information. She eventually excused herself and went to get help. She even shuffled awkwardly around the office like a newborn puppy searching for its mother. Maybe that was part of some psychological mind game, or maybe it was just a display of gross incompetence. I sat there in that empty room. It must have been around 59 minutes. But with no clock or anything to do, it seemed to be much longer. I was checking my surroundings intermittently, but was not able to spot anything else that could help me answer my questions. I was tired and hungry. I had barely any energy left after this debacle and was drifting in and out of consciousness. I would occasionally fall asleep momentarily just to jolt back up once my head fell. My body was aching from being in this position for a prolonged period of time. My arms felt like pins and needles were stabbing them because of the poor circulation. After getting impatient, I decided to holler. Is there anybody out there? The sounds of footsteps approaching brought about mixed emotions. On the one hand, excitement to see another human being. On the other, fear of physical abuse from Maxilla. The footsteps were coming closer and sounded as if it would be Maxilla. A forceful walk in combat boots. What? You miss me already? My worries were confirmed. Can I get some food or water? I asked with whatever energy I had left. Maxilla chuckled and grabbed the back of my chair and began to drag me back. I had no idea what was about to happen. I was hoping to be reunited with Oblivio and let him know the torture I've been put through. Maxilla did not lose an ounce of energy dragging me the first time around. He dragged me back with the same ease as before. The screeching was just as loud and the bystanders seemed to be equally surprised. The only difference was the way back seemed much longer. They say going back is always faster than going to a place, but this situation proved otherwise. It may have been the thirst, the hunger, or the general ignorance towards my fate that elongated those 40 steps to feel like 4,000. Slowly, I moved closer and closer to the holding cell slash meeting room. With every step Maxilla made closer to the destination, I felt greater anxiety. We eventually reached the spot and Maxilla let the back of my seat go and I hit the ground. Well, there you are, princess. You are now back with your friends. Seems like you did a lot better than your friend there. Maxilla scoffed and shut the door behind him as he left the room. Oblivio's head was hanging low. Inepta was still at the same position as she was before. I was puzzled by Maxilla's words about Oblivio. Was everything alright with him, or was he just exhausted? I decided to inquire. Uh, Oblivio, you okay? Oblivio slowly raised his head, revealing his beaten and bloodied face. They really did a number on him. It seemed like he received no mercy from the perpetrators. I thought I had a tough time, but it seems Oblivio definitely suffered more. What happened? I asked. Chapter 11 Oblivio's Odyssey I awoke to a loud sound in my right ear which rendered me deaf. I struggled to move away only to realize I was tied to a chair. Slowly I was regaining my memory. TDM and I were kidnapped and held against our will by NASA out of all people. My vision was still blurry but was getting clearer with every passing moment. 
I saw Maxilla laughing, then asking me questions which I could not comprehend due to my momentary deafness. I kept my silence as I was still dizzy from the sudden wake-up call. Maxilla kept on looking at Tedium and I, looking for a response, then chuckling again. He grabbed the back of Tedium's chair and dragged them out of the room. The sound of the chair meeting the floor with friction was so loud that even with my temporary deafness, I was able to hear it all. I looked at Inepta, who was still asleep, and called her name, but to no success. I was still confused about the motives of these people and when or if we would get out of here. Maxilla returned to the room and declared, Well, time for you to tell us what you know. My hearing has regained enough for me to comprehend his words, but I remained silent as I had nothing to say. He grabbed the chair and put it in front of me, but he did not sit down. Instead, he stepped back to the wall and crossed his hands behind his back, standing shoulder width apart. After a few moments, Dux entered and sat in front of me. So I understand you were looking for Jupiter, she quipped. I looked at Maxilla, then at Dux and said, Yes, I was trying to find it, but it was not there. At least, not according to any of the scientific publication, I, I was caught off by Dux. Why were you looking for it? I have never seen it before and wanted to catch a glimpse, I replied. Why? Is this part of some attack? What attack? I'm an astronomy student. This is what I study day in and out. I'm genuinely interested in the vastness of the universe. Before yesterday, I always wanted to work for NASA, but now I'm not sure what's going on. I thought this organization was about exploring the universe and not torturing victims. Well, we must keep the universe safe. There are many out there that threaten our well-being, and we are put in charge of protecting the universe. Ducks snarkily responded. Protect? Isn't that the job of the FBI or CIA? What are you protecting us from? Aliens? Well, you didn't hear it from me. Wait, what? Aliens exist? Is this what you've been hiding? Why are you hiding this from the people? We have the right to know. This no- I stopped as the back of Maxilla's hand hit my cheek. It was a strong blow that nearly knocked me unconscious. Now look here, are we gonna have a repeat of yesterday with you screaming and shouting? Ducks asked and I nodded no. Good, because if that's how it's going to be, just let me know now so I can let Maxilla kill you where you sit. Ducks calmly explained. I was surprised she did not seem nervous at all when I started raising my voice. When I was yelling last night, she seemed petrified, but that explains why she had Maxilla join. I was to keep my cool or get the thrashing of a lifetime. She continued explaining to me how a few years ago they discovered intelligent alien life forms. Some were, according to her, our friends, and some were, according to her again, foes. NASA was responsible for protecting planet Earth from invasions and attacks, hence the high level of security required. This information was deemed classified and was not communicated to the public as to avoid mass hysteria. As she was explaining this to me, I realized that the whole narrative did not add up. So you are protecting humans against aliens. Dux reaffirmed her statements with a nod. So why did you take me and Tedium, who are human, in case you haven't noticed, into custody? As I finished up the sentence, I saw Maxilla warming up to pummel me for not playing along, only to have Dux raise her hand, ordering him to stand down. Aliens are our top concern. However, we do have some earthlings that I describe as... Dux took a pause to choose her words carefully. Undesirable. These are organizations such as the Black Holes or the Milky Ways, who differ ideologically on certain points, but in essence all believe that the human race should be wiped out. We are an imperfect breed that should bow down to our alien overlords and blah 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 blah. Some of them believe Earth is flat for Christ's sakes. I was listening to ducks disparaging these undesirables for being the greatest threat to human security and well-being. She mentioned they discovered I was not a threat when they cross-referenced their database to my identification and saw no hits. They were able to confirm that I was a student and will be releasing me and Tedium to go about our business. As I kept listening, I started to realize much of this was still ambiguous to say the least. I still did not have an answer to why we were captured. I knew I had to tread lightly to avoid Maxilla's punches, but I simply had to know. Uh, so why was I taken then? Dux and Maxilla looked at each other as I inquired. Dux seemed confused as she asked me to repeat myself. I mean, I get you're trying to protect the planet, which is an important job, but what was my crime? I was out in the wilderness looking for Jupiter in the name of science and not galactic terrorism. Well, we can never be too safe. We have no way of knowing if you're trying to communicate with the aliens or just stargazing, Dux quickly replied. But I'm sure there must have been countless people out last night stargazing with a specific intention of seeing Jupiter. Why was I the only one taken? Alright, you maggot, time to teach you a little respect. Maxilla interfered while rolling up his sleeves. He was ready to go. I closed my eyes, hoping it will reduce some of the pain, but I was still terrified for my well-being. As I thought the strike were coming near, I heard, Maxilla, stand down. Oblivio has been more than courteous with me. He has a curious mind and simply has inquiries. Ducks came to my assistance. Well, curiosity killed the cat, Maxilla muttered. She asked Maxilla to wait outside for the remainder of the conversation, but to remain nearby. I immediately felt a great sense of ease. Dux was much more reasonable to deal with than that psychopath. 
I definitely had the wrong read on her yesterday. She was actually rather pleasant once she realized I was not a threat. She was quite forthcoming with the remaining information. She explained that I was targeted because they had a sting operation last night. The goal was to catch both aliens and humans colluding to attack Earth. When I posted the coordinates to the online forum, they happened to coincide with the code NASA has been trying to crack. Apparently, I accidentally advised that I have a landing spot for them. They could have not taken the risk and brought me in and tedium for questioning. So, pretty much I shouldn't use the internet to post on these sites and I will be safe? I asked. Well, you can still post and read, this is just an unfortunate coincidence, Dux explained. I guess the internet is not for spreading knowledge after all, I chuckled. Of course, it's really just for pornography and cat videos, Dux chuckled as well. Don't forget the hate speech, Maxilla piped up from the other room. Dux and I stared at each other awkwardly. We kept on conversing about the vastness of space and other astrological themes. I could see what Tedium saw in her. She was quite charming. I was smitten. Under different circumstances, I think we could have really hit it off, but I guess the situation we were in did not allow for such romantic endeavors. Plus, I was pretty sure the whole minima fiasco was still fresh in Tedium's head and there was no need to add insult to injury. I was happy we were going to be let go and that this was just a misunderstanding. I even mentioned to Dux that I could not wait to share the day's events with a few people as a funny anecdote. As soon as those words left my lips, I could see Dux's face turn sour. Um, I uh, thought you understood. Whatever you were told here cannot be repeated. Dux's voice began to shake. I was quite perplexed and inquired why she told me this information if it was classified. I thought you were the reasonable one. I thought you understood this is for your knowledge only and not to be repeated to anyone else. Under no circumstance are you to discuss this with anyone. Dux's demeanor became increasingly more stern. But how will I explain my disappearance? I asked. It's hardly been a day. Tell him you got lost on your way back and slept in the car. Tedium got you drunk or high or something, and then you didn't know what to do. She replied. Can I at least tell Tedium? I thought I said no one. Under no circumstance. I don't believe I stuttered. The mood was getting increasingly more tense. What if I refuse? I'll just go to the media and let the whole world know what you're hiding here. You don't want to try me. You really shouldn't have said that. You think you're scaring me? Go ahead, send that gorilla Maxilla in here. Let him beat me to a pulp. People will come looking for me and they'll find out the truth. The people deserve to know the truth. Who are you to hide knowledge from the people? My tirade continued for a few minutes. Dux did not say a word. She simply stood up and left the room. It was then I heard those forceful footsteps furiously marching forward. Maxilla was charging at me at full speed with only one thought on his mind. How to inflict as much pain on me as possible. It started with several punches to the face and torso. Every punch was more painful than the previous one. By the 20th punch, I could no longer see or hear anything. My vision went black and my ears were ringing. All I can feel were the blows to my body, my ribs, my stomach, my jaw. I was defenseless and accepting the beating of a lifetime. By the time he was done with me, I could only feel the metallic taste of blood on my lips. My body was warm from all the bruises and I could barely hold my head up. I'm uncertain how long after the assault Maxilla returned to provide his final speech. I passed out from the pain and he woke me up by splashing ice cold water on me from the bucket. Okay, tough guy, can you hear me? He asked. I mumbled. Yes. Using every ounce of energy I had left. Good. Now there's plenty more where that came from. But I'm pretty sure you'll play nice now. You are in no position to be making demands here, comprende? Now, I'm feeling generous today, so you get to see the light of day. However, do not test my patience. I can make whatever just happened to you here look like a walk in the park. I've made men, far superior men than you, beg for death. They begged and they begged, but seldom did I capitulate to their requests. I kept them alive until they felt pain in every nerve in their body. Maxilla pulled up the chair and sat next to me. You see this photo? He showed me a photo, but I could not lift my head. Look at it! He grabbed me by the back of my head and shoved the photo closer to my face. It was a photo of my family. Mom, dad, sister, dog. I know that got your attention. So, tough guy, do you want your family to suffer the same fate? I shook my head. Great, let's call this my insurance policy. If you tell anyone what you heard here today, I'll make sure to personally skin your family alive as you watch. I'll make sure their souls slowly vanish in front of you, and I'll have them stare right into your eyes. Maxilla let go of my head and it dropped to my chest. I will not lie, I was frightened. All I can do is sit there in my own fluids as they drip down to the floor. I was a broken man, I have lost all the fight in me. I have been clearly defeated. I regretted my decisions instantly and spent whatever remaining moments of consciousness I had left thinking about my family. 
I would have cried if Maxilla had not destroyed the ability of my eyes to function. I should have kept my mouth shut. We were so close to leaving this terrible place. Why do I always lose my temper? I heard a chair being dragged across the floor. I wanted to look up but didn't have the strength to do so. I heard the chair hit the ground to my right and a familiar voice saying, What happened? Chapter 12 Dangerous Discharge Oblivio's encounter was far worse than mine. I was only bored. I listened to him reciting the events that have passed and was shocked. He told me about Maxilla's brutal beatings. I was asking Oblivio about everything he was told about it, but only received one-word answers. I knew Oblivio was not trying to be impolite, but he actually was physically unable to string together a full sentence. I could tell every word spoken felt like torture for him. I eased off and decided to let him rest. He essentially merely existed with no function of his body. I don't think I've ever received such a powerful beating. I'm certain neither did Oblivio prior to that day. When we were kids, we would usually get into fights and scuffles, but only received minor injuries. We would quickly bounce back the next day and be ready to fight our next opponents. Once we grew older and more mature, our physical altercations became more sporadic. I think most realize that the older you get, the more susceptible you are to injuries, and it takes a hell of a lot longer to bounce back. I remember the first time I realized my fragility. It was quite recent, about a year ago. I dislocated my shoulder. I was not doing anything strenuous at the time, but my body gave up. It took about 6 months for me to get back to normal and I was still not where I was before. It would still pain me from time to time if I moved my arm a certain way. The difference between us and Maxilla it seems was that Maxilla never had that fight instinct wither away. He probably kept on training, increasing his strength and becoming better at inflicting pain on people. He was definitely a force to be reckoned with. At this point, I thought whether or not he, like me, realized his limitations. He would not be able to keep doing this forever. No matter how many push-ups he'll do, eventually his body will break down. Did he think about this or did he merely ignore these thoughts like I did as a child? Did he still think he was invincible until proven otherwise? I think he ignored these thoughts and filed them under weakness in his mind, probably attributed to something feminine that a real man should not be concerned with. These were, of course, my mere assumption about his character. I could have been completely out to lunch. A bit of time passed and Oblivio and Inepta were still out cold. I was still in a state of shock and could not rest. I wanted to holler and get someone's attention, but reconsidered after looking at Oblivio. I was not willing to receive such blows to my person. Luckily for me, I heard Maxilla's footstep coming down the hall. Perhaps unluckily. Though it could still be heard, I could tell the stride was much less forceful than before. He was almost calm in his steps. He came into the room, pulled up a chair and sat down in front of me. He lowered his posture in order to look at me straight in the eyes. He did not break eye contact or even blink. He took a brief pause before speaking just to make sure to intimidate me even more. Now, I'm going to speak and you're going to listen. I'm sure you are a more reasonable man than your friend over there. Or at least, what is left of him. He may have told you some confidential things that most people are not privy to. We just want you to keep your mouth shut. Now, your friend was against our position and you see how he ended up. Do you wish to end up the same? Maxilla asked me in his chilling voice, so I nodded no. Now, that's good. Because aside from what you know, you guys are no threat. If you start spewing what you saw here today, though, you change to a threat real goddamn quick. I know I beat some sense into him, but I think that will not be necessary here as you understand what I'm saying. Maxilla continued. What do you want us to say? I asked. Maxilla thought for a few minutes and blurted out some ideas. Nothing too crazy. Drugs, car problems, girls, etc. He really did not care as long as we did not mention what happened here. He went on to explain that we will be sent back home tomorrow morning and that if we were to mention this to anyone, they will kill us and our families. He then pulled out pictures of my family to show me he was not messing around. He also described in great graphic detail the way he will torture my family and kill them in front of my own eyes, the details of which I will spare you. I promptly reassured Maxilla I will not mention a word of this to anyone as long as I can finally go home. Maxilla liked what he heard and stood up from his chair. I knew you were reasonable. We will bring some food and water shortly. He then walked away and I was finally relieved. I sat for what seemed like several hours, but again could have been minutes. I was feeling better about the whole situation as I knew we would be released. I would not lie. The thought did cross my mind that they were going to kill us, but I figured if they wanted us dead, we would have been dead already. Oblivio was as close to dead as you can get, but still not dead. I was excited for some nourishment as I have not eaten in quite a while. Oblivio looked like he would be unable to eat anything and likely had to be fed through a tube. I was not even sure if Inepta will wake up as she has been unconscious for most of the time we have known each other. If I had to provide an adjective to describe Inepta, it would likely be comatose. The food arrived as they unshackled Oblivio and I. Inepta was still tied up. 
I guess they thought she might still have another psychotic outburst and did not want to risk it. I dove into those stale three-day-old dry sandwiches without a moment of hesitation. To me at that point, this might as well have been a steak and lobster dinner. I must have gone through five or six of them until I came to my senses. I had to leave some for Oblivia for when slash if he would wake up. I decided to check up on his condition and tapped him on the shoulder. After several attempts, Oblivia was finally starting to show some sign of life. He lifted his head slowly, revealing his face decorated with the now dried blood. As I was already untied, I decided to find some napkins and clean him up a bit. It took me several minutes to scrub the remnants off his face. I had to keep remoistening the napkin. Eventually, his face started to look better. It was still scarred, but most of the dry spots were clean. Oblivio? I called his name. He looked at me but did not speak. At least he has regained consciousness and some comprehension. I helped him eat, which proved to be quite a cumbersome task. He would chew for a while, then used all of his power to swallow. This process was repeated several times. It must have taken him about 22 minutes to finish one sandwich, but I knew he needed the strength if we were to survive this awful mess. I think we stopped at the third sandwich as Oblivio was having a hard time digesting. He then sat back into his seat and stared at the ceiling, not saying a word. I still wanted to know what happened, but decided to give him a few moments to recuperate. The situation could have not been stranger. NASA holding us captive on suspicions of intergalactic terrorism. I got interrogated by someone from NASA's Human Resources Department, who was clearly ignorant to anything that was happening. On the other hand, Oblivio was given some information which he refused to keep hidden and in turn received a beating. If I was running this operation, I would have certainly not wanted Oblivio to have that information. I would have chosen me. This was not some self-centered arrogant notion that I would have handled the situation better. I was not pandering to my ego. It was actually quite the opposite. I was as ignorant as they come. Even if they were to explain to me, I probably would have not understood a word they said. Oblivio, on the other hand, was quite intelligent and ideological. He understood all of this perfectly and had the capacity to explain it to others. It did seem to be part of some grand plan. I think they were just improvising as they went along. As I was stewing in my own thoughts, I noticed Inepta, who was still unconscious. What was her connection to all of this? All I knew was that she had a psychotic episode about nothing, and I was not referring to Seinfeld. Was she a terrorist? Maybe she was just like Oblivio, not willing to keep quiet, so they kept her locked up. What was her story? How did she get involved in all of this? Was she just another fallen casualty for a mistaken identity? They were injecting her with some powerful sedative as I did not see her move since yesterday. Perhaps they have given her a lethal injection. Was she actually a concern? Were they going to release her with us? Were they really going to release us? Exploring all the nonsensical things that have happened here, I completely missed the biggest question. Why were they letting us go? They have gone to great length to capture us and bring us here. Even if they were mistaken as to what our motives were, why release us? We surely already knew enough to launch an investigation. I can imagine the news headlines. NASA held two young men hostage. It would be such a great controversy without us exposing the real secret. After a while, my brain started to hurt from trying to figure out what was going on. I needed Oblivio to tell me what was going on here. Oblivio was staring at the ceiling with the occasional blink. I could tell that he was trying to avoid blinking as it caused him pain. Oblivio? I called out his name. He looked at me and whispered ever so gently. What? Again, I could see the great pain that this was causing him. I'm not sure if you heard, but they were going to let us go soon. I told Oblivio and anticipated a response. He merely nodded off and stared at the wall. It's a good thing. I continued while Oblivio was staring at the wall. I have made several more attempts to get a reaction out of Oblivio, but to no avail. I decided to up my game. I had sex with your mother. To my surprise, Oblivio just sat there motionless as ever. This was beginning to frighten me. I wanted him to snap out of it. I decided to grab his shoulder and shake him a little bit. What did they tell you, Oblivio? What happened? You have to tell me. I started to noticeably panic. Oblivio was struggling to string his words together. They told me a secret. He then took a long pause and breathed heavily. I did not want to rush him, but I already waited a while and was growing more impatient. I signaled him to keep talking. He finally explained to me with great difficulty what ducks told him. In between his gasps for air, I was able to gather that there were alien life forms looking to attack us and NASA was the front line of defense. We were apparently in a wrong place, wrong time situation and they thought we were somehow related to the whole ordeal. I could not believe it. Aliens. I always thought this was the work of fiction, but NASA confirmed that they do in fact exist. I was flabbergasted. I did not really know how to react to this information. Oblivio still sat there motionless. I thought he would have been more excited to find out information like this. After all, he was the astronomy buff who dedicated his life to it. What do you feel about the whole thing? I asked. I think it's a load of shit, Oblivio answered. What? I was taken aback. They're lying to us. They tried to make it look like they have mistaken us for terrorists, but I don't buy it, Oblivio explained. But, but why? 
I have no clue and I'm not willing to take another beating to find out. Whatever they're hiding here, they can keep at it. I'm not going to mention anything to anyone as it is all essentially horseshit. Oblivio said his piece and returned to his wall staring. Why would they do that? I asked, but Oblivio remained silent. I kept on asking and nudging him from time to time, however there was no response. I continued to ramble on explaining that he should clarify his point until he finally exploded in anger. Does this make any sense to you? First, they kidnap us under the guise that we are terrorists of some sort. Then, they refuse to give us any information at all under the guise that it is confidential. We then get interrogated some more and beaten. All of a sudden, we are free to go as we are not terrorists and all this confidential business is out the window. Top secret, national security information is given to a couple of young guys. Are they going on just faith that we're not going to tell anyone? All this in a matter of 24 hours. Yeah, it's a load of horse shit. Though this tirade was aimed at me, it was kind of nice to see Oblivio back to normal. He did make quite a few good points, but at that point, I was not able to reflect on the situation anymore. I felt like my brain was about to burst out of my skull. I decided to just try and go back to sleep until they released us. I was able to fall asleep quite quickly as I was now fed. I knocked out almost instantly. I woke up to a sudden loud alarm blaring through my ears. It kept on beeping loudly and outside I could see gunmen were mobilizing. Attention, attention. We have a breach in the south wing. We are implementing protocol G5. A voiceover came over the speaker. It seems someone has been trying to break into the building. I looked at Oblivio which was also confused by all the hoopla. We tried to communicate but the sound of the alarm was far louder than our voices. The noise was bouncing off the concrete in this very small room. Inepta was also slowly beginning to wake up wondering what is going on. The alarm continued for a while as gunmen entered the room and took cover behind the door. While the door was open, sounds of gunfire were heard over the sound of the alarm. I was getting scared. If we could hear gunshots over the alarm, it meant the attackers were near. I was thinking we were about to be released and go home, but here I was again fearing for my life. All I could do was hope these attackers could see that we were clearly not part of this organization as we were tied down and leave us alone. However, bullets rarely make these differentiations. We could not even duck or move in any sort of way to seek safety. The gunshots kept flying. Through the door, we could see many of the troops injured or dead. Even Maxilla was lying motionless among them. The few gunmen that entered kept low to the ground and were not firing any rounds. I think they were merely hiding, hoping not to be found. I had no confidence in these men trying to save our lives. Suddenly, a bright light appeared from behind the door and filled the room. In fact, it blew the door off the hinges, and I felt the heat. The gunmen were knocked to the floor as were Nepta, Oblivio, and I. It was a strong explosion. My ears were ringing. I could not hear anything and only saw the back of the room. My senses were shot and I had no idea what was going on. I saw the remnants of another bomb exploding and the debris landed on my head. The last thing I remember was something heavy landing on my head and losing consciousness. Chapter 13 Nasty Nebulas What do we do with them? I heard a faint voice from a distance. Who do they work for? Another voice chimed in. I could not really make out what the people in the other room were saying. I was still groggy and only began to wake up. From their tone, I could ascertain they were arguing. The arguing was not loud and dramatic, but rather it was subtle. The hushed argument reminded me of the ways Oblivio used to get mad at me in class when I was interrupting him. He was mad, no doubt about that, but his voice had to remain low as to not disrupt the class. I always got a kick out of that. I found the whole notion of suppressing emotion quite humorous. On the one hand, you are angry, and on the other, quiet. The best way to describe it is loud whispers, which is an oxymoron if I ever heard one. If I was to say a person is irate, the image in most people's mind is someone loudly expressing their disapproval of a certain action. The emphasis is on loudly, as most people express disapproval all the time. However, they are not always angry during this expression. A person expressing their disapproval of an action while using their indoor voice may be classified as upset or irritated. The same person will only be referred to as angry when their voice rises above a certain decibel level. A person who loud whispers, however, breaks this reality. They are able to both be quiet, disapproving, and also angry. I like to think of it as composed anger. I am angry, but I must keep myself together for the sake of the masses. This composure solely exists due to socialization. If you were the only person in the world and angry, you would surely scream as there's no repercussions. Your cries, though, would be like that philosophical tree that falls in the forest. The fact that there are people around suppresses our true selves. When I was acting up as a child, or adult, most would say, behave yourself, there are people around. That statement, and that statement alone, should cue your brain to reconsider your actions. 
This composed anger is funny to me as it reminds me that we are all slaves to society. The society that forces us to dampen our emotions in public in order to avoid the worst punishment known to man. A negative perception of us. As I was in my own head again, I noticed that Oblivio was beginning to wake up. I scouted the area and saw we were the only ones there. Inepta may have stayed back at NASA or perhaps killed in that explosion. Once again, Oblivio and I were held captive by a group of people with motives unknown who could potentially kill us. All of this because Oblivio wanted to go stargazing, what I considered the most boring activity ever imagined. In an odd way, the fact that he has taken more physical abuse than me made sense. Where are we? Oblivio asked. Beats me, I answered. What happened? Well, all I really remember is an explosion and a bunch of armed gunmen before I lost consciousness. I also remember they were going to set us free, but now we are held by another group of people who also have guns who may kill us. The reason again is unknown to us. And would you like to know why we are in this mess? Why? Because a certain someone, who shall remain nameless, wanted us to drive to the middle of nowhere, in the cold, to look at balls of light. This led to NASA thinking we are intergalactic terrorists and physically battering us. Now we have the privilege to be beaten or killed by this group. They may be the same intergalactic terrorists NASA was looking for. With any luck, they may mistake us for NASA employees. I get it, Oblivio interrupted. No, 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 no. Let me finish. They might think we are their enemies and will likely torture and or kill us. Yeah, 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 it's my fault, Oblivio interjected again. Exactly. At least you should be aware of that fact. I was really driving the point home. What do you want me to say, huh? I know we're in this mess because of me. How am I supposed to even predict this would happen? You know me. I'm the least exciting guy out there. We literally went stargazing. The most boring, uneventful activity out there. Agreed, I chimed in. I didn't want any of this to happen. One moment I can't find Jupiter and the next moment we're kidnapped twice. Well, I just have one thing to say, I interrupted. What is that? Fuck you, Oblivio. Oblivio and I were arguing for so long that we did not even realize that our new kidnappers were actually in the room looking at us. They seemed very confused and much less vicious than NASA. In fact, while we were arguing, they just stood there and made little passive-aggressive throat clears as opposed to flat-out yelling at us. They eventually got our attention by shouting at us. At that point, we realized they were going to tell us about their organization. How lovely. There were three of them, unarmed. Their leader stepped forward and introduced himself as Bonham. He was rambling for a while about making sure that we were feeling well. It seemed as though he really cared whether or not we felt shook by the events. He seemed like a man who did not appreciate conflict. I know I only had two organizations kidnap me in my life, but I think this one would definitely rate among the top five kindest kidnappers of all time. This was a definite improvement to how NASA treated us, but we still had no idea what was going on. No matter how nice your kidnappers are, you would still like to be home. So why are we here? Oblivio was growing impatient and decided to ask. I'll be honest. Bonham paused for a second. You are not part of the mission. Mission? mission? Oblivio and I spoke in unison. Yes, we were on a mission to save Inepta. She is one of ours and was kidnapped about a month ago. She is vital to our mission and is the only one who got close enough, Bonham explained. Closer, Closer to, to what? what? Oblivio and I spoke at once. The truth, Bonham proclaimed and stood silently. What in the hell are you talking about? What truth? Who are you people? Oblivio could not bear the silence. You see, we are all astronomers. We all hold doctorates and postdoctorates and have been studying the vastness of the cosmos for decades. We have dedicated our lives to the discovery of space. However, some of us started noticing inconsistencies, Bonham explained. Inconsistencies? Oblivio uttered. Like Jupiter the other night? Exactly. Just a few nights ago, someone who goes by the username Astroglide1496 posted about Jupiter not showing up at the coordinates it was supposed to be at, Bonham stated. That was me! Oblivio exclaimed. Everyone looked in shock at Oblivio. They could not believe that he was the famous Astroglide1496. Some have said to have been following him for years and finding his posts quite interesting. They all gathered around Oblivio singing his praises as I sat quietly on the sidelines. Not only did these people know Oblivio, they were also praising him for being a stargazer, the most boring activity known to man. They all started sharing their own experience as they related to the inconsistencies they themselves have found. They were all talking over each other trying to share their own story with the group. Every time someone spoke, another person in the group remembered another incident. It was at that point I realized how good I had it at NASA. At least they would beat us and leave us alone. Listening to this was the real torture. After about 32 to 48 minutes of this, I've had enough. I let out a loud scream, which seemed to have gotten everyone's attention. I still had many unanswered questions. Why were we here? What did Inepta know? Who were these people? Aside from the fact that these people liked the same boring shit Oblivio did, they were an enigma. As much as I could tell Oblivio was enjoying the attention, my scream brought back his inquisitive side. These people were definitely pleasant and loving, but they were still our kidnappers. Kidnappers who used deadly force to free Inepta. 
Can we get back on track as to why we are here? I understand there are many inconsistencies. What does it have to do with us? I asked. Yes, the inconsistencies. Bonham cleared his throat and continued. We all found many inconsistencies. One or two may have been excusable. However, we compiled hundreds over the years. Anytime we approached NASA with inquiries for clarifications on certain points, we were turned away. As scientists, we understand the value of sharing information and gaining knowledge. All of us were baffled as to why we were being turned away for what to us seemed like a routine inquiry. That is odd, Oblivio piped up. This had all the scientists beginning to share their own stories of how they were turned away from NASA. Let's stay on point, please, I assertively remarked. I feared another 34 minutes of mind-numbingly dull conversation. Well, eventually a few of us got fed up with the whole thing and formed a group. We figured they would have to listen to us as there is strength in numbers. However, things did not go as expected. NASA has become more vicious with its responses. We were threatened with legal actions, public defamation, and physical violence. This was all for asking a few questions to clarify these inconsistencies. Bonham took a pause. So, you think they're hiding something? Oblivio asked. Yes, Bonham gestured to Oblivio. They have something to hide. But what? That's where Skisco, or Inepta as you know her, comes in. We told our story to every news organization only to be laughed at. They thought the idea that NASA is hiding something was so ludicrous that we should sell the story to the Onion. The only investigative reporter that was willing to review our claims was Skisco. She has gone undercover many a times in order to get her news piece, and, luckily for us, she was interested in the story. She assumed the role of Inepta, an intern at NASA, where she can dig in further to see what was going on. What did she find? Oblivio asked. You see, that's the problem. She was to establish contact every evening at 9 p.m. The first few nights we spoke, there was really no viable information. It was the basic training and meeting people. As the days progressed, Inepta started sensing that NASA was covering up something. She was surprised that so much of the training revolved around keeping her mouth shut. All of management was very secretive and employees were not allowed to access almost 90% of the facilities. She was also surprised that as an intern she was not receiving any training on technical equipment or was giving any research assignments. In fact, any time she raised a question, she was ignored. What happened next? I was starting to get interested. Nothing. Bonham answered. Nothing? Nothing? Oblivio and I asked. Yes, that was the last piece of information we received. She did not make contact for over a month after that. We figured she was in trouble, so we set out a rescue mission. When we reached the room and saw you tied up next to Inepta, we figured you were probably not with NASA. I would love to say that my mind was at ease at this moment, but it actually was running 100 miles a minute. We all knew NASA was hiding something. Oblivio and I sensed this was the case. Oblivio decided to share our story with them. This was no surprise, as this is the only time I've seen Oblivio quiet for more than 24 seconds. He recapped everything. The stargazing, the kidnapping, Maxilla. He mentioned how they identified these groups as intergalactic terrorists which received a chuckle from all listeners. He described in graphic detail the physical violence he had to endure merely for raising his voice. He then blurted out their explanation, but as the words aliens exited his mouth he hesitated. I think at that point he actually believed this might explain all the secrecy. When he told me about it back at NASA's headquarters I believed it. Think about it, it explains all the secrecy. These aliens and terrorists want to hurt humanity and just like the FBI or CIA, much of the information must remain classified to ensure public safety. Security has to be at its highest as many undesirables would be trying to invade their headquarters to obtain viable information. The aliens could be the ones messing up with all the telescopes which led to these so-called inconsistencies. It made sense, but was it the case? Are there extraterrestrials trying to take over our planet? As Oblivio finished his sentence regarding the alien explanation, the whole crowd looked at each other and busted out laughing. It was a non-stop defiling session for about 2 minutes and 36 seconds. All of them were red in the face. Oblivio and I awkwardly looked at each other and waited for them to finish. This was the first time in a few days where we witnessed some emblem of happiness. Their laughter, though aimed at us, was a pleasant reminder that there was still joy in the world. We had to wait for a few good minutes for the laughter to die off completely before we could inquire as to what was so humorous. When the whole entourage was finished with their giggling, Bonham decided to finally say something. Aliens. That's hilarious. We have looked at the sky and have done our research. There are no intelligent life forms out there trying to interfere with beings here on Earth. We are not that interesting. Trust me. He was explaining this to us in confidence. He did not seem like the person who was trying to lie to us. He was certain this was an explanation given to most people to throw them off track. He was quite adamant, claiming this explanation was to appeal to some adolescent fantasy of extraterrestrials rather than addressing the real issue. What is the real issue? Oblivio was curious. This is what we're looking for, Bonham responded. I understand, but you must have some theories. Oblivio was trying to make sense of it all. Well, Astroglide, I have no theories. 
I think it is merely gross incompetence that is hidden. These textbooks and articles are simply being published without any evidence. The pressure to provide new information in this day and age is pushing scientists to produce research that is far from accurate. They need to have a certain number of publications in order to be eligible for their doctor degree and various grants which leads to many research papers being absolute bullshit. Bonham's explanation was beginning to make more and more sense. Though, when compared to aliens, most explanations seem to make more sense. If NASA was so concerned with preserving the secret information, then I would highly doubt they would share the information with every Tom, Dick, and Oblivio they catch. I would, however, argue that any organization that could monitor the internet and catch any Tom, Dick, and Oblivio that post on some random form could not be that incompetent. I decided to raise that concern with Bonham to see what he had to say. Listen, Bonham started. I'm not suggesting they are completely incompetent in every way, shape, or form. I'm merely saying that in researching and astronomy, they cut many corners. They spend more time trying to silence the masses than actually do what they're supposed to do. Research. Why do you think that is? I asked. It's in their best interest. NASA receives heavy government funding. They can't just go around and say we were not able to find anything this year. The politicians will be quick to tell them that their budget will be cut next year. So they must produce some sort of evidence to warrant their salaries. Bonham's theory was beginning to make more and more sense. After all, most government organizations are better at controlling the message than actually completing the task. I always found it funny that politicians never failed. There were always a success story. Even the times where they must admit that they failed, they would turn around and say it was a learning experience. It was not failure. It was an opportunity for us to better ourselves. And now we are better for it. Aliens. How did I end up falling for that one? There were still a few unanswered questions. There was still something that we needed to know. Who are these people? Oblivio was keeping quiet, I think this was due to his injuries. He was one tough son of a bitch, he took that beating and was still able to muster up the strength to string a few coherent sentences together. He was able to keep the conversation going with these astronomers for quite some time. I could see that he had to rest, so I had to do some of the heavy lifting to figure out the rest. So you are not an intergalactic terrorist organization? I asked. Heavens no, Bonham chuckled. Are you a regular earthly terrorist organization? Bonham chuckled. Nope, not that interesting, just astronomers. Astronomers with guns. Well, Bonham hesitated. Who can infiltrate a highly secure government building with a well-trained army, who also ended up killing and injuring many people in the highly secure government building. I proceeded with my questioning. Poppycock. They may want to label us as terrorists, but we only seek the truth. They have forced us to organize when they rejected our calls. They force us to act when they threatened us. They have forced us to use violence when they kidnap one of our own. If you want to label us as terrorists, go ahead. I mean, you guys are terrorists, technically. You are using violence to promote your political ideology. As I uttered these words, I realized these people can still kill me if they wanted to. Not my brightest moment. Bonham looked like he was going to say something to rebuttal my argument, but then looked away. It seemed as though he was thinking. Perhaps I struck a chord with him. It is not every day somebody calls you a terrorist. It is also not every day that someone makes a valid argument to prove that point. I looked at the other two that were with him, and they seemed to have been pondering as well. It looked like I was able to get all of them. They were so busy fighting the cause that they ignored their actions. The mood felt quite gloomy, so I decided to lighten the atmosphere a little. Don't get me wrong, you're obviously trying to uncover what is going on there. This is a conspiracy that does not require any foil hats, I said and they chuckled. We are not crazy. There is something there. We just want to know what they're hiding, Bonham responded. 100%. Believe me, I have been on both sides now and your side is definitely the sane one. Yes, I mean, we both kidnapped you technically. Yeah, but you're much nicer. As much as a kidnapper could be. Either that or you're developing Stockholm Syndrome. We spoke and chuckled for a while. We began to better acquaint ourselves and I must say it was a very pleasant conversation. Oblivio was still out of it so all the attention was on me. It was nice for once to be the center of attention instead of Oblivio. He was always the smartest so he received praise for it. I was actually discounted as the dumb one. Evidently, being the most sarcastic one does not earn you much praise. Oblivio was also more successful with women, as the case was with Minima. Turns out women respond better to intelligent than sarcasm as well. By the way, what's the name of your organization? Some of the names they came up with NASA were pretty silly, I asked. Haha, <laughs> yeah. They do get creative, Bonham answered. One of them was named the Black Holes. I started laughing. Bonham looked awkwardly to the side and said, uh, That actually used to be our name. I stood there awkwardly as we stared at each other. But it's not our name anymore, he added. Oh, what a relief. I blurted out as the awkwardness lightened. Because you do understand the endless possibilities for innuendos there. Yes, 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 we've gotten much ridicule for that one. Some people should get their minds out of the gutter. Black holes occur in space. But also in your butt? I was holding back my laughter. Bonham laughed sarcastically. Yes, it is for immature jokes like that that we changed our name. What's your name now? 
We are the Nasty Nebulas, Bonham proclaimed with pride. Ah, I stood there with my mouth open. What? Bonham looked at me. No, 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 it's a good name. But Bonham was trying to obtain further information. But, but, but nothing, it's good. Nasty Nebulas, gotta love the alliteration. I awkwardly strung a few words together. Good. Bonham put his hands together. You and Astroglide should get some rest. Sure thing, I nodded. And as for tomorrow, Bonham stopped and looked at me. I feel like you have an issue with the name. No, no. I was backpedaling. It's nice. It seems like you're just saying that to appease me in some sort of way. We awkwardly stared at each other in silence. I tried to muster up a few words to reassure them that I liked the name, but nothing came up. I ended up standing there like an idiot, opening and closing my mouth without saying anything. I don't think they liked me very much. Chapter 14. Exactly 43 tenths. The nasty nebulas, despite my awful first impression, let us stay on their compound. I call it a compound as I really did not have any other way to describe this location. It had no running water or electricity. All power was generated by gasoline and water was brought in in gallon jugs. There were dark gray tents all over where people slept or held meetings. If I had to guess, it was about two acres of land. Spread throughout the land were exactly 43 tents. I say exactly as I counted them one by one. This is not because I was interested in surveying the land, nor was I tasked to take a census. The reason I did it is far more pathetic. Boredom. I did not fit in at all at this place. Everyone here was discussing astronomy, stars, nebulas, and whatever else the cosmos had to offer. I was out of place. It was like humanity has been replaced by a bunch of oblivios. People were talking day and night, night and day about astronomy, and I had nothing to contribute. Perhaps there was the odd time I could muster up a coherent sentence, but it was shortly followed up by silence as I had nothing to add. The people here were definitely nice. Compared to NASA which hurt us physically and verbally, the nasty nebulas were a definite improvement. The people here definitely tried to make me feel welcome, but there was only so much one person could do. All of them had a common denominator, the love of space, and that was all they wanted to talk about. I think the most I was able to speak to anyone was 5 minutes before the conversation reverted back to the universe or some new discovery. Didn't anyone have any other hobbies? I spent most of my days walking around the area and enjoying the scenery. It was the only aspect of this whole ordeal that kept me sane. The view was magnificent to say the least. We were on top of a small hill that overlooked the forested area. It was cold in the evening but quite bearable throughout the day. The tree's branches were mostly bare, however the leaves started to grow. I enjoyed staring into the distance and seeing the trees dance with the wind. Along with those walks, I decided to count various things. People, generators, tents, of which there were exactly 43. I can guarantee there were 43 as I counted it thrice, don't you agree? There were exactly 76 generators, exactly 179 people, and exactly 43 tents. This was what I was reduced to. Counting. There was never a time in my life that I thought I would reach such levels of boredom that I would count everything in sight, multiple times for entertainment's sakes. My view of reality was beginning to warp, as did my sense of self. I understood this will end one day and everything would be back to normal, but this light at the end of the tunnel was not shining in my direction. I was surrounded by people, 179 to be exact, yet I was completely alone. It had been a few weeks and Oblivio has mostly recovered from his injuries. Unlike me, Oblivio was completely in this element. He would wake up every day with a smile. He would greet each and every one on the compound and had a conversation with them. Would you care to guess what was the topic of conversation? Space. I would have very little interaction with him as he was busy conversing with others. In the last few weeks, I think at most we talked for about 26 minutes. I didn't blame him for not giving me much attention. He was in his element and I wasn't. This was paradise for him, aside from the whole kidnapping thing. This place was actually what Oblivio was looking for his whole life. A group of intellectuals with similar interests where he can learn about the topic he has been interested in since childhood. Back in pre-kidnapping times, Oblivio did not meet many who were informed as he. At university, there were definitely others who were interested in the whole astronomy thing, but there were very few Oblivio could learn from. In fact, Oblivio used to pester professors so much that he would be banned from coming to their office. The professors knew if Oblivio is coming to visit, you might as well clear your schedule for the foreseeable future. He didn't care that basic hygiene or warm meals were but a mere pipe dream in this compound. He didn't care spending cold nights without any semblance of heating. He didn't care about sleeping in one of the 43 tents every night on a camping mat. These were all minor inconveniences for him that were not compared to the sheer ecstasy he experienced learning about new planets and constellations. I was ready to leave this place and never return. I often wondered what my family thought had happened to me. Oblivio and I had been gone for weeks with no contact with the outside world. Oblivio was not looking to leave this place for obvious reasons, but I did think we had to discuss some sort of exit strategy. After all, this was not our home and this was not our family. 
These were hospitable kidnappers who saved us from other more vicious kidnappers, but they were kidnappers nonetheless. I knew something had to be said and not just for my sanity's sake. These nasty nebulas attacked NASA with deadly force, and NASA seemed to have enough firepower to bring each one of the 179 residents here to their knees. I was certain their rifles would easily penetrate our tents, of which there were exactly 43. I spotted Bonham walking alone in the distance and decided to inquire about our status. At that point I realized I was only assuming I could not leave this place. Perhaps a conversation with him would have informed me otherwise. Though, I was not sure what good this would have done as I had no idea how to leave this forest, let alone find my way home. I hollered at him to get his attention and ran over to him. He heard my calls, stopped and turned around to greet me. After exchanging a few pleasantries, I decided to get right down to it. What's the main objective here? I asked. What do you mean? Bonham looked at me with a perplexed look. What's the end game? What are you trying to accomplish? Oblivion and I have been here for weeks with no sign of an agenda. You guys have been here much longer. Your ineptoplan went down the tubes and what are you planning to do next? I was talking very quickly due to my anxiety. In short, we don't really have a plan. We were trying to get some information out of Inepta, or Skisco I should say, but with very little help. She just keeps mumbling there's nothing out there. I think this was probably how NASA tried to brainwash her to believe there's no wrongdoing on their part. So we're just planning to stay here and do nothing? I was getting impatient. So far we have not formulated the plan. Alright, can I leave then? What? This caught Bonham by surprise. Well can I leave this place? Doesn't look like you have a plan and even if you did I have no idea what I would do to help. Well it's not that simple. Pretty simple to me, I interrupted forcefully. Either I can go or I cannot. Either I am held here against my will or I am not. I want to leave this space, pun not intended. The pun was definitely intended. Listen, Tedium, I understand you are upset, but we can't simply let you go. We attack the government agency and have to lay low. We can't just let you guys leave. NASA can find you and then find us. You'll be back being tortured and will be decimated by their bullets. I wish we can let you go, but this is not possible. I had a feeling that was what he was going to say, but I still foolishly held on to my optimism. After I heard what Bonham had to say, I was emotionally and psychologically destroyed. I was stuck here, indefinitely, without any option of leaving. What was worse was that there was no plan to move forward, which made the metaphorical tunnel light grow dimmer and dimmer. I had no idea how long I would stay among these 179 people, 76 generators and 43 tents. I felt absolutely helpless. After pleading with Bonham for a few minutes, I gave up and walked away. I walked around the compound for hours, but this time I was not counting anything. I literally have lost all hope. I was actually beginning to think it would have been better to have just been killed by Maxilla back at NASA's headquarters. I didn't say or do much that day or the next. I kept on walking aimlessly looking at the trees, the sky, the ground, the distance. Everyone around me seemed to be fine with the status quo. They were smiling, laughing and engaging in conversation amongst themselves. I felt as though I was a goat floating around everyone. I was able to hear and see everyone, but I could not engage in any human contact. I had even given up trying to talk to Oblivio. He seemed much happier that way. This was not some pessimistic or self-pitiful observation. I remember all the times Oblivio and I interacted and he never once was as happy as he was at the compound. We would usually argue, fight and bicker. He would get mad because I belittled his interest and he would belittle me for my lack of knowledge. I was starting to wonder why we were even friends in the first place. I was wondering and wondering what will the future look like. Will these 179 people in 43 tents be the only life I know going forward? I was in need of companionship, someone like me, an outsider to this community. It was at that moment I thought of Skisco. She was the perfect fit for me. She couldn't talk to anybody, mostly was by herself and truly did not belong. Originally she was heavily guarded as Bonham did not want anyone to trigger another panic attack in her. I can't say I blame him. I witnessed it back at NASA and it was a freaky sight. As time progressed, their protection of her was getting more and more lax. Her situation was not improving at all. Bonham, as I, had given up on obtaining any useful information from her. At that point, he was mostly concerned of keeping her fed and providing her with basic necessities. One day when I noticed her tent was unguarded, I decided to sneak in. The inside of her tent looked like the other 42 tents out there, nothing out of the ordinary. She was sitting on the floor, cross-legged, looking forward. She was not startled by my appearance, nor was she aware. She merely looked forward with a blank stare. To be honest, this was an improvement for when we were at NASA. Her grimace has improved from absolute shock to apathy. I remember when I looked at her, I knew she was not thinking or reflecting on her life. She was merely existing, breathing in and out. Her mind was blank, her soul was gone from her body, and all she can do was stare at the tense wall without blinking. I sat next to her for a while in complete silence. She remained in the same position. She did not move her head to the side or look in any other direction. I was admiring the fact that she could just remain motionless for that long. My legs by now would have surely felt the cut in blood flow. I was looking around the tent and intermittently looking at her. 
I never realized how beautiful she was. At NASA, it was hard to tell what she really looked like as she was pale, malnourished, and unrested. Now I was able to see her delicate facial features, her soft lips, her green eyes, and her long flowing hair. I knew nothing could ever come of this as she was pretty much mute and motionless, but I enjoyed the brief make-believe romantic scenario I have created in my head. I was always attracted to women I should have not been attracted to. At NASA, I wanted to make Ducks my wife, where it was clear her motivation was to torture me. Again, there was no chance of anything happening, but the fantasies that were playing in my head brought me joy. Even when I was not in this extreme scenario back in university, I made some awful choices. Minima, though very attractive, was absolutely not my type. We literally had nothing in common. She enjoyed studying and placed a high value on education and intelligence, i.e. not me. It made perfect sense why she was more attracted to Oblivio and ignored my advances. To her, I was a nuisance, I was one of those people who did not care about studying and would amount to nothing. She was correct in her assessment, but that did not mean that I would love her less. In fact, I would have probably worshipped the ground she walked on. The more I kept on thinking about my failed romances, the more depressed I got. My plan to come here was meant to get rid of my blues, however, it only amplified them. I decided to spark up a conversation with Skisco. I realized the conversation was gonna be one-sided, but anything was better than the film reel of rejection playing in my head at that moment. I started with the basic salutations and pleasantries only to not have my attempts reciprocated. I tried to talk about myself for a while, but all the conversations were too one-sided for my taste. It was at that point that I was wondering whether she even possessed the cognitive ability to comprehend her surroundings. Did she even realize I was there? Did she realize she was in a tent? Did she realize there were exactly 42 other tents like this one? I decided that the time for diplomacy was over. I had to employ schoolyard tactics. Like a child being ignored in the playground, I have proceeded to pull her hair. I would like to mention that this was in a playful fashion and not creepy whatsoever. However, Skisco disagreed. While in the midst of pulling her hair, I saw her grimace change from her usual neutral staring to the distance to absolute shock. Though I failed at wooing her, I did succeed in letting her know I exist. In fact, she was so aware of my existence that she was able to quite accurately punch me straight in the jaw. I fell on the floor from the impact of her left hook. It was no weak punch. I had the impression she probably took some boxing lessons because it felt like someone who had some training. And you can take it from me, I've been punched many times throughout my life. You can tell. I looked up and saw she was looking at me unapologetically. She actually still had her fist up in the air waiting to hit me again should I make a false move. I raised my hands pleading not to be hit again and backed away slowly. Well, it's nice to meet you too. She stared at me for a little bit and angrily asked, What do you want? I was at a loss for words and mumbled for a few seconds before I could string a sentence together. I wanted to talk? I said timidly. T -t talk? She stuttered. I am Tedium, and I hear you are Skisco. It's nice to meet you. Thanks? She seemed very confused. Did anyone ever tell you you have the prettiest eyes? I figured, no time like the present. Uh, yes, some people, I guess. She was getting more confused by the second. I kept on talking to her in the same fashion. I would say something about myself and she gave me one or two word answers. To be honest, this was an improvement from talking to anyone else in this compound. She was tense throughout the entire exchange. I think this was more due to her not realizing what my motivation was in all this. She might have thought she was still at NASA and I was just another agent looking to get some information out of her. She did loosen up a bit, but by loosening up I mean that her two word answers turned into three or four. I figured whatever happened to her back at NASA was so traumatic that I should not bring up the subject. I knew all the people here already tried asking her about what happened back there to no success. My approach seemed to work as she was not repeatedly uttering the same four words. There's nothing out there. The conversation went on for a while. Skisco was the one who mostly found out about me. I have found out very little about her, aside from that she did not like having her hair pulled. I wanted to know more about her. What did she like? What did she find interesting? And so on. I really did not care what happened at NASA or what she may have found out. I wanted to get to know her as a person. I was certain the reason she was not speaking was that she felt as though she was still back at NASA being interrogated by Ducks or Maxilla. These people only cared about the truth and not about her. I would say she had a gentle soul, but the bruise around my eye probably indicated otherwise. Suddenly, there was a rustling sound coming from outside. Someone was trying to get into the tent. Skisco tensed up right away, but I made reassuring hand gestures to calm her down. In walked Lennis. She was the person who spent most of the time with Skisco. She cared for her, fed her, and bathed her. Of course, she was also trying to get the exact details out of her. Lennis seemed alarmed. I was not supposed to be in the tent. No one was supposed to go in there unless specifically being instructed to do so. This was a very strict rule, and I was starting to worry. I was already unlikable by most here, and this stunt could have sent me to exile. On the one hand, I would have been relieved because I could finally leave this place. On the other hand, I thought, where the hell am I and how do I find my way back? You're not supposed to be here, Lennis proclaimed. 
I know, but... I was trying to explain myself. What are you doing here? Her voice grew louder and louder. Skisko was starting to panic again. I was trying to calm both Lennis and Skisko down. This was a juggling act I was not prepared for. I was usually pretty good at making people panic, i.e. this exact situation, but not the opposite. I explained how I was merely talking to Skisko about insignificant things, mostly stories about me and where I was from. I urged Lennis to lower her voice as this was not a big deal and I was acting out of sheer boredom. It was not my intent to sabotage this operation. My pleas fell on deaf ears and Lennis called out for Bonham. You stay right there, she pointed at me. Bonham and a few others walked into the tent in a haste. Lennis's scream led them to believe there was grave danger. I was definitely in an uncomfortable position. I was sitting next to Skisko with Lennis yelling and pointing at me. She was really nervous and was speaking very quickly. Bonham did not seem too happy about the situation and I could actually see the anger in his eyes. I looked at Skisko who now looked mortified and backed up into the corner. She was hugging her knees and was studying the room. I felt bad for her especially after all the progress we have made. At that point I felt as though I would not even be able to show them the benefits of my interaction with her. Why are you in here? Bonham shouted. Listen, first of all, we all need to calm down. Look at Skisko, she's mortified. Your screams and howls are not helping her at all. She has been through a lot, I pled to Bonham. We know she's been through a lot, which is why we keep her away from the general population. Now you waltz in here and jeopardize all the progress we made. Bonham responded. Progress? What progress? When I came in here, she wouldn't even say a word, and you told me yesterday you're not getting any information out of her. What progress are you talking about? I was starting to raise my voice. I don't need to tell you anything. Who are you anyways? You know, I regret saving you from NASA. It's bad enough you're essentially a drain on resources, but you can't even follow simple instructions. Bonham spoke louder and moved towards me in a confrontational manner. We kept on exchanging harsh criticisms towards each other. I think at some point I blame him for the Holocaust. Lennis chimed in from time to time reminding me that I was just a stupid kid who knew nothing. She made it a point to remind everyone that she has a psychology background and understood the human mind far better than I. Things were getting heated and their remarks towards me were increasingly condescending. At that point, I knew how they really felt about me. I was a burden, plain and simple. Oblivia was the one they wanted and I was a pest. So, Lennis, you're the expert, I sarcastically said to her. And she in turn sneered at me. Well, Mrs. Expert, were you able to get any other words from Skisko? Aside from, there's nothing out there, I didn't hear much. I gestured toward her and looked at Bonham. I could feel that those words pierced them deeply, much deeper than my previous insults. Bonham and Lennis stood there quietly. You say you care about Skisko's well-being, but it was you who sent her to NASA. It was you who subjected her to this torture. It was you who messed her up the way you did. Who am I? I pointed at myself. Who are you? Why should we listen to you? The whole room went silent. They were at a loss for words. They knew I was right. At least, that was what I gathered. Tedium? A voice was heard. I looked back and it was Kesko who uttered my name. I nodded and she said, Let's not fight. And lay down, hugging her knees. The whole tent was shocked. They had not heard her say anything aside from there's nothing out there since she came to the compound. Everyone looked at her, then looked at me, then at Bonham and Lennis. At this point, both their faces were red with embarrassment. They spent some time berating me for being an incompetent fool and I was able to get her to say more in 37 minutes than they were able to in weeks. Skisko, get some rest. I think we should all take this outside. I instructed everyone and we all left the tent. Everyone outside took a deep breath and had finally calmed down. Bonham was silent, Lennis seemed irritated and the others were singing my praises. They were all shocked I was able to get her to speak, albeit a few simple words. This meant there was still a chance to get more information out of Skisko. As my ego was getting inflated by the people around me, I could see from the corner of my eye Lennis was getting progressively more upset. I was feeling really cocky, so I decided to confront Lennis. Lennis, I hollered. Can you tell me more about all the experience you have in psychology? I used the most condescending tone I could utter. Is that a degree you have in it? I smiled while she was beginning to shake in anger. Perhaps I can teach you a few things. I patted her on the back. She exploded. She tried to get her words out, but from the anger she was not able to string a coherent thought together. The rage was preventing her from saying three words without stuttering. I can see whoever taught you to speak was the same person who taught you human psychology. I was getting really obnoxious. Listen here, you little shit. You got lucky. I studied the human mind for years. Who are you to talk to me like that? She was screaming at the top of her lungs. Listen, Lenny. Can I call you Lenny? The look of discontent on her face was priceless. You're clearly upset. I would be too if I found out my entire career in academia was meaningless. You f She took a deep breath. You're just an idiot who got lucky. A broken clock is correct twice a day. Now you think you're some hotshot? You're still just a drain on our resources. You'll see, Bonham will kick you out. You're fucking useless. Anybody in these 40 tents- 43, I interrupted. What? 
Lennis was taking it back. There are exactly 43 tents here. I decided to show off more of my knowledge. Well, you're just an expert on everything, aren't you? She replied in an over-the-top melodramatic tone. I'm pretty good at counting. I counted 43 tents, 76 generators, 179 people, and one PhD in psychology who has wasted her life. I said and pointed at Lennis. Bottom! She yelled while stomping her feet to the ground and turned to him. What are you gonna do with this condescending moron? She pointed at me. Obviously. Don't know. Bonham responded and mumbled something. He then walked away still mumbling incoherently to himself. Maybe we should all relax. I finally decided to behave like a decent human being. Don't tell me to relax. Lennis still had some fight in her. Why don't you go for a walk out there like Bonham? I'm not going there. Lennis shook her head. Why? Because there's nothing out there. Well, that's the only thing you can get Skisco to say too. I threw my hands in the air and all but Lennis giggled. Fuck you, tedium. Lennis cussed me out and stormed off. The rest of the people seemed to ease off a bit towards me. Perhaps they saw that I was now useful and not just a drain. We kept the conversation going for a few minutes, but then decided to go back to our respective tents, of which there were exactly 43. It was getting late and there was definitely much excitement that day. I was quite harsh on Lennis, but she referred to me in much harsher terms. I could have been the bigger person, but I was tired of being viewed as some incompetent shrew. I was not useless to them. I was able to break through the skisco. Lennis could not acknowledge that I was the one who succeeded here. Instead, she continued to scold me and call me names. I was not sure how Bonham was handling the whole situation. He was pretty quiet after Skisco spoke. Though he was better than Lennis by a mile, I still believed an apology was in order. I walked back to my tent, I looked outwards towards the remaining 42 tents and felt better. I thought this would be where things turned around for the better. I got inside my tent and realized that Oblivio had no idea any of this has happened. He was sound asleep. I almost woke him up just to tell him but decided to do it the next day instead. I had a hard time falling asleep. My heart was still racing and my mind was running wild. I decided to count to help me fall asleep. But instead of sheep, I counted tents. By the time I got to 43, I was sleeping like a baby. Chapter 15. Inertia. I awoke to the sound of rain from outside the tent. Luckily, it was a light rain and did not penetrate through the tent's membrane. I had a quick peek outside and decided to stay in the tent. In the current scenario, getting wet was a terrible outcome. It would have taken me a long time to dry and the whole tent would have a horrible damp smell for days. Oblivio was still asleep. We had no one else in our tent, luckily as we were technically prisoners. It was definitely a plus as most tents had occupancies as high as 6 people. I was anxiously awaiting Oblivio to wake up so I could tell him about last night. In fact, as we have not spoken in a while, it was a great chance to catch up. I assumed most would stay in their tents due to the rain so Oblivio would be trapped in here with me. Oblivio woke up eventually. He looked around the tent and saw me staring at him giddily. I definitely noticed an uncomfortable, confused look on his face. After all, it was pretty awkward waking up to somebody smiling at you energetically. He took a bit of time to be fully alert. He then looked at me and asked, Okay, what's going on? Why are you staring at me? I informed him of last night's events, getting Skisco to talk, the argument with Bonham and Lennis, and the rest. At first he seemed disinterested, but I assumed this was due to his morning grogginess. Once I said Skisco said something aside from there's nothing out there, his eyes lit up. He was paying attention, hanging on my every word. I was boasting my skills and ridiculed Lennis's alleged knowledge of the human mind. When I reached the point of the story where Bonham and Lennis scolded me, Oblivio's reaction changed from excitement to concern. I was not sure why Oblivio's grimace has changed, so I decided to inquire. You seem worried about something, I stated. Well, you just told me the people who are responsible for keeping us safe think you're useless. By extension, I would hope they won't think I'm useless. Oblivio hesitantly responded. So, self-preservation, is that it? I asked in an abrasive tone. What do you mean? Oblivio asked as if he was offended. You're worried your little club won't accept you now that you're associated with me, a bottom feeder. I was throwing a lot of air quotation marks. Well... Oblivio hesitated. You really don't belong here. You share nothing in common with anyone here. You haven't really been contributing much to this organization and mostly walked around moping for the last few weeks. Contributed? You mean to the organization that kidnapped us? Well, I'm sorry I could not be more of a help to the captors who are keeping me here against my will. Should I be conducting my own tortures? Should I help the hangman perhaps tie the nooses? Who knows, he might have carpal tunnel syndrome. I should be more understanding of the nasty nebulous struggle. I was being overly sarcastic. Oblivio looked uncomfortable with the whole discussion and was trying to be tactful with his words. It seemed like he was holding back some of the criticisms he had in mind. After a few minutes of going back and forth, I asked Oblivio to drop his diplomatic rhetoric and simply tell me what was on his mind. He reluctantly agreed. Unbeknownst to me, at least until last night, most of the 179 people here thought I was a nuisance. 
Oblivio explained that in discussions, people would often refer to me in derogatory terms, and some were even calling for my exile. Oblivio, according to him, vouched for me, but his word did not mean much around these parts. He asked Bonham on several occasions to not banish me from this compound. It was a relief to Oblivio that Bonham was on the same page as him. Bonham was not compassionate to my circumstances, he merely thought of the safety of the nasty nebulas. Oblivio explained the reason I was not kicked out, which echoed my previous discussion with Bonham. If I were to hear this yesterday, I would have been shocked. However, my very vocal argument with both Bonham and Lennis had already opened my eyes to the truth. Last night, all the bystanders were nodding in agreement when Lennis and Bonham said their piece. It fortunately changed once they saw that I could get Skisko to talk. However, if I realized the thin ice I was standing on here, I would have probably toned down my obnoxious ramblings. My mood was back to melancholy. My spirits were running high in the morning for the first time in a while, and now I was back down. I began to worry about my safety here. As much as I wanted to leave, I knew my survival depended on these people. I did not know where I was or how can I get back home. I was also worried Bonham would just have me executed to remove any risk of me tipping off NASA about the location of the compound. Oblivion and I sat in silence for a while. I was in my head again writing the carousel of worst case scenarios. I imagined Oblivio was doing the same. I would think he was safe as he fit in their box, but he may have been worried his association to me would jeopardize his safety. I didn't blame him for thinking about his own well-being as opposed to mine. You never really know how you would respond in a similar situation. It is easy to boast your altruistic view on the world while sitting far away from danger. When you are faced at the end of the barrel of a gun, your principles can change very rapidly. Oblivio was my best friend, but I would doubt he would have left the compound in solidarity if I were to be banished. I would have not survived in the wild by myself and adding Oblivio to the mix would have just made it two dead bodies instead of one. I could at least take comfort in the thought that if we were out there in the wild, I would resort to cannibalism first and Oblivio would hesitate. Oblivio and I were sitting in silence and avoiding eye contact. We have had our fights and arguments in the past, but those were usually loud and theatrical. Hurtful things would be said in the moment, but we would understand this was said in the heat of the moment. There would be some sort of apology that followed and we would get back to normal. However, this time it was different. The argument was more of a discussion. It was tame and soft-spoken. The message was still hurtful, but it was said with careful thought and not in the heat of the moment. Though Oblivio indicated several times he was on my side, something told me the opposite was true. Perhaps he would have liked to see me leave this place as long as my well-being was not jeopardized. I had the feeling Oblivio and I have been drifting apart for a while. In fact, if we were not kidnapped that night, we would have not spent as much time together. We met when we were kids, which essentially meant our relationship was based on being in each other's geographic proximity at a young age. We had nothing in common aside from our history together. Oblivio alluded to this by saying I have nothing in common with anyone at this compound, by extension him as well. I figure that's why the atmosphere was so quiet at that time. We both understood that if we survived this, our relationship would never be the same. We would still be in touch, but it would be more in the capacity of Facebook friends sharing random online posts about cat videos, pornography, and hate speech. I realized this new Oblivio was a mystery to me. Who was he? Perhaps I never truly knew the real Oblivio. You never answered my question. I decided to break the silence. Uh, which question is that? Oblivio asked. Why are you so interested in astronomy? I replied. Never thought about it. Oblivio looked away. You see, that's weird to me. You've dedicated so much time to this field, as did the rest here. Yet, you are unaware of the reason why this is interesting to you. I remembered when I asked you this question while stargazing and you seem perplexed, like you've never even thought about it. I know I enjoy it, it is an intelligent pursuit, so I didn't really think past that. It's not hurting me or anyone in any way, so I never thought to play devil's advocate to prove myself wrong. You hurt me, I said. What? Oblivio was confused. First, you've bored me with stargazing, the most boring activity known to man, then you got me kidnapped. Haha, <laughs> Oblivio chuckled. Well, boredom isn't really torture and I could have never predicted this happening. I know, I'm just teasing. But there must be something that pulled you in that direction, like a gravitational energy or a black hole. I'm actually surprised you even know these terms. Oblivio was genuinely shocked. I listen sometimes, I just don't find it interesting. Well, if I think about it, it's kind of like falling in love with someone. You don't really know why it happens, it just does. Do you know what makes you fall in love with someone? Usually if it's a female, she's in my proximity and I have absolutely no chance with her. Also, if she's a short brunette, it doesn't hurt. We both chuckled. I was pretty surprised that Oblivio used that as an explanation. I was privy to thousands of debates between him and Certus where Oblivio would denounce these points of view as irrational or illogical. He was militantly against anything metaphysical, whether it is a deity or a supernatural force. I remember him constantly arguing that everything has an explanation and there's no such thing as a force or a spirit. When Certus would assert that there were things like souls and you love someone who is your soulmate, Oblivio would just laugh it off. 
He would start going into explanations like innate drives to reproduce and that one chose their mate, son soul, based on evolutionary advantages that would make for a stronger offspring. Perhaps Oblivious' time here made him look at the world differently. Generally, I would have pointed out the inconsistency in this argument, but I did not want to spark a fight. I guess I was changing as well. We kept on reminiscing about old times and were enjoying each other's company. It was quite refreshing as we really did not speak in weeks. The carousel of worst case scenarios in my head lay dormant, but that all changed when I heard movement outside the tent. I looked towards the entrance and noticed the vestibule opening. It was Bonham. I noticed through the opening that the rain has died down as well. Bonham greeted us and asked to speak to me in private. Oblivio reluctantly left the tent. I was panicking. I thought this would be the moment he would kick me out into the wilderness. Oblivio looked at me before exiting. I could tell he had the same concern. Bonham sat down next to me. He seemed fatigued. His eyes were bloodshot with dark circles underneath them. It seemed as though he has not slept all night. Perhaps he felt shame that an idiot like me was able to get Skiska to say more in 30 minutes than him and Lennis combined in weeks. On the other hand, he could have also decided to send me to exile and his conscience was weighing heavily on him. I felt that this would be the most important conversation of my life. Whatever Bonham said next literally determined if I lived or died. Bonham cleared his throat and drank some water. He was trying to get a sentence out, but his voice came out as a whisper. It was almost as though he lost his voice yelling. After a few minutes of Bonham recapping last night's events to me, a surprising sentence came out of his lips. Tedium, I believe I should apologize to you. I have underestimated you. He looked to the side and corrected himself. We have all underestimated you, and for that, I am sorry. Are you sorry for calling me a drain on resources? I asked. Bonham seemed embarrassed. That was not my proudest moment. I know I have said some hurtful things yesterday, and for that I apologize too. You have to understand, we have been living like this for years. The closest thing we have to a victory was getting Skisco to NASA, and you see how that ended up. Instead of moving forward, I feel like we are regressing with every day that passes. It does not justify my actions, but I hope you can forgive me. Generally, I would have acted arrogantly in a situation like this. I would have pushed every button I could to get a rise out of Bonham. I would have boasted my skills, obnoxiously, and would have tried to make Bonham feel terrible. However, this time was different. I could see in his eyes he was truly sorry. I also did not want to run the risk of being exiled for acting an ass. I was relieved to hear Bonham say he was sorry, but I was not out of the woods yet. I could still be exiled if Bonham felt bad about calling me names. I knew I had to prove my worth to the nasty nebulas, otherwise it was only a matter of time before they sent me away. Apology accepted, I declared. I would also like to apologize for breaking the rules and for being obnoxious overall last night. That's good. I really hope we can start over here, Bonham quipped. Well, we can wipe the slate clean, or at least as clean as you can in a kidnapper kidnapped dynamic, Bonham chuckled. I know, I know. I really hope you and Oblivio become part of the nasty nebulas. Oblivio is very knowledgeable, and you have proven quite successful with Skisco. You two have also talked to some of the personnel at NASA, so you can assist us there. Do we really have a choice at this point? I asked. I really did not want this to happen. We usually only recruit people who support our cause. But you two are a different story. It was never our intent to act as your captors. Trust me, I'm grateful for getting us out of there. And I understand there's really no other option. I can't speak for Oblivio, but I will help in any way I can. I can't say I was thrilled to be joining these nebulas, who are, apparently, nasty. Though I would much less be inclined to join the black holes. Oblivio and I had no other options. If we could not be useful to them, we would be useless. Being useless in this situation would essentially mean exiled or dead. I was certain Oblivio would want to join as his ideological search for the truth would have likely brought him to these organizations sooner or later. I, on the other hand, wanted to be elsewhere. My only solace was that I could spend some time with Skisco. At least it would save me from countless boring discussions about space. Also, I had grown tired of counting all the things here. There were not that many things to count. Bonham and I continued discussing the conditions of the stay here. If we were to join the nasty nebulas, we would need to contribute. Aside from my work with Skisco, I was to maintain the grounds. This included maintaining a clean compound and ensuring all items were organized. I was essentially a janitor. Bonham indicated this position was perfect for me as I have already taken inventory of several items. He was really trying to show me that the decision was thoroughly thought out, but I knew that was bullshit. He needed things clean and no one wanted to do it. I needed safety and that entailed the 179 people on this compound seeing me work every day. Bonham mentioned that my work with Kisco had to remain confidential. He wanted to get the information first before cascading it to the rest. At this point, only a handful of people were aware of what happened last night. Most of the conditions were reasonable to me, so I accepted. I was not sure about Oblivio or Astroglide1496 was going to be responsible for, but Bonham said he'll speak to him separately. Bonham still looked exhausted with his voice sounding raspy. 
I decided to ask him regarding his condition. He was not a young man. He seemed to have been in his 60s and living in these conditions only expedited his aging. He mentioned he had not slept well last night due to all the commotion. He felt as though his life has been turned upside down. What he has thought is truth turned out to be not. I lived most of my life in academia, which I am going to realize shaped the way I view the world, Bonham said. What do you mean? I was confused. Intelligence is highly valued in our circles, but we only consider one type of intelligence. Anything to do with mathematics, logic, and the rest is deemed to be the only form of intelligence. We believe anything can be solved as long as we apply the scientific method to it. And that's not the case? I was even more confused. I looked at Skisko as a science experiment rather than a human being. I sent Lennis with her vast knowledge and the others with no results. All of a sudden, you come in with your minimal intelligence. Bottom took a second. No offense, of course. Not taken, I said, but it did sting a little bit. You come in and are able to do more in 20 minutes than all of us combined in weeks. I already felt terrible that I ruined Skisko's life and to learn I would not be able to fix it made me feel worse. But I was able to talk to her, isn't that a step in the right direction? Perhaps it is, but it came from you, a person with no experience. What is the point to pursue knowledge tirelessly for years when a layman can outdo you in seconds? Maybe my whole pursuit was a lie. What do I know? Everything I learned in my studies of astronomy is not lining up with the world, and all I once believed to be true is a lie. How will I make sense of this chaotic world if I cannot rely on the scientific method? Bonham hung his head low. This was the first time I was able to speak to the person inside, as opposed to the walking encyclopedia or the army general Bonham portrayed himself to be. In fact, most people here rarely discussed how they really felt. Everyone only talked about astronomy. I understood they were interested, but I was baffled as to why no one discussed other matters. All the 179 people here had families or childhood experiences not relating to the struggle of the cause. Why not talk about that? It dawned on me that maybe I had more in common with these people than I originally thought. Bonham's little speech reminded me of being in my own head, always doubtful and unsure of myself. Were the rest identical to him? Were the rest identical to me? Did they just cling to astronomy or science as a way to make sense of the world? Did this pursuit provide them with some sort of existential comfort? All these questions in my head made me wonder whether or not Bonham knew his motivation behind his love of space. Oblivia was not aware and compared to being in love, but was Bonham the same? I decided to inquire. Bonham, why are you so interested in astronomy? What? Bonham looked at me confused. Why not anything else like geology, cars, women? Why astronomy specifically? I asked. Uh, you know, I actually thought about this before. And? I decided to chime in as Bonham took a long pause. I could not find a reason why this brings me so much joy over anything else. So? I was completely baffled. Why do you still dedicate time to studying it? You have no understanding of why you are so attached to this whole thing, yet you are willing to risk your life in pursuit of this knowledge. I understand that this does not strictly make sense. However, if I had to boil it down to one reason, I would say inertia. Inertia? At this point, I had no idea what Bonham was talking about. You mean like an object that moves keeps moving? That's what most people think inertia is about. In reality, inertia really deals with any object and its resistance to change. I started my studies at a young age, then went on to post-secondary education, got my master's degree, my doctorate and the rest. By the time I pondered my motivation behind the whole pursuit, I was in my late 40s. At that point, I did not wish to change the course of my trajectory and kept on moving in the same direction. There was a certain comfort knowing I have already put so many hours in this pursuit, and there was much discomfort in the idea of abandoning this pursuit. If I was to start over in my 40s, I would have felt as though I wasted my youth pursuing something that I will never use. This is why I haven't slept. I was already growing more and more weary of my past decisions. And as more inconsistencies are coming to light and uneducated folks outperform their educated counterparts, I'm beginning to lose steam. That is why I believe it is all inertia. Because the only way the inert object changes its course is by an outside force. Bonham finished expressing his point and took a deep breath. I could tell he was tired and beaten down. He then looked at me, smiled and chuckled. He then asked me to call in Oblivio so he can discuss matters with him. I left the tent and saw Oblivio just outside. He was pacing back and forth. I could tell he was panicking the whole time and I gestured for him to go inside the tent. I let him know there was nothing to worry about and Bonham would provide him with some responsibilities. Oblivio let out a sigh of relief and went inside the tent. I stood out there and gazed at the trees. I was trying to make sense of it all. I always felt unsure about myself. I felt that nothing interested me for longer than a few minutes. I would look at others like Oblivio and think that they had it all figured out. They knew what they liked and what made them happy. After my discussions with Oblivio and Bonham, it did not seem to be the case. 
Both of them seemed just as unsure of themselves as I. The only difference was that they were able to hide it better. Oblivio had no clue why he liked astronomy so much, and why it brought him so much joy. Bonham could not think of anything either, aside from the fact that he wanted to maintain the status quo. I could tell that both felt a certain comfort being part of something that was bigger than them and something that made sense of the world around them. This brought them great joy, which I assumed at least up until that point to be confidence in their life choices. This confidence, however, was heavily reliant on their intellectual pursuit of the cosmos. I could tell by Bonham's near mental breakdown that as soon as doubt entered his head, it nearly destroyed everything. Perhaps it was all inertia. Certus and Oblivio used to argue for hours on end, both confident in their views. What would have Certus said if I was to ask him the same question? Would he have a reason to give me, or would he simply say that's how things were and always done? As I thought about it more and more, it seems that many people work based off inertia. Most people are very resistant to change past a certain age. This could be the case of the devil you know, but is it something deeper than that? Is this resistance to change based on mere complacency to the status quo, or is the resistance attributable to the fear of the unknown? Bonham was fearful of the unknown, starting over, feelings of times wasted, uncertainty in the world. Oblivio was more complacent to the status quo as he was happy in his pursuit. The difference between the two was only time. Time contributed to the pursuit. Oblivio has not thought about his motivation, but he is still young. Bonham only began searching for the answer in his 40s. At that point, he already contributed significant time and energy to this pursuit and felt it would be a sunk cost to do anything else. What about Oblivio? He could have still pivoted and chose a new passion. All he needed was an outside force to nudge him in the right direction. I feel it was a good thing that I asked Oblivio that question. Perhaps he would find the answer or decide to change his ways. I saw the misery in Bonham's eyes, but he was in too deep to stop now. As I thought about Bonham's service and Oblivio, I realized it has been quite some time since I left the tent. The rain began to drizzle again, so I decided to go into the tent to see what's going on. As I entered the tent, Oblivio and Bonham were chatting. About space, as always. They welcomed me in and told me to have a seat. So, everything good? I asked. Yes, Bonham gave me the rundown, Oblivio answered. I'll be helping out with the research projects they have going on. What will you be doing? Janitorial duties, I answered. There was a small pause. A very valuable job that contributes to all, Bonham decided to chime in. Well, the way I see it, I got to help out here. Who knows, I might like cleaning up after people. I mean, I tried everything else. This might actually interest me, I said and shrugged my shoulders. Haha. <laughs> Tedium, always changing his interest and always sarcastic about it. Oblivio cheekily nudged me. Well, I looked at Bonham. I guess you can call it inertia. Chapter 16. Tedium's Tedious Tasks My janitorial duties kept me busy for most of the day. In fact, my counting skills came in great use as I kept inventory of all the necessities. I can't say it was the best job in the world, but it was certainly an improvement over being lonely all the time. The time passed much quicker and the rest of the nebulas were a lot nicer to me. I would get the usual morning greetings and some pleasantries. I felt that though at that point they saw my worth to their organization. Lennis was still upset as I took her spot over trying to get Skisco to communicate. I wasn't sure whether this was due to the fact that an idiot like me can do better than her or she felt that I was just generally an obnoxious idiot. Either way, I knew where I stood with her. Oblivio seemed to have also been steadily progressing in his research with Bonham. I wish I could tell you more about it, however, all they were telling me, though likely groundbreaking, sounded like absolute gibberish. From what my layman mind could interpret was that these inconsistencies were growing day by day. It was no longer a few fibs, but it seemed as though all that was taught about the stars was complete malarkey. Oblivio would often joke and say that aside from the existence of the sun and the moon, the textbooks were filled with fairy tales. Oblivio seemed to really be motivated and was always willing to share his day's findings. Luckily, he shared those with others and not me. Skisco was improving as well. After a few weeks with me, she was able to string together a few sentences. Granted, these were very simple, but at that point, anything was better than there's nothing out there. We usually spent the evenings together as I was busy with my tasks during the day. We only spent time in her tent as Bonham did not allow her to go anywhere else. We had a little routine going. I would bring her dinner and would talk to her. We were almost like a boring old couple in their 50s. I would come home after a long day of work and she would be waiting for me to talk about my day. Also, there was no sex whatsoever. Though she wasn't short or brunette, I was very attracted to her. I definitely had no chance of getting with her, so she hit one of my usual three criteria for romantic interests. I would try to flirt occasionally, but she would just stare at me as though she did not understand what was going on. I think I was able to make her giggle one time, which I thought was a huge accomplishment. However, when I told this to Bonham, he disagreed. He completely lost his temper and told me that my duties with her were not to be personal. 
I was only to obtain as much information as possible from her about NASA. Bonham was a true romantic. Alas, Bonham was not privy to my meetings with Kesko, so I continued to try and develop a personal relation with her. After all, it was my personal touch that got her to speak in the first place. I would have to admit that these times at the compound were rather enjoyable. I felt a sense of belonging and was generally happy. However, there was no discussion on our next steps as an organization. What were we going to do next? What was the angle? Bonham and the others were more interested in spending their days researching more inconsistencies rather than coming up with a strategy. I was hoping it was not the intent of the nebulas to stay at the compound forever. Gathering evidence played a vital role, but if no other action followed, all of this would have been for nothing. I decided to ask Bonham, yet again, what was the overall plan for the nebulas? Were we going to attack NASA again? Would we publish our findings to the public? Would we just sit and do nothing? I walked over to Bonham's tent. As I approached, I heard two voices arguing from within the tent. It was difficult to make out the exact message that was being communicated, but it sounded like a very heated debate. I hid behind the tent as to not be seen. I figured I should wait until the screaming fest calmed down before trying to discuss matters with Bonham. After a few minutes of waiting, I heard the vestibule fly open. I looked at the front of the tent and saw Lennis exit in anger. She was marching away and then turned around and pointed to the tent and says, You've lost your way. You're just an old man who thinks he knows it all. I would have had all this figured out by now. You literally got a janitor doing psychiatric work. I cannot believe it. She then flung her arms in the air and walked away. Bonham proceeded to exit the tent. He did not respond, but he did have a look around. A few of the members had seen what had happened and were in shock. Bonham then looked at them and explained that everything is under control and there is no need to worry. He did not notice me as I was hidden from his view. I realized this was one of likely many discussions Lennis had with Bonham about me. She was probably questioning his leadership skills and decisions as he put me in charge of taking care of Skisco. I wasn't at all surprised this was the case. This interaction only confirmed what I already knew. Lennis never tried to hide her displeasure with me. She would always make comments to others about how incompetent I was, and how she would have had Skisco back to normal by now. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but the facts are the facts. She had Skisco for weeks, and all that was said was, there's nothing out there. Then, I rolled in and Skisco was able to communicate with some basic ideas. I couldn't get her to discuss what happened at NASA, but at least she comprehended the situation. This was a great improvement over sitting on the bed, hugging her knees and staring at the tent's wall. This was probably not the best time to approach Bonham, but I decided to do so anyways. I figured he was already being questions about his decisions, why not keep the theme of the day going? I hesitantly entered the tent to see Bonham sitting on his bed. He looked distraught. He almost reminded me of Skisco. I asked him how he was doing and what has happened. I already knew what the argument was about, but I decided to ease into my queries. Lennis is mad about a few things. She is disagreeing with the way I'm running this organization, Bonham said in an almost defeated tone. Disagreeing that I am the one responsible for Skisco? I asked. Among other things, yes. He seemed almost lifeless. Other things? I thought you saw eye to eye on everything else. I was confused. This is not something we discuss with all the people here, but I might as well tell you. Bonham went on to explain that since the attack on NASA's headquarters, the organization went dark. They cut all communications to the outside world to avoid NASA tracking a signal and annihilating the compound. This meant no internet, no phone, and not even a courier pigeon was to leave the compound in fear of disclosing our location. Lennis has been adamant that enough time has passed and that the nebulas should start communicating with the outside world. Their research should be shared with others, and other similar groups could join and bring down NASA. This was exactly the type of information I needed to know. I was surprised we had a way to connect with the outside world. In my previous conversation with Bonham, he said that there is no way we could do that. I should have figured they could obtain an internet connection as they mentioned Oblivious post that night that we were kidnapped. Bonham seemed reluctant to connect to the web. He was worried about the potential ramifications of his actions. I was of the opinion we should go online at least to see if the Nebula's actions were mentioned in the media. However, I was second guessing myself as this is the first time Lennis and I have seen eye to eye. I knew I could not push the point of creating a connection with the outside world, but I had to question our next steps. The way I saw it, we were sitting ducks. I decided to ask Bonham, what are our plans? Bonham seemed confused. He looked at me and asked, our plans? You and me? Bonham was really out of it after the argument with Lennis, so I had to spell it out for him. What are the plans for the nebulas? We can't just sit here for months on end, I explained. Uh, I wish I had an answer, but without information, what are we to do? We already lost enough lives retrieving Skisco, and I do not want to risk any more. Especially when the whole Skisco operation was a complete disaster and yielded no results. Bonham explained in a weak, raspy voice. It wasn't a complete flop. I'm making headway with Skisco. Romantically, perhaps. Bonham sarcastically interrupted. What is that supposed to mean? 
I was taken aback. I see you with her, you're like a couple of smitten teenagers. That must be nice for you to find a companion in these times, but it does not help the mission whatsoever. You have not been able to obtain one useful piece of information that could help our struggle. These things take time. I definitely got further than Lennis, your so-called professional. Comparing yourself to somebody with lesser intellect does not make you brighter. Bonham's condescending tone said it all. When those words filled my ears, I was livid. I could see why Lennis had a fit of rage when leaving the tent. I'm certain he was as condescending with her as he was with me. I was under the impression his opinion of me changed since I started helping out with Skisco, but it turned out I was wrong. It seemed as though the first impression he had of me stuck, and there was no changing his mind. I was beginning to see Lennis's point of view. He was just an old man who thought he knows everything. I knew something was wrong when Lennis and I were seeing eye to eye, and this has happened twice in the last 30 minutes. I could have played this two ways. Taking the higher road, or be just as condescending. I have never been one to take the higher road, but I wasn't going to go out guns blazing like Lennis. Bonham would not respond to this type of reaction, as he would deem it too emotional and not based in intellect. I knew I had to formulate the most passive-aggressive response I could think of. I really wanted to get under his skin. He was already feeling down, so I thought this was going to be easy. There is something to be said for not kicking a man while he's down, but Bonham's words warranted my wrath. If it was up to me, we would try to reach out to the outside world. If it were up to me, Skisco would be singing like a bird. Alas, it is not up to me, it is up to you. And as you mentioned, comparing myself to those of lesser intellect does not make me brighter. I finished my piece, let up a humph, turned my head and walked away. I wasn't sure how Bono would react, but I found out very quickly. I was maybe one foot out the tent when he rushed out and grabbed me by the shirt. I thought he was a weak old man, I was proven otherwise. He continued to berate me in front of everyone while list waving his finger. His face was red and all the veins on his forehead were popping off. His words echoed his previous criticisms of me. I was a drain, I was useless, I knew nothing, and so on. Quite an audience was gathering around to witness my scolding. I knew I had to remain calm. If I started yelling, people would assume I was the one who was wrong. The chastising continued for several minutes until Bonham ran out of breath. He wanted to continue his speech but was gasping for air. I stood there quietly with my calm demeanor for a few moments. I then inhaled audibly and said calmly, Bonham, I think we should continue this conversation when you have calmed down. You are not thinking rationally at the moment. I understand your point of view, but I was merely stating that we should make some contact with the outside world. Bonham's jaw fell to his knees. I was certain he was not expecting that for me. The audience stood around in awe and started murmuring amongst each other. While Bonham was lost for words, I turned around and walked away. Though I seemed calm on the outside to maintain appearances, I was actually quite anxious. I was on thin ice before and have only gotten away with it because of my success with Skisco. Bonham was now unhappy with my results, which could have easily led me to exile. I knew it was a dangerous move and the stakes of the bet were high. For that reason, I needed Bonham to look like the crazy one and not me. Sometimes, the court of public opinion is much more powerful than the truth. I was hoping the others were fed up as well with his inertia policy and see me as the voice of reason and Bonham as the crazy old man. I was beginning to sound a lot more like Lennis. I decided to lay low for the rest of the day. I knew there would be some blowback from this interaction and figured it was better to remain sight unseen. It was still early in the day, so this proved to be quite a difficult task. Cursed sunlight! I still had to complete my duties, which always involved being around other nebulas. I tried my best to avoid detection until nightfall, when I could go see Skisco and hide in her tent. Despite my best efforts, several nebulas have spotted me. Some would just say their greetings and walk away. I would presume those would be the ones who were ignorant to my recent actions. Some would look in my direction with a scowled grimace. I presumed those were the ones who were aware of my recent actions. I also presume those were the ones who did not approve of said actions. However, some looked in my direction with expressions of acclaim. Some even came up to claim their acclaim. I was trying to be invisible, yet it seemed all eyes were on me. I was happy that there were others who agreed with my point of view. There was one interaction that I could never see coming, and that was Lennis. The only interactions we had up until that point were screaming matches about the age-old debate, is TDM an idiot? Lennis was pro, I was con, naturally. I saw her walking up and did not know what to expect. Is she coming to scold me? Is she coming to claim her acclaim? Either way, I knew this was going to be an interesting conversation. Tedium, she said sternly and I looked up at her. She did not hesitate and continued. I'm not gonna go through the whole I don't like you and you don't like me routine as we both don't have the time for that. I do. I very much dislike you. I decided to chime in. Fucking hate you too. Lennis was quick to retort. As toxic as this interaction may seem, we actually both chuckled. I take it you heard what happened. I asked. Why else would I be here? She responded. I don't know. I shrugged. Ask me out on a date? 
I am aware I sound like a complete jackass to my potential ally. Let's cut the shit. Bonham is not fit to run this organization. You know it, I know it, everyone knows it. The problem is, no one wants to do anything about it, except us. You really impressed me today, and I'm willing to put aside our differences. We both know we're just sitting ducks here, and it is imperative to mobilize and contact the outside world. My attitude changed after she finished saying her piece. She was absolutely right. I agreed with her and told her that we should formulate some sort of plan. I was taking things much more seriously. She went on explaining that before my little passive-aggressive speech to Bonham, many nebulas were not aware that we could make contact with the outside world. Bonham was always saying it was not possible, and everyone believed him. It was only a select few, like Lennis, that were aware of this possibility. Bonham told her, and the rest who knew, to not share this information with anyone. He believed this would start a divide in the group, which we could not afford at the moment. When I blurted that information out, the nebulas who heard it were shocked. The news quickly spread, and most members were furious that this was kept from them. Many of them were even more upset that I was given the information before them. I was still seen as the lowest on the totem pole, and longtime members considered that a slap in the face. Lennis wanted to take over Bonham's position and was willing to do anything to achieve this, including joining forces with me. Prior to today's events, there have been some rumblings among the nebulas. Several members have expressed their disapproval of Bonham's decisions, and, after his little outburst, the list was growing. Lennis needed more members on her side. What do you need from me then? I interrupted Lennis amidst her explanation. We need you to convince Oblivio. For some reason, he has a lot of members backing him up. More incompetence from the old man. I have been with him for years, and Oblivio waltzes in and gets more respect. I swear, I had given... Lennis was starting a long rant, so I decided to interrupt. That's all? Convince Oblivio? I jumped in. Yes, everybody loves Astroglide1496. His opinion carries a lot of weight, Lennis explained. If I can get the majority of the 180 people here... 179, I interrupted. What? Lennis was taken aback. There are exactly 179 people here. Trust me, I counted. Multiple times. Well, can I count on you talking to Oblivio? I was not sure how to respond at that moment. Oblivio was clearly on Team Bonham and I just wanted to get the hell out of here. My initial thought was not to trust Lennis as her motive was clearly self-serving. She did not seem to be motivated by the best interests of the group. Rather, she wanted to be in power. Though I did agree with her about the direction we should be heading, I was weary of her opportunistic power play. Oblivio has been my lifelong friend, and I knew his motives were pure. He believed in what the Nebulas were doing and had never been one to put his own interests in front of others. I was torn. I had no idea what to do. I told Lennis that I will talk to Oblivio, and we parted ways. I had to go meet Skisco anyway for our daily sessions. I figured Oblivio and I could have that discussion afterwards. Lennis probably thought I would convince Oblivio to join forces, but I had a different idea in mind. I was going to tell Oblivio everything Lennis told me and gauge his reaction. Oblivio was on Bonham's good side and, as of this morning, I was not. My main motivation was for Oblivio to stay by my side should Bonham make a rash decision regarding me staying. I had to guarantee my safety. I was acting in self-interest. This was concerning as this was just another thing Lennis and I had in common. As I was walking over to Skisco's tent, my mind was rattling. It was as though that tired trope of the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other was following me. I was hearing Lennis's voice in one ear and Oblivio's voice in the other. Movies and TV show generally show a clear-cut, easy-to-follow moral code where the actions prompted by the devil and the angels are clear. The audience follows along blissfully as it is always better to tell the truth like the altruistic angel and it is always bad to lie like the dreadful devil. In reality, there is a lot more moral ambiguity in the world. One must consider that the answers are not so easily seen and the lines aren't clear-cut. Who was right? Who was wrong? Was there a compromise? There were thousands of possible options we could have pursued as the nebulas. We could have stayed put with our radio silence. We could have contacted the outside world. We could have attacked NASA and everything in between. What was the right decision? Generally, my indecisiveness prior to this was only a matter that concerned me. However, this was much different as it concerned all 179 nebulas. I was hardly ready to make decisions impacting myself, let alone others. I realized then that whatever choice I made, no matter how selfish or altruistic, some would still view me as the devil, and the others as the angel. I was so entrenched in my thoughts that I did not realize I passed Skisco's tent a while back. Since I started my duties, I have not been trapped in my head. It was refreshingly nostalgic to be back in this prison, but it was also terrifying. I knew I had to make a decision, and this time changing my mind would not be as easy. I headed back to Skisco's tent with a lot to think about.
Chapter 17 Quantum Leap I walked inside Skisko's tent. My mind was still heavy with doubt. Skisko greeted me with a smile which was a rare occurrence. She generally stared blankly into the tent's walls, and it was up to me to improve her mood. This was not part of the job description, but it certainly helped with both me and her. Her smile was so beautiful that for a brief moment I forgot what has happened today. I sat down next to her and smiled back. I was debating whether or not I should tell her about today's events. I always did my best job sugarcoating the events of the day as I did not know whether she could handle the bad news in her state. I would keep things positive and light to avoid another mental breakdown where she yells, There's nothing out there! Perhaps it was my selfish decision to shelter her from the truth. I was definitely smitten and wanted to keep this going, whatever this was. Bono was growing weary of my efforts and I was afraid that a slight move in the wrong direction would cease these meetings. Given today's events, I was certain retribution from Bonham was imminent. I would either be exiled from the Nebulas or Skisko's tent. My membership status with the Nebulas was the least of my worries. My proximity to Skisko, on the other hand, was a much greater concern. It was a lose-lose situation either way I looked at it. Whether Bonham decided to send me to exile or revoke my visitation privileges, I was not going to see Skisko ever again. She was the only part of this whole ordeal that made existence bearable. I had to count many things, but I only enjoyed counting down the minutes to see her again. Our interactions were limited, but they were the only thing that gave me hope. I was not sure whether Skisko felt the same way, or anything really after leaving NASA, but I enjoyed the brief make-believe romantic scenario I've created in my head. I figured at this point I might as well spill the metaphorical beans and let her know what was happening. After all, this could have been the last time I would see her, and I'd rather she heard about what happened for me. I looked at her and noticed she was still smiling, which was a good sign. I also realized that I have just been sitting quietly for a few minutes and decided it was probably time to say something. You're awfully quiet today. Skisko broke the silence first. Well, I chuckled. It has been an eventful day. Eventful? All your days are eventful, Tedium. You always come entertain me with your shenanigans. Skisko chimed in. Today's events were far less entertaining and far more exhausting. I responded. What's going on? Skisko asked. Bonham and I are not seeing eye to eye. To be honest, we have not been seeing eye to eye for a while now, I said while avoiding eye contact. About me? Her look of concern worried me quite a bit. I was worried this would send her spinning out of control. I knew I had to maneuver my answer carefully. She was not at fault here whatsoever, it was Bonham and his incompetence that were the problem. He was a bitter, weak old man that was no longer fit for leadership. I started sounding more and more like Lennis. Skisko in no way should have felt amiss about her presence here or the disagreement between Bonham and me. I explained the situation to her. She was aware I was only selected as a replacement for Lennis because of the night I snuck into her tent, not meant as sexual innuendo. She was not aware that Bonham never truly accepted me as a viable member of this organization. I added that Bonham was very displeased with this arrangement and he would always condemn any personal feelings getting in the way. He would scold me for making her laugh and wanted me to press her for more intel. I then described to her the events that went on in the morning starting with Bonham screaming his lungs out at me and ending with Lennis trying to stage a coup. I was rambling on and on and realized Kisko has not said a word. I was avoiding eye contact the whole time and decided to look her way. She sat there patiently, still with a concerned look on her face, and nodded her head. This was no surprise to me as I was the one usually doing all the talking and I was now quiet. I don't know what was the real motivation telling Skisko all this. I knew that she was in no state to help me with my issues. She had plenty of her own. I was looking for advice or a comforting voice, perhaps I was merely looking to get things off my chest. It did feel pretty good saying my piece, but the concerned look on Skisko's face quickly changed my mood. I did not want her to worry. I did not want this time to be filled with melancholy. I wanted it to be a cheerful experience overall. So do you think we won't see each other again? Skisko was once more the first to break the silence. I really hope not, I quivered. I really enjoyed spending this time with you. Me too, I always look forward to our sessions. Skisko said and smiled. I do too. It's the only thing I enjoy doing here. I like our little talks or my big talks and your little talks. You're making me blush. I'm being serious. I really hope we would have met in another scenario. One where we were not held captive against our will. I think we could have really hit it off. Aren't we hitting it off now? Skisko was confused. Well, uh, I mumbled. Are you seeing anybody else here? Do you have a girl in each one of the 43 tents? She sternly asked me then cracked a smile. I'm kidding. I was ecstatic and relieved when I heard her say those words. For once in my life, the make-believe romantic scenario that I created in my head actually manifested itself in real life. It was unfortunate that I had to be kidnapped and join a quasi-terrorist organization for this to happen. But are any love stories ever ideal? I figured this would be a funny story to tell our children if we ever survived this mess and procreated. I had no idea where this relationship would go, but I knew wherever it may be, I will enjoy the ride.
We kept on talking for some time. The conversation was actually flowing in both directions. Skisko told me stories about her life and I told her things about me. From an outside view, this just seemed as a date that was going really well rather than what Bonham wanted to happen. I did not care what Skisko saw at NASA nor did I want to find out. If this thing was so horrific that it led her to have a mental breakdown, it was probably better not to think about it ever again. I'm sure mental health professionals would disagree, but my plan seemed to work better. Our conversation was moving along nicely until Skisko decided to remind me of today's events. What are you going to do about your conundrum, Tedium? I did not have much to say as I was implementing my aforementioned ignorance is bliss strategy. I'm not sure. I hesitated in my response. You should talk to Oblivio. Skisko pressed on. I definitely will. The only question is whether I should convince him to side with Lennis or not. Do you want to join Lennis? Do you think she's right? I don't know. It's not a simple decision. I'm also not the smartest person. Not even close. This type of decision should not be placed in my hands. I'll let you know a little secret. During my career as an investigative journalist, I had been privy to many influential people. Politicians, community leaders, and CEOs. One thing I figured after a while is that none of them are equipped to make the decisions they make. Sure, they seem confident and likely believe that what they're doing is correct, but they are just as smart as you, which is not that much, Skisko said and giggled. They are better equipped because they at least they believe that they are right in their actions. What is right? What? What is right and what is wrong? Those are vague terms that differ from person to person. Bonham thinks we should stay put. Lennis does not. Bonham thinks he's right and Lennis is wrong. Lennis thinks she's right and Bonham is wrong. Ask anyone here and they will have 179 different opinions about right and wrong. So what do I do? You do what you think is right, naturally. It doesn't have to be what Lennis or Bonham or Oblivio say. You know why I like you? Skisko said and grabbed my hand. Why? I looked into her beautiful eyes. You came to see me that night even though it was wrong. Do you think Bonham, Lennis, Oblivio, or anyone else thought that was the right idea? If you were to ask them, they would have told you not to come in here. But look at us now. I was finally able to take my mind off what happened. Skisko suddenly paused. I looked at her and she sat motionless, staring at the floor. Her lower lip started to quiver. I asked her if she was fine, but she did not answer. She continued to stare at the floor. I was getting worried that she might go into another mental breakdown. I saw her lips slowly beginning to mouth the words, nothing out there. This was code red for me. I wanted to avoid this at all costs. I did not want Skisko to revert back to her broken state. I knew Bonham could also show up at any moment. If he were to see this, I would definitely be out of the nebulas. It was a risky decision, but I decided to take Skisko out of her tent. I kept repeating it's okay to Skisko and told her to come with me. I told her she should see the view of the sunset, though the sun was long gone. I gently hugged her shoulder and tried to move her along. Lucky for me, she was cooperating and not resisting and screaming. She was whispering, There's nothing out there and her whispers were getting louder. My heart was racing, and I kept going according to my plan. I looked out the vestibule, the right side was clear, the left side was clear. I decided to head out and started walking away from the tents. What do you think you're doing? Bonham's words filled my ears. This was just what I was afraid of. I turned around and saw him running towards me. Behind him I saw Oblivio looking confused. He was gesturing me trying to understand what I was doing. Bonham's yell got the attention of other nebulas who were also fast approaching. Fuck. I made the wrong decision. I should have stayed in the tent. I froze with my arm around Skisko, who was now repeating her chant louder. There's nothing out there! There's nothing out there! She was shaking and still staring at the ground. Bonham got up to my face and continued yelling. Who told you you can leave the tent? It's not enough you're belittling my decisions and acting like an absolute ass. Now you're hindering our operation? I should have let those NASA guys kill you when they had the chance. Skisko was our only chance. Look at her. She's terrified and mumbling like a crazy person. She's probably scared because of all the commotion you're causing. I decided to stand my ground. What the? Bono was getting flustered. You're a piece of work. And you're a piece of shit, I replied. Oh, you're so clever. You know everything. You know what's best for all here. Bono was swinging his arms frantically. You're one to talk. A voice was heard from the back of the crowd that formed. Who said that? Bonham looked back. To my disbelief and Bonham's, the majority of the nebulas were standing behind us watching our fight. I could not see who uttered the words, but I heard them continue. What's best for all? Bonham, you don't know what's best for all. You have been hiding information for us, making decisions without consulting anyone. We all thought we did not have the ability to communicate with the outside world. At least Tedium was able to tell us that. You're so scared for Skisko's well-being, yet you're the one who put her in danger. You couldn't get anything out of her. At least Tedium got her to some level of normalcy. The berating of Bonham continued. Bonham's mouth fell to the ground. He was in shock that someone questioned his authority. 
He was more shocked when the other nebulas were nodding their head in agreement with that unseen voice. When the speech was done, the nebulas all chanted in agreement. Other Nebula members started expressing their distaste for Bonham as a leader, only to be interrupted by other members sharing their own criticisms. Bonham looked like he just saw a ghost. He really was not expecting this type of reaction. The only person who remained quiet throughout the whole ordeal was Oblivio, who seemed just as confused. I knew I had to act quickly while the attention was off me and Skisco. She was still erratic and the screams and loud noises were not helping her state. I turned back and started walking away from the group. As her step progressed forward, the sounds of the group dampened. Skisco was still mumbling and I was guiding her along the way. I kept walking towards a certain spot I used to enjoy when I was still counting tents daily. The view from there was incredible and I wanted to show it to Skisco to take her mind off things. Unfortunately, it was too dark to see anything at that point. We finally reached our destination. Skisco was back to her whispers. I set her down on the ground against a tree trunk. I reassured her everything will be fine and told her to take deep breaths. I sat next to her and put my arm over her shoulder to comfort her. Her breathing started to stabilize eventually and the whispers stopped. She leaned her head against my shoulder and sat quietly for some time. It was now pitch black and quiet. The only sounds that were heard were crickets which were oddly relaxing. Skisco's breathing became slower and slower. She was beginning to fall asleep. This made me feel good as it meant she had calmed down. She curled up next to me and I sat with my back against the tree trunk, wide awake. My adrenaline was still at full speed. My heart was racing and my mind was running wild. I could not bring myself to relax after everything that has happened today. I was definitely relieved that most of the nebulas were not on Bonham's side. This was a big plus for me. This was no indication they were on my side, but at least I knew that the rest of the nebulas would not follow Bonham blindly as they had before. There was no turning back now. Bonham was likely going to be usurped. Lennis was a natural one to replace him, so I knew I would have to be on her good side now. She did approach me for an alliance earlier, so I felt I was in good standings with her. Knowing all of that should have comforted me, but I was still not at ease. I was worried how Oblivio felt about all this. I knew we were already drifting apart, and I hoped this alliance to Bonham would not jeopardize his status with the Nebulas. Even worse, I hope it did not jeopardize my status with him. We have been lifelong friends, and I wanted it to remain that way. We have never seen eye to eye on anything, but it was a wonderful friendship. After something as traumatic as we experienced, I thought that our bond will be stronger. However, it seemed like it was going the opposite way. If we were to survive this whole ordeal, we would likely never see each other again. That was the really terrifying thought that kept me up. I knew I had to talk to Oblivio about this whole ordeal, among other things. There was no sense staying up worrying about it, so I decided to try to get some sleep. Skisco was already asleep and leaning on me. The blood circulation in my arm was not existent at that point, so I had to shift her down a little. I lay back against the tree trunk and shut my eyes. I figured I'd talk to Oblivio tomorrow when tensions were not as high. Between Skisco freaking out and the unruly mob formerly known as the Nebulas, there was no place for calm conversation. I passed out shortly after. I awoke from my terrible sleep. Who knew sleeping upright in nature would not be comfortable? Skisco was still asleep. At that point I realized I never knew how much she slept or did not sleep. I would always leave before she was tired and come back later in the day after she slept. Did her trauma keep her up at night? Given how she was sleeping at that time, I would say absolutely not. She was out like a light, sleeping like a log, or whatever other idiom you want to use in this scenario. Out here in the wilderness and without shelter, it was no small feat. The sun was just beginning to rise. I always wanted to bring Skisco here for the sunset, but I had to settle for the sunrise. Skisco slept through the sunrise, but I enjoyed the view. I figured at that point I might as well wake her up. The reason for that was twofold. I was bored for one, and she might have been in a coma as I've never seen anyone sleep that deep. I gently woke her up by rubbing her shoulder. She opened her eyes and jolted for a brief moment as if she was frightened. She then opened her eyes fully and saw me. She calmed and curled back next to me. Her eyes were half open and her breathing increased in speed. She was slowly beginning to wake up. I wondered if she remembered anything from last night. She was freaking out pretty bad. I knew I had to bring it up, but I did not want to set her off again. Being isolated from the rest helped. I rubbed her hair gently and said, Good morning. She looked at me and smiled. Good morning to you too. How was your sleep? I asked. Wonderful. If you haven't woke me up, I would have slept a lot longer. She chuckled. You don't say. I thought you were in a coma there for a moment. I replied and laughed. How was your sleep? She asked. Awful. I'm pretty sure I got splinters in my ass from that very not comfortable tree I slept on. I'm also sure I lost circulation in my legs, but waking up next to you makes it all worthwhile. Really? She giggled and blushed. We went on with a small talk for a bit. I was hesitant bringing up what happened at first. I also enjoyed our little cute exchange. It brought me back to last night before all the craziness went down. We were quite lovey-dovey towards each other, falling head over heels or whatever other idiom you want to use in this scenario. I'm certain from the side it was rather vomit inducing. And if we were in front of a 90s sitcom studio audience, a loud aww sound would fill the air. 
We were having a great time, but I knew I had to stir the conversation back to what happened last night. We did not have the luxury for romance in our current situation. Do you remember what happened last night? I decided to ask. Well, she froze a little bit. Not everything. I remember we were in my tent, and then it's a bit of a blur. There was a lot of screaming and yelling. Last thing I remember is you comforting me and falling asleep. Do you remember what we talked about in the tent? About Bonham and me? I dug a little deeper. I remember your disagreement about how to handle certain things, including me. Yeah, that's what all the screaming and yelling was about. You were quite distraught, so I had to get you away from there. I'm guessing I had one of my panic attacks, Skisko said and tensed up a bit. Uh, Pretty much, we were talking, having a great time. At some point, you mentioned NASA and froze. That, she hesitated for a bit, is what seems to bring on these panic attacks. When I remember what I saw at NASA, the trauma rushes in. I can't control myself. I literally feel like a prisoner in my own head. My body freezes and I can't shake that off. Sounds awful. I hope that us talking about it doesn't set it off. It's weird because I actually can't tell you what happened there. What do you mean? I was puzzled. I have no recollection of what happened before I showed up here. Most of the information that's in my head is from the last few months. Lena said it's called disassociative amnesia. The trauma was so great that my brain blocked everything that happened. All I know is what you, Lennis, and Bonham have been telling me. And last night, you remembered? It had to have been it. It happened a few times with Lennis. I remember the feeling of sheer panic, the same as I experienced yesterday. The next day, when I have come back to my senses, Lennis would say that we were discussing NASA. I was speechless when I heard Skisko's words. I could not believe that the time in that tainted territory turned her totally torpified. It all made sense. I was not discussing NASA with her in our sessions, so she never had an episode like this before. Her mind was able to separate itself from what has happened and focus on the time with me. She didn't remember me from the room in NASA where we were both held captive prior to the Nebula rescue. She only knew me as the person that would come to her tent daily and entertain her. I often thought she did not speak much about herself because I was the one doing most of the talking. Turned out she couldn't reciprocate my childhood stories as she didn't remember hers. We kept on walking in silence. I did not have anything to say. She was probably also feeling aghast from revealing this piece of information to me. I was thinking about everything that has happened. The fact that I only found out about this made me feel as though Bonham was right. I was supposed to help the Nebulas gain information from Skisko to help the cause, but I spent most of the time trying to fulfill some romantic fantasy. I helped Skisko feel better, but have not done much to help these Nebulas. All these thoughts circulated me back to my original conundrum. I was now more confused than ever about what to do. I didn't have the Nebulas' best interest at heart. Up until now, I was only acting selfishly. I wondered, if I didn't like Skisko, if I would have ever gone to her tent that night. I never put much thought to my actions as they only impacted me. I never considered whether I was directed by the proverbial angel on my right shoulder or the devil on the left. I merely floated through life acting on impulse or having decisions made for me. The decisions I did make now all seemed to be selfish in nature. I did not want to go stargazing with Oblivio, but I came because I thought Minima would be there. I did not care about Oblivio heading out towards the wilderness all on his own or the danger it posed. In school, I interrupted Oblivio because I was bored. I didn't care if he was trying to learn. Even when we arrived here, I walked around feeling sorry for myself and never offered to help. And I only really pitched in when I was forced to by Bonham. No wonder the Nebulas despised me. After all was said and done, I felt like a drain on resources again. I was not even able to provide the group something of substance. My only contribution was stirring shit up, rocking the boat, or whatever other idioms you want to use in this scenario. Sure, I had brought some benefits to the group by my actions, but my intentions were never altruistic. The crowd seemed to be praising me last night for my work with Skisko and revealing the secret information to everyone. Were they really pleased with me, or were they simply fed up with Bonham? Would the same crowd still be by my side if they knew I only acted in self-interest? I had to speak with Oblivio. He was the one who could really help me out here. You're quiet again. What's wrong? Skisko broke the silence again. Still thinking about the situation with Bonham, we can't hide forever. At some point, we will need to go back there and face the music, I responded. We do, but we can still delay it a little longer and spend some time together, she said and smiled. That's actually what has been bothering me. I regretted the way I said this the second it came out of my mouth. What? Skisko was shocked. Not in that way, but... I was stuttering for a bit until I regained my composure. I was supposed to help the Nebulas with getting some information from you, but instead I was busy pursuing you romantically. We never talked about NASA or what happened. I just feel I have been acting selfishly in this situation and my entire life in general. I'm worried the decision I make about the Bonham situation would be selfish as well and would not benefit the group. You are not selfish with me, Skisko quickly replied. Well, I was. I wanted to be near you. Treating me like a mental patient is not what's best for me. 
You knew that. You tried to give me my normal life back, as normal as a fugitive life can be. You may have acted in self-interest, but you did so because you knew what the others told you was wrong. It was a sign of relief that at least Kisco did not see my actions as selfish with her. It did put my mind slightly at ease. I apologized to her for being quiet and wasting whatever small time we have together on my problems. I agreed with her suggestion and, for now, the ignorance is bliss strategy was back on. We walked around and kept talking. The views were quite breathtaking. My mind was off my problems for a little bit. Skisco was actually doing most of the talking for a change. She did go a little down memory lane, limited as that lane may be. She was beginning to tell me about how when we first met she thought I was going to attack her. Granted, I pulled her hair, but she definitely gave me a good punch. That wasn't the first time we met, I said. Skisco stopped and looked at me with confusion. We met actually back in NASA as we were both held captive there. She looked down at the ground and was very quiet. I began to worry another panic attack was going to happen. These were the signs. I wasn't sure how to handle it. Should I ask what's wrong or ignore it altogether? I tried to get her attention but she continued to stare at the ground. I knew I had to bring her back to the compound so Lennis could help her out. Yesterday I was able to avoid a complete meltdown by sheer chance and I didn't want to press my luck. It would have been a bad look for me if I had left Skisco at this state and came back with her even worse. But her well-being was more important than my ego. I put my arm around her and gently started walking back towards the compound. We took a few steps and she shook me off. Where are we going? She asked in a panic. I was taken aback but answered. Back to the others. No, no, not yet, she insisted. But I don't know what to do if you have another panic attack. I admitted. It's fine now. I felt it coming, but not anymore. Don't worry about it. I worry about you. I don't want you to get hurt. I moved closer. Too late for that. My brain is already messed up. I'm not getting proper treatment here. I don't even know who I am. And when I do, I panic so much, I'm physically incapacitated. Skisco cried out. I know things are bad, but what can we do? We have nowhere else to go. Anywhere is better than here. I'm sick of being treated like a lab rat. I'm watched 24 hours a day and being pestered about something that I can't remember. If the memory is so bad that I become a mumbling fool, maybe I shouldn't remember it. Skisco started pacing. I did not sign up for this. You did though, I interrupted the rant. What do you mean? I don't want this. You were an investigative journalist that took on their cause. Was I? I don't even remember that. Skisco was beginning to panic again. This was different than all the other attacks I've witnessed up until that point. She was getting louder and louder, but her eyes were different. When she would have these attacks before, her eyes would almost turn white as if her mind was being controlled by somebody else. At this point, she was very much focused and coherent. Also, she never once mentioned that there was nothing out there. I knew Skisco was suffering, but I always thought it was due to what NASA did to her. Turned out, she was suffering because of these nasty nebulas. She probably wanted to escape this whole time, but she was guarded. No wonder she was in no rush to get back. Her tent was essentially a prison cell. At that point, I knew Bonham could not be trusted as a leader. He was trying to protect Skisco this whole time, but his actions made her worse than ever. He imprisoned Skisco in her tent, further isolating her from the world. She was already in shambles, and he only exacerbated her condition. I knew I had to go against him, whatever happened. Lennis was already on board, but Oblivio likely needed some convincing. Bonham was content sitting around and doing nothing but playing with his telescope. While my mind was making plans, Skisco was still panicking. I thought that I had been quiet long enough, so I decided to comfort her. I hugged her and told her everything will be just fine. We hugged for several minutes. Her squeeze was very tight. She cried a little on my shoulders, but then took a deep breath and really sank into the hug. I kissed her forehead and held her closer to me. Let's run away together, she suddenly said. I was at a loss for words. I pulled away from the hug and looked at her. You don't want to be there, I don't want to be there, so let's go. We don't believe in their cause. She explained herself further. But where will we go? We're in the middle of nowhere. We don't even know where the nearest town is, I argued. It doesn't matter. We'll find a way. You ask me for what we should do? Well, my answer is leave all this commotion behind. Let's be together out there in the real world and not cooped up among 43 tents with people we care nothing about. Uh, how will we survive? I don't really see a way. Listen, she interrupted my stuttered speech. I'm not going back there. I'd rather take my chance out here and die. What I have there is no life anyways. You can either be with me or with those nerdy nebulas. Another decision to make. How great was that? I struggled making the first one and now I was faced with another. I never had the courage to leave the compound myself. I was afraid I would be dead in a matter of days as I did not know how to survive in nature. I doubt Skisco had any idea how to forage for food or hunt for prey. There was also the possibility that the nebulas reached a consensus that I was the problem and would be exiled or killed anyways. Another decision that had grave consequences and I needed to figure out quickly. The Clash song was playing in my head. Should I stay or should I go?
I did not want to leave Oblivio behind, especially without an explanation. We have barely seen or talked to each other over the last few weeks. If I was to disappear, I would likely never see him again. I couldn't bring this point to Skisko as she did not know who Oblivio was or my relationship to him. I was torn about the idea of leaving Oblivio behind, but the thought of never seeing Skisko again was much worse. I decided to take this leap of faith and escape with Skisko, but I still wanted to tell Oblivio goodbye. I figured I would tell Skisko I would need to go into the compound at night to gather some supplies and then we could escape together. Skisko was happy to hear my decision and has calmed down. There were a couple of hours until the night time so we kept on spending time together. We talked, laughed and enjoyed each other's company. I took Skisko to the lookout where we slept last night. I could finally show her the beautiful sunset without any interruption. We watched the sun slowly set in silence. No words could describe such a beauty. We both knew the days ahead of us would surely be tough, but for now, the red, yellow and orange sun rays were giving us hope. It was almost poetic, the sun was setting representing the end of the day and we were witnessing it as we ended our ties with the nebulas. The sun was almost completely set, Skisko fell asleep again. I enjoyed the last few moments of the now purple sky before it turned completely black. I thought about the nebulas, Bonham, Lennis and the others. Skisko and I have been gone the whole day and it didn't seem anybody came to look for us. We were a fair distance away, but if five people walked in five different directions, one would have found us. Skisko was yelling pretty loud earlier, so anyone in the vicinity would have undoubtedly heard us. I thought that this was just another reason to leave and never return. I was under the impression I was the only outsider in this group, but I was wrong. Skisko was a misfit just like me. We were not academics, we were not interested in what they had to prove or disprove. We were just two souls lost in the world that found each other. While I was lost in my romantic thoughts, I realized that now would be a good time to head back to the compound. The plan was simple. Go in, tell Oblivio goodbye, get supplies, and camp the night out here. Tomorrow morning, the journey of Skisko and Tedium was to begin. I woke her up and told her we should get going. She was to come with me but stay a little back once we got closer to the nebulas. There was too much for me to carry alone. My janitorial duties came in handy as I knew where all the supplies were and how I could access them without being caught. We started heading back. We walked for about an hour and reached the compound. There seemed to be little activity. The conditions were perfect. I told Skisko to stay back and that I would come back with the supplies. I stealthily walked around the tents to avoid detection. I decided to visit Oblivio first and then head to the supply tent. I quietly snuck between those 43 tents until I reached Oblivio's. Unfortunately, he was not there. I have spent too much time trying to reach him and could not afford to spend more. I unwillingly started to head back to the supply tent to get some rations. All of a sudden, I heard a loud noise that sounded like an airplane flying by. I looked up and the horizon lit up. A loud blast was heard. I closed my eyes due to the bright light and my ears were ringing. More explosions were happening nearby as I heard somebody yell, We're under attack! Chapter 18 Entropy Bombs were flying left, right and center. Every explosion lit up the night momentarily before dimming out. I tried to look for shelter, but the bright light from the explosions made it difficult to see in the dark. I could not see where the planes were coming from and could not figure out a place to hide. Anywhere I went I encountered debris and the dead. Screams of agony were heard from the surrounding area. The blasts covered up the sound of the screams, but the light they produced uncovered the dozens of dead and dismembered bodies on the ground. NASA was onto us and would stop at nothing to kill us all. I was shell-shocked from all that was going on and suddenly remembered Skisko. I left her behind but could not figure out where. I have become quite disoriented from the loud noises, falling debris and human carnage. The 43 tents could not sustain such artillery attacks and that was usually how I navigated my way. I was stepping carefully mortified at what may happen next. The consistency of the bombs being dropped has not changed and I could have been next. I tried to move away from the blast zone but tripped and fell backwards. I heard a loud groan and realized I tripped over one of the nebulas. It was dark so I could not make out who it was. I yelled out asking them who they were but they were busy screaming in agony to reply. I felt my way around their thorax and felt a warm thick liquid pour over my hands and a fleshy feeling on my fingertips. I could not fully see the injuries they sustained but I felt as though they were done for. I started moving faster away from where I saw the last explosion. I was using my arms feeling the leaves and trees trying to figure out my way. My plan seemed to be working as the blast sounded further and further away. I had no idea where I was headed but away from the bombs was a good idea. I kept walking while being hit in the face with shrubs. I felt a few cuts and scrapes on my body but it was better than a bomb going off next to me. The sound of bombs was dampening and the sound of leaves swinging backwards was increasing. I then heard a louder explosion and looked back. The bomb fell about 11 meters away from me. I could not feel the blast but the debris from the ground hit my head. I started running faster and suddenly could not see. My ears were ringing loudly and I felt the ground against my back. 
I opened my eyes feeling the bright sun rays. I closed them quickly and rubbed them. I sat up and looked around at the now destroyed compound. I must have passed out from the blast. My legs were scraped and I felt a sharp pain in my lower back and left arm. My body was still functioning though badly bruised. I struggled to stand up and looked around to see if I could spot anyone else. The entire compound was destroyed. Counting tents was much easier now since there were none. I could not spot any people, at least no breathing ones. I started walking around towards where the compound used to be. In the daylight, I realized that though I moved quite a bit last night, I was not far from where I was just before the bombardment began. I must have walked in circles. I heard a familiar groan, the same one from last night. I tried to locate the sound and moved closer towards it. I could not be certain whether this was the same person from yesterday, but they sounded identical. Their body was bloodied and their legs completely blown off. Their lower intestine was pouring out of their abdomen only to be held by their hands. The screaming grew louder and louder. I sat down next to them and patted their heads. Their face was so bloody that I could not tell who it was. I wish I did, but I knew it was too late for them. I sat next to the screaming body. They were in immense pain and were so since last night. I had no frame of reference as to what should be done in a situation like this. I had no experience with death. I was terrified by it. I couldn't lend any words of wisdom to the soon departed. All I had in my head was my old classmate's explanation that death is pre-life. Nothing I would have said would have made their situation better. They were going to die today. No doctors in sight and no hospitals. Even if they were, they were beyond any chance of survival. As I sat there pondering in silence, they grabbed my arm. They looked me in the eyes and they shook their head. They stopped screaming and said no words. Their lower lip quivered and their body started to shiver. Though they said nothing, I knew what they wanted. To end their miserable existence faster. I have never killed anyone. I struggled with the idea for a few minutes, but they kept on yanking my arms with a clear expression on their face. They wanted it done, and done now. I tore off a piece of clothing that I had and placed it over their mouth and nose. They were still holding my arm. I held it firmly to stop the oxygen entering their body. Their grip grew stronger, but they were not pulling my hand away. They actually were pulling me closer as the rest of their body was jerking and twisting to fight for the last breath. We never broke eye contact. Their eyes were tearing up and my eyes ensued. After a while, they collapsed to the ground and lay motionless. I stood up and shook off the blood and tears off my hands. I turned around and started walking away. I was officially a killer. Granted, this was a mercy killing and some would view me as a euthanizer, but I had killed nonetheless. I was still in shock over all the shells that were dropped on us last night and my actions did not fully sink in. After a few moments, I realized I didn't even know who this person was. I undoubtedly knew them as I lived among the 179 residents here for quite some time. I thought momentarily about turning around and confirming the identity of the deceased but decided against it. The anonymity of the person I murdered would help me cope with my actions better. I then thought, what if this was Oblivio or Skisco? Would I have been able to behave the same way? My mind was still heavy, so I walked over to where I left Skisco last night. I naively hoped she would still be there. She, of course, was not there and neither was the tree she was hiding behind. I looked around the stomp that was now left in lieu of the tree and did not see any blood or bodies. This was a bit of a relief since Skisco could have escaped before all the commotion began. I wondered in which direction she ran. I wonder whether she was able to avoid all the bombs, but, most importantly, I wonder if she was still alive. She could have literally been anywhere and I had no idea where to start looking. I saw some movement around the destroyed tents in the distance so I decided to investigate. I approached the area and noticed a few nebula members, around 6. I hollered at them and they turned around. They were startled at first, understandably, but relaxed once they recognized me. Lennis was among them. She ran towards me and hugged me tightly. I stood there shocked as Lennis never showed me any affection before. We were at each other's throats constantly. My arms were by my side and she was not letting go. I heard small whimpers from behind my left ear. She was crying. I lifted one arm to pat her on the back. She moved back and said, Thank God you're okay. We've been running around like crazy and the explosions went all around. She went on rambling frantically for several minutes. She didn't provide any new information, only recapping the events of the attack. It was understandable as she was still in shock. She finally stopped to catch her breath and whispered, All dead. So many dead. I've never seen this side of Lennis before. She was usually the strong type. She would never show any emotions, at least not to me, except certainty and anger. Granted, this is before she saw dozens of her colleagues blown to bits. I was also glad to see she survived. I take it she really did care for me. My mind was so focused on taking a life and then finding Skisco that I did not think about anybody else. The thought of finding Oblivio did not cross my mind once. I was relieved Lennis and the other five were fine, but I did not worry about them prior. My reactions to finding out they were fine were also much dimmer than Lennis's. I was not hugging everyone frantically, making sure they were not badly injured. My mind was pretty blank, especially after the killing. Maybe I was shell-shocked to think anything. Maybe I was selfish as always. After a few exchanges back and forth with the group making sure everyone was fine, I decided to see what Lennis knew. I couldn't see who else but NASA would do this, but how did they find us? How many dead? I asked Lennis. 
Most of us, she sobbingly answered. Look at all the bodies. I can't even identify half of them. Did you find Oblivio? I asked. No. She shook her head. Bonham? She let out a loud cry. I found him a few steps away. He's dead. She continued crying loudly. I walked over to where Lennis has pointed to see Bonham's lifeless body. I stared at him for several minutes. He lay motionless. I turned around to see Lennis and the rest still weeping. I did not feel like crying. I felt sad about Bonham's passing, but my body was not generating tears. Though she was bawling, I questioned her further. Do we know what happened? Well, she sniffled. It had to have been NASA. We have no other enemies. I could only find these five and now you. I tried to start looking for more people and salvage what I could, but once I saw Bonham, I couldn't continue. He was like a father to me. She pointed at the rest. To all of us. What are we going to do next? I hesitated. I have no idea. I wanted Bonham's position so bad. I wanted to lead, but not like this. The last things I've said to him were horrible. I called him an incompetent old fool, and now I no longer have the chance to tell him anything else. She hung her head low. A few other Nebula members gathered while Lennis was speaking. All were bruised up, but without serious injuries. Lennis greeted all of them, but much less enthusiastic than she was with me. I was sure she was devastated by Bonham's death and had no ounce of energy left. The other survivors gathered around Bonham. They stood there silently. Not a word. After a while, some said a short speech and said their goodbyes trying to get some closure. When around 42% of the people said their piece, I decided to say something. I didn't want to say anything about Bonham, but rather about our next actions. I'm gonna check around the perimeter to try to find more people. I'll bring them back here. I turned around and started to walk away. I wanted to help, but more importantly, I did not want to stand there and say my goodbyes to Bonham. They say you should not speak ill of the dead. I always wonder why that was. The dead are the last people who would care about their feelings being hurt. In fact, they no longer have any feelings whatsoever. You shouldn't speak ill of the living as they have feelings and could get hurt. Also, they may be dead one day and you will regret what you said. Though Bono was dead, I still harbored animosity towards him. My experiences with him were rarely positive and after I heard Skisko's story, I despised him even more. Something inside me was telling me I should let go of the negative feelings towards him, but I simply could not do so. He always thought so little of me and belittled my accomplishments. He kept Skisko trapped in her tent and hid valuable information from the rest of the nebulas. He convinced all the people here to give up their lives and join his cause and thought he knew what's best for everyone. The night he was screaming at me, he was met with almost all the nebulas attacking him back. Now that he was dead, all have seemed to have forgiven him. I did not forgive him. I wasn't sure whether I was ever going to forgive him, but I knew that I have not forgiven him yet. As I was walking away, Lennis called me. What about Skisko? I turned and shrugged my shoulders and continued to walk away. I told the nebulas I was going to be looking for the others, but my main concern was Skisko and Oblivio. Aside from them, I could not care less about who I found here. I was moments away from escaping this horrible place with Skisko only to be forced back in. At NASA, they were ready to let us go before these clowns came in and decided to kidnap us again. It seemed to me the nebulas were only there to fuck up my plans of getting out of this thing alive. My rage was growing stronger and stronger. It was a good thing I left them to grieve Bonham in peace. At that point, I would have likely snapped and told them how I really felt. I had one thing on my mind, finding Skisko and getting as far away from here as possible. Oblivio was free to join my escape plan, though I had my doubts he would. He was enjoying his experience with the nebulas. I kept on walking around the compound trying to find Skisko. I would find other Nebula members and direct them towards Lennis and the others if they were still alive and able to move themselves. The injured were more difficult to maneuver as I had to carry them back. Sometimes I would get lucky and another Nebula member would be able to assist me with the task. Every time I returned to the meeting spot, there were more and more Nebulas. Not as many as before the attack, but a large group nonetheless. All of them were grieving for Bonham and conversing amongst themselves. I was getting irritated as I was doing most of the work rebuilding an organization I was looking to flee as soon as I could. I also haven't found Skisko or Oblivio which made me worry about whether they were still alive. I carried another injured member back and decided to speak up. Look, I know we're all sad and shocked at what happened, but I can't be the only one looking for survivals. For all we know, NASA is planning to attack again and we need to gather all the people and supplies and get out of here. I looked over to Cyril, who frequently helped me with inventory. Cyril, see what rations and other supplies we have left. Lennis, you tend to the wounded. I was delegating tasks to all the nebulas. We needed more people scouring the lands to find whatever resources we could use. Those tasks were fairly straightforward, but there were more morbid things that had to be done. I told a few people to gather all the dead bodies in one area and for the others to start digging a mass grave. At first, no one wanted to be tasked with that. However, some reluctantly volunteered later. I knew we were 179 before and counted around 33 living members now, but counting the dead would have given us a better idea if we should keep looking for more nebulas. I kept venturing out and finding less and less people every time. I began getting increasingly worried about Oblivio and Skisko. The crew responsible for the dead bodies counted 82 so far and we found 41 living. My quest continued. 49 living and 103 dead. Where could they have been? 
When I was back at the main spot, I would always check to see the dead first to see if Skisko and Oblivio were among them. I was relieved on one hand when I did not see them, but worried on the other hand as we have less potential people to find. I went on and came back dozens of times to find only two people. Others looking for survivors mostly came back empty-handed as well. The count stood at 58 living, 113 dead, 8 missing. Oblivion and Skisco were still yet to be found. It was getting into the late afternoon hours and the nebulas grew tired. There was not much more to do now but find the 8 missing people. All the rations and supplies that could have been salvaged were collected already. Most nebulas were either eating or resting, but I could not sit still. I needed to find Oblivio and Skisco. I still had a chance. Tedium? I heard a voice from behind me. You should rest, eat something. You have been running around all day. I turned around and saw it was Lennis. I gestured I was fine and headed out again to find them. There were only so few hours of daylight left, and I did not want to squander them on rest. Skisco and Oblivio had to be out there. I walked for a while without finding anyone. I started yelling out, Skisco! Oblivio! But no one answered. My mind was going insane. The combination of no food, no sleep, and severe trauma gave me slight hallucinations. I saw Oblivio's face on the rock and Skisco's face in the tree. I would rejoice when I saw them, but returned to disappointment when I realized my mind was simply playing tricks on me. This had been the longest time I had ventured out and had nothing to show for it. I was now getting worried about going back. I was scared to return and see Skisco's and Oblivio's lifeless bodies lying there with the rest, or worse, coming back and realizing they are still missing. My brain was going into some really dark places. I thought that one of them was the person I killed earlier in the day. I never stopped to figure out who they were. What if it was one of them? The thought scared me along with a few other hallucinations I was experiencing, so I jumped in a panic. I was breathing heavily and couldn't catch my breath. My head started spinning and I vomited on the ground. I hurled a few more time after that and began to dry heave. Surprisingly, that calmed me down. I wiped my mouth and continued walking. I was about to turn back, but I noticed what looked like legs underneath a tree log in the distance. I ran towards the legs and was stunned. It was Oblivio, but he wasn't moving. I proceeded to slowly move closer as I hesitated he might be dead. As I knelt down next to him, I could see that he was breathing. Thank goodness! I let out a sigh of relief. My shouts have awakened Oblivio and he opened his eyes slowly. I think he could not see clearly who I was, but I hugged him tightly. He was very dazed and confused, but then realized it was me. Tedium! Help get this log off me, please! I struggled to lift the log for a bit, but was able to do so just enough for Oblivio to wiggle out. He started rubbing his leg as the blood circulation has been bad for quite some time. I was relieved that Oblivio was alive. He was definitely injured, but it seemed he was alright overall. I was so happy I couldn't even speak. He was quiet too, trying to regain the feelings in his legs. He moved his limbs back and forth and stood up and stretched. He would groan when he would do certain movements. I'm so glad you're fine, I said. I'm glad you found me. I was screaming for most of the morning. I must have passed out from dehydration, Oblivio replied. Well, you survived, which is more than I can say for 113 of us. I somberly said. 113 dead? By my last count, yes. 8 people are still missing and 58 survived, though some of them with severe injuries. I have no words. I didn't think things can get this out of hand. Everything with Bonham yesterday. He's dead. I caught Oblivio off. What? He is one of the ones that didn't survive the attack. I went on explaining what has happened today with Lennis and the rest. Oblivio had a hard time hearing me as the bombs went by near him. He could not hear very well from his left ear. He sat there quietly and looked completely destroyed emotionally. He was close with Bonham, so he was sad like the others. I didn't bring my personal feeling of Bonham into the mix as Oblivio seemed upset enough. I kept on explaining what has happened and mentioned that Skisco is still missing. I told him I was looking for him and her specifically. We had about an hour of sunlight left, so I asked him to help look for her. Oblivio was listening without a response until I mentioned Skisco. He raised his brow and asked, Where did you guys go? I've been looking for you all day yesterday. There was a lot of commotion that night, if you remember, and Skisco was having a severe panic attack. I took her to a place where no one could find us. I used to go there frequently before I was assigned all my responsibilities. I answered. Why didn't you come back in the morning? Oblivio was still confused. We were enjoying our time together. It was wonderful. At the tent, I hardly got enough time with her. Every meeting was followed by an interrogation by Bonham or Lennis. I was getting giddy as I remembered the day I spent with Skisco. Glad you were having fun, Oblivio said sarcastically. I sense your tone, and I don't care. I didn't ask to join these guys. I don't want to be part of this mission. I found a girl I liked and that likes me. That's all. She's not a science experiment for the nebulas to tinker with. After a few hours, I suggested going back to the compound, and she refused. You should have seen the fear in her eyes. She did not want to come back. All right, Tedium. You always get whatever you want. Because that's exactly what I wanted. I wanted to go stargazing. I wanted to be kidnapped twice. And I wanted to be plagued by Stockholm Syndrome and side with my captors. I'm sure you got what you wanted. I only want Skisco, and even that's proving to be difficult. You didn't have to stay here. You could have always left. Oblivio was getting defensive. I was about to. We were about to. What? Oblivio answered in shock. Yesterday, Skisco and I were planning to run away together. 
Neither one of us wanted to stay. The only reason we came back was to get supplies. I paused for a second. Well, one reason was to get supplies. I also wanted to say goodbye to you. When I came back, you weren't in your tent. I started heading back and the attack began. Oblivio was shocked. His jaw almost hit the ground. I was expecting us to be hugging and telling each other how happy we were that the other one is alive, but it turned into an argument again. Oblivio was not able to say anything. I was still worked up and kept quiet as well. I was glad to see he was alive, but this was a reminder of how we grew apart. Oblivio clearly wanted to be part of the nebulas, and I did not. I wanted him to run away with Kisko and me, but I knew he would not go for it. I was surprised Oblivio was so far away from the compound and why he was not at his tent last night. I decided to ask him. Why were you not at your tent last night? Oblivio looked up and said, I was looking for you and Skisco. I was actually out almost all day trying to find you two. Was Bonham mad? I asked. Bonham was mad when you last saw him. He answered. What do you mean? Well, you missed quite a show. You would have enjoyed it considering you're not the biggest Bonham buddy. It seemed all the Nebulas had an opinion. What opinion was that? The opinion was... He paused momentarily. Fuck Bonham. People were very upset with him, I remember. Oh, it got worse. I didn't notice when you left exactly, but all the nebulas were screaming and shouting at Bonham. Attacks on his policies, characters, personal things, and everything in between. The angry mob voted unanimously that Bonham is no longer fit for leadership. How did Bonham take it? I was curious. Bonham was shocked at first and then started arguing back. He defended his actions, but the nebulas had none of it. He hid the truth from them. In their eyes, that is not good leadership. That's odd. I interrupted. What's odd? You said it yourself that night. You called him an incompetent old man that is not fit to be a leader. Not that. All the surviving members have been bawling their eyes out all day over Bonham's body. Some have not moved from his side the whole day. They were so mad at him the day before and now devastated that he's dead. It doesn't add up. People generally feel sad when people they know die tedium. But I'm sure I know why their emotions weigh heavy on them. They probably feel guilty considering what happened. They told him to step down as a leader. They didn't beat him to a pulp. Why would they feel guilty? Oblivio took a deep breath and hesitated to answer. He seemed very uncomfortable remembering the events that took place. He went on to explain that Bonham refused to step down. He stood his ground and told the Nebulas to get back to their normal duties. The Nebulas argued back that he was no longer their leader. And Bonham resorted to say he was not stepping down and there was nothing they could do about it. They did something though, tied him to a tree with his hands behind his back. After he was tied down, most members continued scolding Bonham and some took more drastic actions. They started throwing things at him, spitting on him and even went as far as hitting him. Mob mentality was in full force. Oblivio tried to get them to stop but was pushed aside. Bonham's strength eventually gave up and he fell to the ground. The mob dispersed shortly after. The next day Bonham was still lying there with his hands tied behind his back. He stayed out like that the whole night. Oblivio tried to set him free in the morning but again was met with resistance. He gave Bonham some water to the dismay of the other nebulas. He could not bear the sight of Bonham being tied up like that. Bonham was an old man who would not bounce back easily from something like that. Oblivio decided to venture out and look for us instead. He could not do anything to help Bonham and did not want to be constantly reminded of Bonham's suffering. He was out until nightfall and could not find us or his way back. A bomb went off next to him and he only remembered waking up in the morning pinned to the ground by the log. Oblivio's story of what happened sent chills down my spine. I knew the nebulas were capable of violent actions against NASA but not aimed towards one of their own. It made sense now why they were crying more over Bonham's death than any of the other dead nebulas. They probably felt guilty over their actions which at least showed they had some empathy, but I don't think it mattered to Bonham. He was chained to a tree and could not even run for cover during the attack. I knew at that moment the nebulas were a dangerous group. I thought if they did that to Bonham, they would definitely do much worse to me or Oblivio. Oblivio still sat with a mortified look on his face after telling me of the coup. I looked at Oblivio and said, Oblivio, you see these people are crazy. They tied Bonham up like an animal and didn't feed him for a day. They are not people we should associate with. It was an unfortunate event, but their cause is valid. Oblivio tried to justify their actions. Unfortunate event? Psychotic torture of your leader is just an unfortunate event? They beat him, spit on him, and threw things at him for not telling them that he could contact the outside world. That is not reasonable behavior, I said loudly. I see why they're called the nasty nebulas now. I don't agree with their tactics, but I agree that there is something NASA is hiding. They are the only ones who would get to the bottom of it. I have been researching all these inconsistencies. At this point, it doesn't make sense to just chuck it to oversight. It's an actual conspiracy to lie to the public. Who's to say the nebulas are not lying to you? Bono was hiding the ability to communicate with the outside world. What else was he hiding? N no, NASA is hiding the information. I did my own research. Bono didn't sway me in any direction. Why couldn't I spot Jupiter that night? My coordinates were correct. 
NASA kidnapped us first. You can't tell me they're innocent in all of this. No one is innocent here. That is why we need to get as far as fucking possible from these two tyrannical organizations. I was getting very emotional. Did you even think about what Lennis would do to you now that she's in charge? She knows you were Bonham's lackey and doesn't trust you. If she managed to get the Nebulous to tie up Bonham, what do you- She wasn't there for that. She wasn't? Seems right up her alley. I was surprised. No, she came after all the commotion. She said that she was not feeling well and was trying to sleep in her tent. When she realized the yelling was not going away, she came out to see what was happening. So even the new leader has no control over these lunatics? That does not provide me with confidence. How do I know it wasn't a rogue nebula who attacked us last night? We were arguing in circles. Oblivio clearly believed in the cause. I couldn't get him to turn his back on the nebulas. I tried to make him see through my point of view, but he kept disagreeing with every point I brought forth. I knew I was not going to go back there. I wanted to fight Skisco and run away from this place. I wanted Oblivio to join us and return to the normal life we had before. A life where we were not kidnapped and tortured. A life where we were not staging a rebellion against the government. A life where I don't need to kill someone so they no longer feel pain. We kept our back and forth argument until Oblivio stopped and said, Tedium, there is nothing more to say. You have made up your mind and I have made up mine. I guess this is where we part ways, old friend. Those words filled my ears and shook me to my core. I knew this was a long time coming. Oblivio and I have been drifting apart and this was the final straw. I knew this moment was coming, but I was so blinded by my desire to escape that I could not see it until Oblivio spelled it out for me. Oblivio looked at me and said, It's getting dark. I'll help you find Skisco. Once we do, you'll have to show me the way back to the compound. I'm not expecting you to stay there with me, and I won't let the Nebulas know that you and Skisco fled. This was going to be the last moments I spent with Oblivio. I really did not know what to say. We started walking around in search of Skisco. We were quiet at first, but realized we might as well spend this time wisely. We started reminiscing about our past together. We went back to childhood, university, and even more recent history. It was a happy moment filled with joy and laughter, but also sadness as it would soon end. I was never good at saying goodbye, but I decided to try my best at that moment. Oblivio, I'm going to miss you. We have never seen eye to eye, but I'm happy I met you and glad to have you as a friend. I said and teared up. Friend is a strong word, Oblivio said and we both chuckled. Kidding. Me too, Tedium. Maybe we'll still see each other one day. Perhaps we can plan another stargazing trip, I quipped. But this time, no kidnapping, Oblivio said and we both chuckled again. I really have to piss. Yeah, me too. I replied and we walked away from each other to complete the deed. We joked about seeing each other again, but I doubted it would ever happen. 113 nebulas died in a span of a few hours, which did not present great odds for survival. Oblivio was happy to be part of this cause and was willing to die for it. He was not fazed by this attack, but only further motivated to pursue. I really hoped I would see him again, but hope can only get you so far. I heard Oblivio urinating in the distance and I unzipped my pants and relieved myself as well. Almost poetically, we were marking our territories apart, symbolizing us parting ways. There seems to be something out here! I heard Oblivio's shouts. What is it? I yelled back. Looks like a pair of legs, but it's too dark. I'm going to go closer. Oblivio's voice echoed through the woods. I finished urinating and went back to look for Oblivio. I hollered for him several times, but did not get a response. I looked around and trying to find him. It was challenging as it was almost pitch black at that moment. I then saw a figure standing in the distance and walked towards it. As I approached, I could see Oblivio facing away from me, so I kept walking calling his name. Strangely, Oblivio remained quiet. I started walking faster towards him and repeating his name. As I was a few steps from him, I noticed him staring down at what looked at a human body. I rushed to see who it was, and Oblivio turned around and stopped me. He did not need to say anything. His facial expression clearly told me who it was. Chapter 19 Impetus I carried Skisco's corpse back to the others. Oblivio offered to help, but I declined his request. Tears were running down my cheeks, making it harder to see in the already dark night. I was devastated. I could not believe she was dead. We were so close to running away together only for her to be killed by NASA. Oblivio tried to comfort me, but it was of no use. I couldn't even say a word without my lower lip quivering and the tears starting up again. I had to navigate our way back as Oblivio did not know where the rest were. After about 23 minutes, we saw a fire. As we approached, we saw the nebula sitting around it. All the members stood up and rushed to hug Oblivio and make sure he was fine. I placed Skisco in the mass grave that was already dug up for the rest of the bodies. I looked at her lifeless body and realized my plan to run away just died with her. I could hear some of the people behind me asking Oblivio who it was I put in the grave. Oblivio let them know. I was standing with my back to the nebula so they would not see me crying. A few people wanted to come closer to the grave to console me, but Oblivio kept them away. I was in no condition to associate with anyone. I simply watched her corpse as it lay there on top of the others. 
All I could focus on was her. I didn't see anything else. I had a sort of a tunnel vision that blocked anything and anyone nearby. I eventually sat down at the edge of the grave while still looking at her. This was the first time I had seen someone who was so close to me die. As terrible as it sounds, I did not care for any of the other nebulas that have passed. I saw so many dead bodies that day, including the one I was responsible for and did not feel a thing. I felt shocked but was still planning my escape with Skisco and Oblivio. To me, all the nebulas could have died as long as Skisco and Oblivio were safe. I knew there was no way to bring her back, but I would kill all the nebulas if it meant I could see her for even a second. I hated the nebulas, but Oblivio felt differently. He probably forgot they kidnapped us some time ago. Oblivio, or Astroglide as he was fondly known, was willing to let bygones be bygones. I clearly still held some animosity towards them. I was never truly accepted by them and was viewed as a drain on resources. The only thing that saved me was my ability to get Skisco to talk and later revealing Bonham's secret. Though, I'm not sure whether their views of me changed or their perception of me has only improved when compared to Bonham. Oblivio was met with praise from the first minutes here and felt right at home. He probably didn't even view this as a kidnapping. I think he saw it as a blessing in disguise. Most of the nebulas decided to get some sleep. Oblivio asked me, but my silence indicated that he should leave. I sat there by the grave for hours. I couldn't sleep. I was still facing back to the nebulas. I knew if I were to see them, I might have murdered another one of them. And this time, it would not be a mercy killing. I decided to occupy myself by shoveling the dirt back into the grave. I figured, if I don't see Skisco's dead body, it would not be as painful. I was working in the dark, so it was difficult to see. I really did not care about the efficacy of my actions. I merely wanted to occupy my time with something. I kept shoveling and shoveling until my arms collapsed. My body followed shortly after. I have finally succumbed to the hunger and the exhaustion. I awoke to Oblivio shaking me. It was a bright morning. I felt very disoriented and dizzy. I was completely covered in dirt. I looked at the grave and it seemed as though I did more harm than good trying to fill it up. Oblivio asked, Are you okay? I nodded my head yes and tried to stand up on my own. I was up for a few seconds before I lost balance and fell down. Oblivio told me to stay put and brought some food and water. Eat something tedium, you haven't eaten all day yesterday, you need your strength, Oblivio begged. It was true, I have not eaten for about two days at that point. I also barely slept. I was going through the most traumatic experience of my life which overshadowed insignificant things like food, water and sleep. I ate as much as I could which was not much and rested for a bit. The food did not go down easy. It was almost as though my stomach was surprised some nourishment was actually coming its way. It was a struggle to chew and digest the food so I took small bites. I sat around the grave and noticed the nebulas were nowhere near. I asked Oblivio where they have all gone. Oblivio pointed behind them and explained that it was decided to move everyone. Everyone was worried another NASA attack may be coming, so it was best to change our location. Oblivio stressed the fact that I should go join them to avoid potentially being bombed by NASA again. I agreed with him and we slowly made our way towards the new compound. Though I told Oblivio I agreed that we should head to safety, I did not really care if I survived to see tomorrow. I didn't want Oblivio to worry more than he already has. Seeing Skisco dead ended all my motivation to survive this whole ordeal. As I was walking away from the mass grave, I looked back momentarily and felt a sense of jealousy. I wished I was in that pile with the rest of the bodies. I felt as though they were finally at peace. By this point, I had been kidnapped, beaten, kidnapped again, became public enemy number one, killed and watched my love be killed among others. I thought that even if I were to survive this, my life would never be the same. My brain would be so fucked up and disheveled that a normal life would simply not be possible. A lifetime of therapy and night terrors is not as glamorous as it sounds. Oblivion and I kept walking in silence towards the rest of the nebulas. What was once a group of 179 were now only 59. There were still 7 of us missing, but at this point it was safe to assume they were dead as well. We reached the new compound which was far less impressive. I didn't bother counting anything here because I did not see a point in it. Lena spotted us and made her way towards us. She embraced me with a powerful hug and said, I'm so sorry about Skisco, I knew she meant a lot to you. I thanked her and gently pushed her away. I proceeded to walk towards a shady area and lay down on the ground. I closed my eyes trying to forget everything that has happened. I overheard Lennis and the others murmuring asking Oblivio if I was fine. Oblivio said something along the lines that I was fine but I did not fully hear his response. The rest of the people there kept their distance away from me which was appreciated. I was in no mood to talk to these people. I was still holding on to my hate of them. I was so close to never seeing these Nimrod nebulas again only to have everything collapse in front of me. Now I was stuck with them. I was devastated by Skesko's death and was forced to stay with the same people who put her in a situation to begin with. Though my mind was running wild with feelings of hate, sadness and contempt, the exhaustion has caught up with me and I passed out. I awoke later that evening. I hadn't realized I passed out so I awoke with a jolt of energy. After I realized where I was, my nerves calmed a bit. I was feeling very groggy and my muscles felt tight. I started stretching them out. 
I looked around and noticed all the nebulas were sitting in the distance. It seemed as though they were discussing something, but I was too far to hear. I was curious to see what the discussion was about, but I did not want to be seen. I knew as soon as the rest would see me, I would be met with pity, which I was not interested in in the least. I quietly snuck behind them and hid behind the tree. They formed a circle with Lennis, Oblivio, and Sero in the middle. Lennis was doing most of the talking, as always. We can't just sit here, Lennis exclaimed. That's true, but we can find another place to hide while we regain some numbers, Oblivio answered. How can we regain numbers? We had a hard time recruiting before. We can't just sit on the street looking for participants. We're not planning a fun run here. One of the nebulas in the audience chimed in. Yeah, and the blast destroyed our ability to contact anyone. I know you heard this before from Bonham, but I tried our equipment. We cannot get a cell phone signal or internet of any kind out here. I tried. NASA is guarded heavily and we only have us here. Most without military training, not to mention we have plenty of injured, Oblivio rebutted. Last time we brought 30 people and we were able to get you, Skisco, and Tedium out. We have double that now. I won't discount us so quickly, Ciro chimed in. Last time they were not expecting you. You had the element of surprise. I'm certain they have increased their security after your last attack. I'm also certain they have increased it further now fearing our retaliation, Oblivio pointed out. We have to go in there. There is simply no other choice. We're just sitting ducks here. NASA found us once and they will find us again, Lennis exclaimed. Not if we change our location, they don't know how many of us survived, we have no intel on their security, we'll be going in blind, it's a suicide mission, Oblivio pleaded. From the information I heard, I gathered they were looking for retaliation for the attack. Oblivio did not think it was a good idea, but Lennis and Ciro were ready to go in guns blazing. I didn't care about retribution for the fallen nebulas, but I did have the bloodlust for revenge to avenge Skisco. Plus, this talk of a suicide mission sweetened the deal. The more dead nebula members and NASA employees, the better. I wanted both sides to perish. They have been making my life a living hell for the last months. Lennis and Ciro were on board, so I knew I had to sway Oblivio's vote. I was terrible at manipulating someone to agree with my point of view, but I had to learn quickly. I emerged from hiding to the surprise of the nebulas. I agree with Lennis. We should kill each and every one of those bastards. I enunciated loudly. Who said that? Some of the nebulas gasped and murmured. We have 120 dead members, 113 of which we have found and buried. I don't know about you, but I won't rest until each and every one of those degenerates at NASA is dead. Yeah, yeah let's, let's get, get them. them! The crowd chanted. What was our crime? Looking for the truth? We would have gladly sat down and talked to them about this whole thing. Bonham and some of you tried tirelessly to have a civil meeting of the minds only to be shut down and shunned every single time. They forced you to live in the middle of nowhere to avoid detection. Why? We are not criminals. They are. I was getting emotional and the crowd cheered on. But we can't just attack with no information! Oblivio yelled. Well, do some recon, Ciro said. What about weapons? Oblivio threw his hands in the air. Oh, we have weapons, Ciro smiled. The time for sitting around doing nothing is done. We will avenge our people and finally find out the truth. We will force NASA out of their comforts and make them live in squalor. If we even let them live! I was speaking with the charisma of a young Hitler. As soon as I finished my speech, all the nebulas rose to their feet and cheered. Lennis came to me and hugged me. She then let go and said, Let's get those bastards! The crowd went wild. Their angry cheers echoed throughout the forest. Oblivio was the only one who did not stand and cheer. He sat back looking mortified. He made it known that he did not want to attack NASA, but there was nothing he can do to stop it now. The nebulas were gung-ho for my little display. They did not want to listen to reason. They wanted revenge. Little did they know, the person who riled them up had ulterior motives. Motives that were driven by the lust for vengeance. My lust for vengeance was aimed at both sides, though. I knew I had to convince the nebulas to attack sooner rather than later. This event was so traumatic that I could harvest their anger and cultivate it into action. The longer I would have waited, the longer they would have had to heal from this tragic event. I needed them to be irrational and complacent with Lennis's war and not rational and complacent with Oblivio's pacifism. I knew Oblivio would not let go of his ideas of non-violence easily. He was always one to argue his point. I still needed to make sure he will not influence others to stay put. I have never defeated Oblivio in a battle of wits, but my drive knew no bounds. After a bit of time, the crowd's energy died down. It was getting late, so many of the nebulas decided to get some sleep. Lennis, Sero, and I agreed to hash out a plan in the morning and go check out the weapon supply Ciro mentioned. Once Lennis and Ciro left, Oblivio approached me. He looked confused and somewhat fearful. I don't blame him. I was rather menacing in my speech. What was all of that about? Oblivio asked. I looked back at him as though I had no idea what he was talking about. He kept on pressing me for a while until I decided to say, We have to attack. 
You know it's the right decision for us. Cut the shit, Oblivio said abruptly. It's what I and the rest want, I answered smugly. What you want? Oblivio asked rhetorically and I nodded. Yesterday you were so adamant about leaving this group. You said you couldn't wait to leave. All you wanted was to find Skisco and go. In fact, you would have already been gone by now if not for the attack. Well, do you see Skisco anywhere? I raised my arms and looked around. I know you're still hurt from Skisco's death. She meant a lot to you. You wanted to start a new life with her away from it all. But you're telling me you care about the nebulas and their cause? It just doesn't- I don't give two fucks about these nasty, neurotic, nonsensical nebulas. I interrupted Oblivio with an aggressively angry alliteration. I care for one thing and one thing only. Revenge for Skisco. I don't care if NASA is hiding anything. They killed Skisco and I want them to suffer. The nebulas are just a means to an end. An enemy of my enemy is a friend. Oblivio was taken aback by my aggressive tone. It was almost as if he did not recognize me. At that moment, to be honest, I didn't recognize myself either. I was always very apathetic and had no idea what I wanted to do. Now I was focused on my goal very passionately. Nothing could sway me away from getting my revenge. Not Oblivio and not the nebulas. I couldn't reveal my true motivation for supporting Lennis, so I fed him only half the truth. If Oblivio suspected I wanted the nebulas dead, he would have gone to Lennis and tried to stop our attack. I played on his emotions. I was the furious man trying to avenge his lover's death. It was a relatable story that made me sound noble. All the surviving nebulas lost someone that they cared about, and they wanted revenge too. Oblivio may have thought something was strange in my behavior, but this narrative explained my sudden shift in perspective the best. It's difficult, we all lost people who were dear to us, but this attack would not bring them back. It would only lead to more dead, Oblivio pleaded. Staying here would result in more dead too. You think NASA won't find us again? Not to mention, our supplies and rations would only last us a few weeks. We're dead if we sit here with our thumbs up our asses, I retorted. But none of us have military training. NASA has military personnel. We can't even compete, Oblivio cried out. It was done before. Sierra is sure we can do it again. Did you forget they got us out? Pointing a gun in the right direction and pulling the trigger does not sound too difficult to me. You've gone mad. The nebulas are mostly scientists, not contract killers. Taking a life changes you. Sure, pulling the trigger sounds easy, but when you see the person's face, you will hesitate. I didn't hesitate before. I interrupted Oblivio and stared him right in the eyes. B -b before Oblivio was mumbling. He had a hard time completing a word, let alone a sentence. The attack is happening, Oblivio. Don't try and stop me. Who are you? I'm not the same tedium you knew before. I was kidnapped, tortured, and almost killed multiple times. All that shit weighs down on the person. For the last while, the only thing that kept me going was Kisco, and now she's dead. My mind is clear, and I know what needs to be done. This is not some university major. My mind is set, and no one can change it. I walked away from Oblivio. I did not care for his response. I had my goal, and I was going to achieve it. Ciro, Lennis, and the rest of the nebulas were expandable. They would merely be lambs sent to slaughter. Any NASA personnel they took down with them would only be a bonus for me. I was about 34 steps from Oblivio when he shouted, Who was it? I turned around and asked, Who was what? The person you killed, Oblivio clarified. I don't know, and I don't care. Chapter 20 Psycho Ciro's Secret Stash The morning started with Ciro, Lennis, and I hiking up a hill away from the rest of the nebulas. We all agreed Oblivio should not be part of this trip. Ciro indicated that certain supplies were put away for safekeeping. Those supplies were mostly weapons. Ciro explained that Bonham was not only hiding our cellular abilities, he was also hiding some other items. He deemed those items dangerous and only a select few were privy to those. Ciro was the only surviving member of the aforementioned select few. We were on the way to see the secret stash of guns that were to be kept out of the nebula's hands. Ciro and a few select others always had weapons with them, but most of the nebulas were usually unarmed. I always figured there had to be more weapons. We were rescued by the nebulas from NASA and NASA had some pretty heavy artillery. I was certain the nebulas didn't make their way in there using telescopes. Cero was the one handling the inventory before I was assigned the task. He did not seem like the scientific type. I remember he would have a hard time keeping count if it went above 10. Once I took over, Ciro would still do some inventory, but I would rarely see him at the supply tent. I take it he was tasked with keeping the inventory of the dangerous items. We hiked a little bit more until Ciro told us to stop. He then went over to a pile of shrubbery and moved it aside. Behind the shrubbery, a small pit was revealed. And you were worried we won't have enough guns, Ciro said and chuckled. 
I looked at the pit and was in awe. How many guns do we have? Ciro smiled in answer. I thought you counted everything around here. There must have been around 53 guns in there, ranging from small to large caliber weapons. I was shocked we had so many weapons. We were effectively a small army. I looked over at Lennis and she was shocked too. She had no idea that we had this arsenal. Bonham said he didn't like violent options, but it seems he liked guns, I said. He was more of a if you want peace, prepare for war kind of guy. Also, he didn't know the full extent of my collection, Ciro said and smiled giddily. I had no idea we had so many, Lennis chimed in. Just you wait, Ciro said and stepped away. D did you know about this? I asked Lennis. I knew there was a secret stash, but I never imagined this. Bonham made it sound like a few rifles. Lennis answered nervously. Look at this! Sarah returned proudly, holding a bazooka. This baby can do some real damage. That's, I gulped, Ooh. is pretty serious. Ha! <laughs> Tell me about it. I can't wait to blow up those NASA fucks. But there's more cool stuff here. Sarah went away again. I think this guy's a lunatic. Lennis whispered to me. I hope he's not bringing a tank back. I whispered back. Or an atomic bomb, Lennis murmured. To both of our surprise, Ciro did not bring back any more weapons of mass destruction. He brought a few delightful goodies we have never had at the compound. The compound's rations were limited to canned food and water. Ciro brought out packs of snacks, salami, and other fancy groceries. He then put those on the ground and went to retrieve more supplies, coffee, alcohol, and cigarettes. Lennis and I looked at each other shocked. We had no idea these were available. We literally have been eating only to survive. The concept of good tasting food was out the metaphorical window a long time ago. We dug in and our taste buds exploded with flavor. Where did you get all this? I said in the midst of stuffing my face. We're in the middle of nowhere. We're not in the middle of nowhere. There is a pretty sizable town just up there. Sierra pointed in the distance. What? I walked around a lot and I have not seen anything. I said. Well, it's about a two hour trip on foot. The terrain is pretty treacherous, but much better than the jungles of Colombia if you ask me. Sierra noted. I didn't know you were from Colombia. Lennis was surprised. Well, I was there briefly. I associated with some FARC dissidents, but then got out. Luckily, none of the crimes against humanity charges stuck. As Cyrus said that, Lennis and I looked at each other. That's nice. Lennis nervously muttered. Either way, the town there is pretty big. It's got everything you need. Gas stations, grocery stores, and gun stores. Luckily, this state is not strict with gun laws. Cyrus chuckled. Uh, explains the bazooka, I said. Oh no, that one's for my personal stash, Ciro piped in. I would have been more scared of Ciro if he wasn't exactly what I needed for my plan. A psychopathic military man unafraid of death. I could see from the corner of my eye Lennis was starting to change her mind on the attack after our little exchange. I had to keep her on the pro-attack side and not let Ciro scare her away. Ciro kept talking on and on which only made matters worse. I decided to ask him if he could make us some coffee. He was so excited to show us how he could start a fire without a lighter or matches and headed out to gather some wood. Before he could leave, he made sure to tell us another one of his jovial anecdotes about his past as it related to the present situation. He went on about his crew trying to burn somebody alive in the jungle and no one had a lighter. He emphasized that that day was the day he had to learn how to start a fire without the help of any artificial igniters. To avoid embarrassing situations such as these, one would presume. When Ciro finally left on his wood collecting journey, Lennis could hardly move her face. She was in such complete and utter shock at this degenerate who will assist us in achieving our goals. She just looked at me gesturing that we should get the hell out of there before he comes back. I convinced her to stay and that we needed somebody with Ciro's skill set for the attack that we were planning. Lennis was still hesitant but decided to stay. I found it odd that Lennis was not aware of Ciro's quirks. I only knew Oblivio at the compound and no one else. I had some vague understanding of certain people's personality, but most were a mystery to me. I was under the impression the Nebulas were a tight-knit group that were very familiar with each other. Seeing Lennis's reaction indicated otherwise. As I was thinking, Lennis indicated she had no idea Ciro was such a maniac. I decided to ask her why she did not know anything about Ciro, who was one of the top members of the Nebulas. She then surprised me with answering that she really did not know any of the Nebula's personal life. She only knew the abilities and skills of the individuals she dealt with. She said personal relationships would have gotten in the way of pursuing the truth. This began to sound a lot like Bonham's words. I asked Lennis if she truly believed in that. After all, seeing her reaction indicated to me she would have liked to know a little piece of information about Ciro. She sighed and said this was all part of Bonham's plan. He didn't like people developing a personal connection as it could cloud their judgment. 
I thought it made no sense at the moment, but Lennis decided to point out my relationship with Skisco. I was about to punch her right in the face after she mentioned Skisco, but I held back my fist and my tongue. Lennis must have forgotten that I was the one who broke Skisco's silence. Though, once Skisco spoke, she said she wanted to run away. If Bono was here right now, he would probably point that out to argue his case. But I would say that even before Skisco and I were romantically involved, Bonham was not able to extract any information from her. At this point, the point was moot as there was no way to confirm one way or another. But it did show me something else. I always tried to talk to the Nebulas about their past and was met with little information. I always thought this was because all the Nebulas wanted to talk about was astronomy. But, as it turned out, it was forbidden to share information. The Nebulas were not all scientists. Cyril was in no way, shape or form an astronomer. It would have been nice to have known that then. But I guess that point was moved as well now. While I was deep in my thoughts, Sira returned with some wood and started a fire. He then placed a pot of water over it to boil. Wait until you try this. It's my special recipe, Sira said. What? Does it include gunpowder or the blood of your enemies? Lennon sarcastically asked. What? Nah, you're crazy. I didn't know you were that crazy, Lemus. I thought you were a nerdy science chick. I have a PhD. Calling me a science chick really diminishes my accomplishments. Lennis was starting to get irate. Okay, sorry. Ciro said sarcastically, waved his arms and smiled at me. Well, Miss PhD, this was Bonham's favorite coffee. Bonham drank this? Lennis was taken aback. Yep, almost every day. Sometimes twice a day. He always called me a brute buffoon, but he woke up every morning to have this delightful cup of joe. Ciro said with pride. He drank coffee every day? He told me there was no way to get it. Lennis was shouting. Lennis. Ciro chuckled. There's a lot he didn't tell you. And you think he told you everything? Lennis scolded him. Definitely not. Bonham really liked to keep his secrets. He literally told me nothing. I found everything out myself by eavesdropping on this conversation with others. I would literally hear him speak to you and say he has no idea what was going on, and then later reveal the information you asked for to somebody else. Ciro paused. I guess he didn't think you needed to know. That's preposterous. You're just spewing out some nonsense. You think you're being clever? You can't even prove any of this. Lennis huffed and puffed. I can reveal one thing I'm sure you thought only you knew. Ciro cheekily hinted. This I gotta hear, Lennis said very sarcastically. Bottom really enjoyed having sex with you. As soon as he said that, Lennis's face turned pale. You thought I didn't know, did you? I heard everything. Lennis said they're in utter shock while Ciro recounted her sexual experiences. He was going overboard imitating the moaning sounds and thrusting his pelvis in the air. I stopped him and tried to get him back on track, though I did enjoy Lennis's embarrassment. Ciro went on to explain all the secrets Bonham kept. Bonham was very selective with the information that was given and to whom. He wanted to control the flow of information. If he didn't deem you needed to know the information, you would not know. It turned out the secret I found out was far from the only one that was kept from the nebulas. Lennis was upset about the coffee at first, but couldn't believe how close we were to civilization this whole time. Ciro even showed us where we could see the town from the hill we were on. Lennis couldn't handle all the truth that was coming at her. She stood up and started breathing heavily. She then started walking back and forth muttering to herself. It was then I realized I was not the only one that was held captive at that compound. It was everyone. Everyone who wanted to join the nebulas was picked up in an agreed location and was brought to the compound blindfolded. This was done to hide the location of the compound. Bottom said it was for the safety of their operation, but I think he wanted to assure to himself nobody left. The conditions were quite unbearable at times with steady diet of bland food, no running water and no heat. Most of the nebulas were not tough outdoorsmen like Ciro, who would easily survive in nature. Placing the fear of the unknown deterred many from leaving, including me. I felt like a complete idiot when Ciro told me the location. We were about 4 hours and 32 minutes from my house by car. I have been to that town as a child. When NASA picked us up, I was cognizant of the time it took to get to their office, but I was passed out for the duration of the journey to the compound. I thought we were much further. Skisko and I could have made the journey out of the woods with no issues. We could have done it without additional supplies. We could have been long gone by now, living our new life together. My hatred of Bonham grew stronger at that moment. His love affair with Lennis only amplified my hate. The amount of flack I received for talking to Skisko while he was there pursuing his own romantic relations. Not to mention, as a man who dedicated his life to fight against NASA for hiding the truth, he had plenty of secrets of his own. He was a true hypocrite. I was glad he died. Lennis was still walking around muttering to herself. Ciro stopped talking so he can sip on his coffee. He was a psychopath, but he did make a mean pole pot of coffee. Lennis stomped back and sat down. 
She was still angry but wanted some coffee after not having it for some time. I can't believe we could have left this whole time, she said and looked at Cyril. Why did you stay if you knew you could leave? Stay? Cyril laughed. I hardly stayed there in the evening. Me and my guys had a place in town. We would rotate who stayed with the nebulas to avoid suspicion. For a group of bookworms, you guys aren't really bright. Y your guys? I asked. Yeah, there were 15 of us. Only me and another left. Most died in the attack. Cyril looked down. Oh my god, that bastard! Lennis exclaimed. Was it that easy to go to and fro the town? I asked. Yeah, pretty easy. I'm shocked nobody caught on. How do you guys think we got supplies? Almost 200 people living in one place for about a year and you thought rations were sufficient? I had to restock food weekly, Zero said. I can't believe it, Lennis cried. Everything was a lie. Why did you even stay with the nebulas if you knew all about these lies? Well, to leave, I would first need to join, Zero pointed out. What? Lennis was confused. Who are you? Hired guns, me and my guys. Bonham knew you geeks needed some muscle. So he hired us for protection. He paid pretty well, so we didn't rock the boat. Zero explained. He paid you? He always said we didn't have any funds for anything. Lennis threw her arms in the air. Believe me, funds were very sufficient. I would hear him talking to the others about it. Plus, we got paid around 10 grand a week. Lennis let out a frustrated grunt and started uh -huh. pacing again. Ciro's coffee was good, but not good enough to ignore the truth she just heard. I figured she was likely not paid for her efforts, which further added to her frustration. Bonham really sold people on the cause for them to be living in squalor for that long. He probably had to lie to make sure no one left. It always surprised me that 179 people really believed in the cause and put themselves through these conditions. Even with taking away Ciro and his men, that is a large following. The truth would have made half the people leave at the first sign of trouble. The truth would have made half the people not want to join in the first place, I presume. Ciro looked at Lennis and chuckled. I can't believe she thought we were part of the nebulas. Why would I want to join these fairies? All they want to do is stargaze, the most boring activity known to man. They all got bent out of shape when they found out they had internet access. They were probably going to search for their nerdy nonsense anyways. They don't even use the internet for what it's made for. Cat videos, pornography, and hate speech, I piped in. Yeah, well, maybe cat torture videos. Ciro chuckled. You're a peculiar guy. I said. You know, no one has ever said that to me. And survived? I hesitated. I like you. Ciro chuckled. You got a sense of humor, not like these nerdy nebulas. Well, it wasn't my choice to join, I was taken against my will. Either way, back to the matter at hand. What is our plan of attack? So far all I see is our extensive gun collection. I still have most of my schematics from the last time, but we'll have to do some recon. They likely changed the formation of the guards. I also only have one of my guys this time around and a bunch of people who haven't fired a gun once. What do you suggest then? We're gonna have to start moving. The NASA building is about a day hike in that direction. Zero pointed. We'll set base far enough not to be detected. And then I can formulate a better plan of attack. Good. Let's tell Lennis once she's done with her midlife crisis over there. It's about time we found out the truth. You crack me up. Zero interrupted. What do you mean? Well... Ciro looked back to make sure Lennis was out of earshot. I've been around plenty of people heading into battle. Some are ideologically motivated and some are wild people looking for a dangerous good time. You, sir, are neither. I can see it in your eyes. I have seen this look in many before. You don't care about the cause. You care about one thing and one thing only. Revenge. That Skisco girl really meant something to you. And you're looking to satisfy some sort of psychological personal desire to balance the scales of the universe. Something like karma, but with dead bodies instead of good deeds. They killed her, and you want all of them dead. That is the only thing that will make you happy now. Uh, I... I tried to speak, but tears started running down my eyes. Believe me, I know what you're feeling. I have lost many friends during my life, and that need for revenge never goes away. You can kill as many enemies as you want. It won't bring your friend back, but it helps with the grieving process. Why are you doing this then? I was able to muster up a coherent sentence while wiping the tears off my sobbing eyes. You lost one. I lost 13. I'm just like you. I'm out for blood. Bonham's not paying me anymore, so the motivation is mutual. Yours and mine. 
make as many NASA members meet their maker. Lennis finally decided to return to us, so Ciro changed the subject quickly. I was still sobbing remembering Skisco. I looked away so Lennis wouldn't see my face. Lennis seemed confused when she returned and noticed I was crying. Ciro quickly explained that we were talking about Skisco and things got emotional. Lennis came to embrace me and comfort me, but I pushed her away. Ciro told Lennis to let me be and filled her in on our attack plans. He conveniently forgot to mention that our main motive is revenge and not finding out the truth. Lennis may have changed her mind if she knew what we were up to, but then again, she could have taken the ends justified the means mentality. Ciro brought out his schematics and was breaking down the main entrances to the building. He said last time his crew did not experience much resistance because the element of surprise was on their side. As this time, NASA would be expecting an attack, the strategy had to be different. Also, most of the nebulas couldn't squash a bug, so there was an additional challenge to overcome. I gave him some information regarding the whereabouts of Dux's office from what I could remember. Ciro said the best thing is to get to Dux and hold her hostage. That would minimize the loss of life on our side and gave us the advantage. I disagreed with minimizing the loss of life, but quietly of course. Ciro was in his element. This was what he did best. He may have not known anything astronomy related, but if you needed to lead an insurgents, he was your man. We had quite a bit to carry, so began packing all the guns away. The plan was to bring all the nebulas back here early in the morning and to begin the hike to NASA's headquarters. We helped Ciro pack everything away, except for the weapons and other supplies that were not required. As we were walking away, Ciro said he forgot something and ran back. I decided to use this opportunity to see where Lennis was at with everything that had happened. She seemed much less convinced of the attack after today's events. She was in utter shock finding out the truth and said she had to think things over. I knew I had to convince her to come back to my side. If she flipped at that moment, the plan to attack could lose momentum. Oblivio being against it was one thing, but Lennis and Oblivio practicing pacifism would have paused the plan to push through NASA's partitions. Lennis kept on weighing both options, teetering back and forth. Why the sudden change of heart? I asked her. Ciro is just insane. He might get us all killed. He looks like someone who wants to die. Oblivio is right. We are not trained for combat. Have you seen those weapons? What the hell are we supposed to do with them? What is the point? Maybe we should just quit. Lennis began to ramble off all her thoughts. Maybe Bonham was right. I should have never been shared this information. Bonham was right? I stopped her. Bonham is the reason we're in this mess. I thought it was Oblivio and I that were kidnapped, but he held all of you against your will using misinformation. Do you honestly believe that was the right thing to do? Especially when Ciro and his men left as they pleased. For fuck's sakes, he didn't even give us coffee while drinking it himself every day. What else did he hide from us? I was trying to get Lennis angry. She has not shown any emotions except sadness in the last few days. Before our conversation to usurp Bonham, Lennis was always screaming and shouting at me. She had an anger inside of her that was prolific. I was trying to unleash it again, but push it into the right direction. When she was angry at me, she was relentless. She would stop at nothing. I kept on pushing her buttons, trying to harvest her fury directed at Bonham. My plan was starting to work. She started raising her voice. Her grimace has changed and she was breathing heavily. I almost got her back to my side, but Ciro suddenly interrupted. Figure we can use some liquid courage. He held up two balls of gin, which were evidently very important to bring with us. Ciro twisted the ball open and took a sip. He then passed it to me and I drank as well. Care to partake, Miss PhD? Ciro taunted Lennis with the bottle. Yes, Lennis answered and grabbed the unopened bottle from Ciro's other hand, turned around and walked away. The way you grabbed that bottle, I can see why Bottom liked you. Ciro kept teasing her, but she kept on walking and showed him her middle finger. Ciro chuckled and continued drinking his gin. We kept walking back to the rest of the nebulas with Lennis out in front. Ciro was getting more talkative as he was getting more intoxicated. He kept on bringing his past atrocities as if they were pleasant anecdotes. I tried to keep some distance between Lennis and us so she wouldn't hear his terrible past actions. I thought I swayed her enough and didn't need psycho-savage Ciro spoiling my success. I tried to ignore Ciro myself as well as he was getting quite obnoxious. My drunken buzz was not sufficient to tolerate his stories of destabilizing the political atmosphere in South America. I wondered, as I wondered, what would Lennis do when she returned back to the rest? Would she share the knowledge of what she just heard? Would she keep it a secret? She was the acting leader, so her decision carried a lot of weight. If she was to change her mind on the attack, I think only me and Ciro would end up going through with it. I thought that I played my manipulation strategy all wrong. Instead of directing her anger towards Bonham, I should have exploited her romantic relationship with him. If they were having sex, she must have had some feelings towards him. I should have told her she should avenge Bonham's death, but I was new to this whole manipulation game. Alas, at that point, it was out of my hands, and I had to wait patiently until we returned back. I kept drinking and my brain was swimming in the gin lagoon. I started reflecting on my past week and how much I've changed in so little time. 
I remember how I would feel sorry for myself and think it couldn't possibly get any worse. Boy, was I mistaken. A few days ago, my biggest dilemma was whether I should convince Oblivio to join forces with Lennis. A day later, my biggest dilemma was whether or not to run away with Kisco. When I was in these moments, I thought these were the most difficult decisions I would ever have to make. Boy, was I mistaken. I changed too. I was struggling with these fairly insignificant decisions. Once Skisco died, my decision to go on the offensive was made very quickly. I didn't doubt or second guess myself. I decided very quickly that I wanted everyone dead. I began to sound a lot like Ciro. Up until that point, I always thought that making the decision was the hardest part. I would struggle making the final decision as I would think about all the repercussions associated with not pursuing the alternatives. I would often envy people who made decisions easily and thought their lives were much simpler. What I realized today was making the decision is far from the hardest part of the process. Making sure the decision goes forward as you wish is the hardest part. Deciding to attack was quite simple, but keeping Lennis convinced was proving to be much more problematic. The grass is always greener on the other side, I suppose. I was so deep in thought that I did not realize we almost made it back to the new compound. Cyril was obliterated as he drank most of the gin bottle himself. Lennis drank about as much but was able to hold her liquor better. She would stumble from time to time but continued to walk normally for most of the journey. When we finally reached, the nebulas greeted us with judging eyes. They were still under the impression that we had no access to alcohol and were surprised that we were all under the influence. They were further surprised that these bottles were empty and there were only three of us. Lennis, as the gracious leader, gave the rest of her bottle to the group while Ciro chugged the last bit of his bottle. He then proceeded to vomit on a nearby bush. What a class act. Oblivio came from behind a few of the others, looked at Lennis and said, Glad you're all having fun, but just to let you know, three of our members did not survive their injuries. Oblivio always knew how to cheer me up. Lennis looked at Oblivio and then the rest. She took a deep breath and tilted her head back. I'll admit, I am drunk. Lennis started to speak. We found alcohol in the secret supplies Bomb has been hiding from all of us. I was also informed by Ciro, who was puking over there. These secrets were far from few in between. Much of the information was hidden from us and we're actually about 2 hours and 33 minutes away from a town. Ciro was constantly coming and going to get supplies and was hired by Bonham for protection. Ciro raised his thumb up and returned to vomiting. I stopped Lennis and told her she should stop her speech because she was drunk. I told her she might end up saying something she would regret. We argued for a bit but then she pushed me aside. I was worried she will use this information to convince the nebulas not to attack. After our little exchange, Oblivio decided to pipe in. You're just drunk and making things up. Bonham wouldn't lie to us like that. Lennis looked at Oblivio. If you only knew, Bonham hid so many things from all of us, Lennis said and Ciro cheered in agreement. Only the internet access and the rest of the story is just told by three drunkards, Oblivio challenged Lennis. Yo, you're welcome to come see the secret supply stash tomorrow. Everything that apparently was not allowed or attainable is there and Bonham was using it daily. We thought we couldn't leave because we were far from civilization, but I saw the town with my own eyes. You all remember how Bonham was against any of us getting involved romantically? Well, me and him have been sleeping together for months. Lennis stopped to take a breath and all of the nebulas gasped. Why are you sharing all this? Oblivio was taking aback. back. Because... She took a deep breath. I'm tired of all the lies. I said I would lead the nebulas and I don't intend to make the same mistakes Bonham made. I think honesty and transparency is far better policy than lies and deception. Our outlook is grim. We are down to 56 members and can be attacked at any moment. We may not live to see tomorrow and I don't want to die believing in some bullshit propaganda. This is our last resort. Tomorrow we'll go to the secret supply stash so that everyone can enjoy the goodies in there. It might be the last time we get a chance to. Nothing has changed. We will storm NASA's building and find out the truth once and for all. The nebulous cheered loudly and surrounded Lennis. I was relieved she did not change her mind. Ciro cheered and stumbled over to Lennis and said, We don't have to wait till tomorrow. He proceeded to pull out three more bottles of gin. Till this day, I have no idea where he hid them. The nebulous cheered even louder and began to partake in the liquid libations. Oblivio seemed disappointed and walked away without drinking anything. He was still against the attack. I decided to stay and celebrate with the rest of the nebulas. I figured, let them enjoy a bit before they walk into their death. Plus, I wanted more gin. Ciro drank most of the bottle we were supposed to share. Everything was going according to plan. Lennis was not backing away and the rest of the nebulas were willing to fight. After all the stress I've been put through, I couldn't wait to get drunk and forget my troubles. 
My mind was mostly mayhem since morning. The only elixir that could shut my brain off was alcohol. At that moment, I did not want to think about anything. The attack, Skisco, Oblivio. I wanted to shut it all down and empty my head from any concerns. Tomorrow was another day that would come, but for now, I enjoyed the peace. Chapter 21 Operation Neutralization It was a treacherous journey up to the now not-so-secret stash. I had a throbbing headache and felt terrible all over. It was official. I was hungover. Every step I took I felt like vomiting, but fortunately I kept it all down. Ciro was surprisingly spry considering the vomit volumes he unleashed from his body the night before. Ciro has taken a liking to me and has not stopped filling my ears with his stories since the night before. At some points, I would have to tell him to stop, because the tales of murder, torture, and ethnic cleansing were getting a little repetitive. When I would tell him to stop, he would do so for exactly 3.4 seconds before beginning another episode of Psycho Zero's Severely Sadistic Stories. My head was pounding and the hike up the mountain was only exacerbating my condition. Ciro kept on pestering me with his tales and I got fed up. Ciro! I yelled. Give it a rest, will ya? Whoa! Ciro was stuck in the back. Why are you so grumpy? I have a terrible hangover. Last night was the first time I drank in month. I explained. Oh, you got the old cats and jammer. Ciro smiled. Cats and pajamas? I had no idea what he was going on about. Nah, cats and jammer. It's a German word for hangover. I spent some time in Germany during- Please don't tell me you were there orchestrating the Holocaust. I interrupted. I thought you always blamed me for that. Oblivio piped up from the back. I looked back and saw him carrying something. I didn't acknowledge his response as I simply did not have the energy. I sensed in his tone he was trying to get under my skin, but I did not let him get to me. In my current state, I felt quite lethargic and feelings of remorse filled my head. I took it upon myself to orchestrate this attack by convincing Lennis and the other nebulas. I was essentially leading all these people to kill NASA employees and be killed by them. After last night, I realized the nebulas were under Bonham's Iron Curtain just as I was. I felt guilty leading them to this battle they had no chance of winning. At that point, the wheels were in motion and it was too late to stop. I continued marching ahead and Ciro continued his blabbering. The nebula spirits were not dwindled and they were ready to fight. My drunken discussions with several of them last night humanized them for me. I saw that they were held captive just like Oblivio and I. The lies and deceit that Bonham perpetrated really took a toll on them. It began to make sense as to why they tied Bonham up that night and why they physically assaulted him. Bonham hid the fact that communication and access to the outside world was readily available. This was the main objection most had to the cause. All the nebulas had lives on the outside and they had to cut ties while on the compound. Many said this was kept from them which made them join under false pretenses. After Lennis revealed all this, the nebulas were shocked. Many have began to stop mourning Bonham's death and regretting their actions against him the night before his death. Many now saw him as a tyrant that imprisoned them for years. I wasn't sure whether the guilt I felt was due to what I found out last night or was it due to the old cats and jammer. I knew I still wanted revenge for Skisco so NASA would still need to get theirs. I contemplated whether the nebulas should be spared as well. I was again faced with a decision that would impact people's lives. It was beginning to be a common occurrence. The one thing I knew for sure was that I wanted Oblivio to survive regardless of what my final decision was. My head was still throbbing and the alcohol was trying to make its way out. I was not sure what to do at this point, but I still had a day hike ahead of me to figure it out. Luckily. We got to the secret stash. Everyone was amazed at all the weapons and other supplies we had. Ciro decided to parade his bazooka again and scared all the nebulas half to death. I was happy that he finally stopped talking to me for a change. We gathered all the supplies we could carry and followed Ciro towards NASA's headquarters. Some of the nebulas decided to partake in the alcohol that remained, but I was in no condition. My hangover was made worse by carrying more weight, so I had no need to poison my body even more. We continued our hike until nightfall and we set up camp so we can sleep that night. Ciro gathered everyone and said, We're about halfway there. We should be reaching our destination by tomorrow at night. Everyone sat down while Ciro started a fire. He of course had to tell everyone the horrific story of how he learned how to make a fire without artificial igniters. It was a long day and everyone was exhausted. Many went to sleep right away, particularly those who enjoyed the alcohol earlier. I lay down on the ground to rest. I was happy I could finally not move and let my body recover. I closed my eyes for a few seconds only to be interrupted by Ciro again. I sat up and asked him what he wanted. He was showing me blueprints of NASA's building. He began to outline his plan of attack. Lennis caught a glimpse and decided to join us. Wonderful. I was going to get no rest. So, we have four possible points of entry, Ciro said and pointed at them on the blueprint. We could split 14 people per entry, but I think we should just hit them all from the front, show them what we got. 
That sounds like a very stupid idea, Lemus chimed in. Well, like Bomb told me, we don't put smart people on inventory duty. Zero paused for a second. No offense, Tedium. None taken. There was some offense taken. Why won't we at least split between the front and the back? Lemus asked. That's risky. If they see us coming, it could wipe out half the crew. Zero explained. All right, why don't we split three ways and attack the side entrances in the back? Lemus continued. This idea is even worse. You can clearly tell you've never done this before. Zero rolled his eyes. Sorry, I'm not some bloodthirsty psychopath. I truly apologize. Lemus sarcastically retorted. They kept on bickering back and forth. I was really just trying to get some sleep. Their voices began to get louder and louder and their insults became nastier. After a few minutes of this, I could not take it any longer, so I let out a loud yell. They stopped arguing and looked at me. Why don't we just bombard every entrance, making it look like we were gonna attack all sides, but actually attack one entrance? I said and lay down on the ground. Cyril and Lennis looked at each other and seemed to agree. That's a pretty good plan! You sure you never planned a coup before? Cyril asked. Yeah, me, Chan, Fidel created the Cuba Libre. I sarcastically answered. They were both satisfied for the moment and left me alone. Finally, I was able to get some sleep. I woke up in a panic because I had a nightmare. I quickly calmed down once I realized the dream was not reality. It was early in the morning and most of the nebulas were still asleep. Some were walking around waiting for Ciro to wake up. I no longer felt a hangover and did not have to listen to Ciro, who slept a little too close to me for my liking. I decided to enjoy these few moments of peace. I looked around to see if Oblivio was up. I looked around and was not able to find him. This made me panic as the nightmare I had was related to Oblivio and his well-being. I walked around trying to find him with no success which only added to my anxiety. I eventually found him some distance away sitting on the ground looking into the distance. I walked over to Oblivio and asked him what he was doing. He shook his head and continued to look into the distance. I tried to multiple times trying to get him to say something but he was still silent. I decided to use a tactic that has worked once before. Well I had sex with your mother, I exclaimed. You know that only works once, right? Oblivio replied. Got you to respond, so it worked twice, I said. What do you want, Tedium? He asked. Wanted to see how you were doing. How I was doing? I thought you were the killer who would stop at nothing. Only a few days ago you told me not to get in your way. I'll tell you how I'm doing. I'm terrified of what's going to happen when we reach our most likely final destination. I've hardly been in any fights, let alone an all-out assault on a government building. Well, technically we were there for the first time the nebulas invaded NASA. Cut the shit, Tedium. Oblivio was in no mood for my quips. I know your feelings towards what happened to Skisco have fueled this bloodlust for revenge. You are not thinking straight. Killing NASA employees and everyone here will not bring her back. You've successfully manipulated everybody here to follow you into the suicide mission. Then you told me you killed someone. I don't even know who you are anymore. You used to be the guy who didn't care and did nothing all day. Now you're some sort of ferocious leader. Oblivio continued babbling. So is that what bothers you? I interrupted. Not being the center of attention, being overshadowed by me? Oblivio took a little too long to say no, and when he did, he looked away. It was silent again. The awkward silence was quickly interrupted by a Nebula member telling us it's time to go. Oblivio and I looked at each other and went ahead. We separated and walked towards our most likely final destination with the other people. Ciro, as always, was glad to tell me his anecdotal atrocities. He never ran out of sadistic stories. I mostly ignored Ciro and was analyzing my interaction with Oblivio. I did not know what to make of our conversation, but I still had half a day hike ahead of me to figure it out, luckily. Oblivion and I have been drifting further and further apart throughout our journey, or whatever one might call it. I had my doubts that we would remain close friends even before we were kidnapped, and the last month in captivity confirmed these doubts. I knew we were completely different people and it was only our childhood friendship and inertia that kept this relationship going, but I always wondered how did we last so long given our vast differences. I knew I stuck around because of my inability to make a decision and my general apathy towards change. I would always change my major at university, but even that became habitual. I was always the same, always constant, not straying from the norm. I did not think about getting a new best friend, that is why I stayed in this friendship. Why did Oblivio stay? I always looked at the world from my point of view and never thought about Oblivio's motives. He would always get mad at me and scold me for doing nothing. I used to think he said these things to motivate me to do better. After a little exchange this morning, I thought Oblivio only stuck around to feel better about himself. He was always the successful one growing up, getting all the praise. I was always the fuck up loser that couldn't get his shit together. He didn't want to surround himself with people who were superior to him because that would make him feel inadequate. It was all starting to add up. Even with the nebulas, he enjoyed being one of the smartest people who was closest to Bonham. He enjoyed it so much in fact that he forgot he was being held captive. He felt good about himself and did not care that I was viewed as a drain on resources. He was the successful one, and I was the fuck-up loser who couldn't get his shit together. The universe was whole. 
The tide began to shift when I was able to get Skisko to talk. I didn't see it at that moment, but Oblivio's reaction to hearing my success was not supportive. He immediately reminded me that I was viewed as a no one and might be kicked out. Our relationship was further strained when the nebulas began to look at me with praise. I thought this would finally bring Oblivio and me closer, but it only drove us further apart. Oblivio was undoubtedly worried about his own safety when considering the attack, but his other worries became clear during our little conversation. He couldn't recognize me anymore because for once, I was the one in charge that everyone listened to. The fuck up loser was no more and Oblivio could not handle that. I kept on walking and thinking about all this that I completely forgot about how likely I was to die in the coming day. It was odd that my mind going into battle was more preoccupied with the dynamic shift in my friendship with Oblivio. Perhaps it was one of the things I wanted to get closure on should I meet my maker. Perhaps the thought of my own life ending was a far more complicated topic to explore than ending a friendship. Either way, something was going to end in the very near future. Even if we were to survive this whole ordeal, our friendship would be over. I was trying to find something that would keep it all together for me and Oblivio, but as Kesko liked to say, there's nothing out there. I was deep in thought and have ignored Ciro for quite some time. I didn't even realize he was talking to me the entire time. He stopped and shook me, which brought me out of my head and back to reality. I was surprised when he said we were about two hours away from our destination. I spent the whole day thinking about Oblivio that I haven't noticed the whole journey. Ciro said we should set up camp soon and attack tomorrow morning. I agreed and he went on to explain the plan to everyone. There was still light out, so we wanted to be far enough from NASA to avoid detection, but not too far. Most of the nebulas were tired from the journey, so we all stopped and set up camp. Once everyone was settled, Lennis approached me and Ciro and wanted to go over the plan of attack. Ciro suggested that all three of us hike up to NASA's headquarters to do some reconnaissance, which would help solidify the plan. Lennis was in agreement, and I was still deep in thought. I sort of went with the flow and joined them. Lennis made sure to let the rest know that we will be back later and to stay put. Ciro and Lennis continued their bickering amongst each other and I walked behind them. They would occasionally ask me to interject, which I answered with a grunt or a moan. They were unfazed by my apathy and continued arguing. My deep thoughts have made me oblivious to the progress of the journey again and Ciro had to shake me back to reality. Ciro took the lead and told us to squat down behind some bushes. We did not want to be seen. We overlooked the headquarters from the top of a small hill. There was still light outside, but the sun was beginning to set. We had to gain as much information as we could quickly to ensure we had sufficient daylight to walk back. Ciro was writing to himself. Lennis looked out into the distance with a concerned look. She had not realized the building would be that secure. I was still in my head about the whole Oblivio situation, but figured I should use this opportunity to see what I was getting myself into. There were quite a lot of military personnel surrounding the building, and there was a secure perimeter around 10.67 meters around the building. Ciro said the perimeter was not there last time. To what I could remember from my original kidnapping, he was correct. They had about 32 soldiers outside and we had no way of knowing how many were inside. This was beginning to look far more challenging than what we originally planned. All their personnel had some high caliber weaponry and Cyrus Bazooka can only do so much. If I were to see this a few days ago, I would have been ecstatic, as it would have meant a lot of dead nebulas. However, after I realized my blame should have been placed on Bonham and not the rest, my mindset has changed. I did not care about the cause more, but I certainly did not want more nebulas death on my conscience. I was feeling worried about tomorrow and looked over at Lennis. She now seemed absolutely mortified. I had a glance at Ciro and he did not seem as confident as he was before. The plan was starting to fall apart. The option to quit was always available, but we really had no other plans. The compound had been destroyed and we have come all this way. While I was considering all of our options, I noticed a familiar figure float to the front door. An overweight woman in her 50s. I could never forget Amabilia, the world's most timid interrogator. The ying to Maxilla's yang. I followed her with my eyes and noticed she went on a smoke break. She smiled and waved at the security personnel, but they ignored her. She was walking a fair distance away from them, which they still ignored. I looked at Ciro and said, Ciro, I have a plan. Go kidnap that woman over there. Ciro looked over to Amabilia and then back at the troops and said, Piece of cake! Though she probably had too many of those! He walked away chuckling to himself. I stopped him and reminded him that we needed her alive and to be discreet. He nodded and proceeded to stealthily walk through the bushes and trees until he got to her. Lennis looked at me with confusion. I explained to her that we can use her for information. I reassured Lennis that Amabilia was hardly a threat. If her interrogation techniques were an indication of anything, she would not put up much of a fight. Lennis was still confused and worried, but understood that this will be the only way we can know what's going on the inside of the building. We had 56 barely trained people going against 32 professionals on the outside alone. The element of surprise could only have taken us so far. I looked down the hill and saw Ciro was able to snatch Amabilia up without being noticed. He began walking away with her in hand, so I told Lennis we should head after him. There was not much daylight left, so it was a perfect time to head back to the rest. We met up with Ciro and a terrified Amabilia quite some distance from NASA's headquarters. Amabilia was so shocked that she did not even scream for help, which helped us not being noticed. Ciro looked at me, smiled, and exclaimed, Look what I found! We started walking back and figured we should start asking questions immediately. We had over an hour walk. 
Amabilia was still confused and followed our lead. Ciro did a great job at intimidating her into compliance. I decided to go ahead and start the questioning. Hello, Amabilia. How do you know my name? She gasped. We've met before. You interrogated me a few months ago. I answered. Oh, yes. Tedium. What's new and exciting? She seemed to have loosened up. Well, we're going to attack the NASA building tomorrow. That's pretty exciting. I sarcastically answered. What? Tomorrow? But tomorrow is where your favorite Team Jersey Day. What? I was very confused. It was my initiative to improve employee morale. Out with the traditional suit and tie and in with the attire that shows off your personality. She giddily answered. I think you're not fully comprehending what I just said. We're attacking the building tomorrow. Trust me, employee morale will be very low. And it's not because they couldn't show off their favorite jersey. I explained. It's funny you say that, but research has shown morale can be greatly improved when one can express their individuality. Amabilia finished speaking and Lennis, Ciro and I looked at each other with confusion. All right, I'm gonna gut this bitch! Ciro said and moved towards her. Wait! I stopped him. We still need information from her. Information? Amabilia perked up. Do you want to hear about some other fun initiatives I had planned? We're going to have a bake sale on Friday and the proceeds are going- Shut up! I interrupted. We don't care about the initiatives or employee morale. What are you hiding in there? I'm not sure about the day-to-day -day operations. Uh, those questions are better directed to our public relations representative. He can be reached at- I don't care about that. I had to interrupt again. Our back and forth continued for quite some time. I would ask a question and Amabilia would say she did not know. She made sure to tell us about all of her initiatives and I made sure to tell her to stop talking about that. My patience was beginning to run thin and Ciro was frosting at the mouth every time she spoke. I had to hold him back several times. He was ready to kill her after every word she uttered. The one thing my interrogation concluded was that Amabilia definitely knew nothing about what NASA was doing. In fact, I'm sure she knew very little in general. When I asked her if she knew what NASA actually did, she just looked up, smiled and said something with spaceships. We had a real dummy on our hands here. This was no surprise as I think missing brain cells are a requirement to work for HR. We were approaching the others and had received no viable information from Amabilia. I was about to let Ciro have his way with her but Lennis decided to ask a question. Can you at least tell us how many soldiers are inside? Zero, Amabilia said. Not a single soldier? Lennis was surprised. Yes, we felt as though as the whole soldiers in the office thing was bringing down the employee morale so we decided to keep them outside. After the initial attack, many of the employees felt like we were in a war zone which was really bringing everybody down. Amabilia explained. That's good news, Lennis said and looked at us. It was my initiative actually, Amabilia said with pride. We tied and gagged Amabilia away from the rest of the nebulas. This was for our own safety as we've all grown tired of hearing about her HR initiatives. At that point, if I heard her say initiatives one more time, I would have likely beaten her to death with an HR manual myself. Her incompetence did help us reduce the number of security personnel indoors to zero, so we only had to focus on the 32 outside. Lennis, Ciro and I were relieved when we heard that, so the attack was back on. We still had to figure out the exact details of the plan, but at least our spirits were high. Amabilia was definitely good at improving morale, for NASA and the Nebulas. Our biggest challenge was to get inside. After that, it would have been easy as NASA employees did not have guns. We did outnumber them by about 1.75 to 1 and we had the element of surprise. They did have better training and weapons, so we needed to tip the scales more in our favor. Lennis, Sarah and I discussed what could be done to cause a bigger diversion than just a bazooka explosion. We knew we had to separate some of the troops from the rest. Lennis came up with the idea to use Amabilia as bait. She said one of the nebulas should take Amabilia at gunpoint and present themselves to the troops. When security would notice Amabilia, a few troops would surely go and try to rescue her. The hope was to lure enough troops away and have the bazooka blast help with the rest. The nebulas were still untrained, but as long as we had 55 people storming down against 10 to 15 trained military personnel, the chances were in our favor. We would also have the element of surprise. We all agreed that this plan would work best. We were not naive to believe that all the nebulas would survive the attack, but we would definitely have a few survivors at the end that could find out the truth. The person that would hold Amabili at gunpoint was essentially walking into an ambush. They needed to understand that they are walking into a chaotic situation where they would not return alive. Ciro volunteered immediately to be that person. We returned back to the rest and Lennis shared our findings. She said that tomorrow we should execute our attack and for everyone to rest. She gave a very compelling speech which riled up the crowd. The nebulas were still cheering after she mentioned that most would likely not survive the attack. I was impressed. She had a way with words that was definitely better than me, Ciro and even Bonham. She was the best choice for leader among this whole group. I made sure to tell her that once she was done giving her speech. She appreciated my kind words and thanked me for all my help. I found it funny, because when we first met, we could not say one nice thing to each other. Now we were closer than ever. Similarly, Oblivion and I were close before and now could have not been further apart. I realized things change over time, but that did not make the transition any easier. I looked over at Oblivio, but he was looking the other way. 
I thought I should go over and say something as tomorrow might be our last day breathing. I then remembered our morning interaction and decided against it. I was not going to preoccupy my mind with the ending of our friendship anymore. I had bigger issues to tackle, like my own mortality. Those thoughts depressed me, so eventually I decided to get some sleep. I laid down and looked at the stars. They were actually quite beautiful considering they were just balls of light. I gazed at the stars for a few minutes and fell asleep. After all, it is the most boring activity known to man. I awoke to the sound of Ciro yelling, Rise and shine! Let's go show them what we're made of! I was still feeling groggy, not that sleeping on the ground wasn't great. I looked around and most of the nebules were waking up as well. Some have partaken in the remaining alcohol last night and were struggling worse than me to get up. I stood up and stretched, not that sleeping on the ground wasn't great. We began to pack everything we needed and made our way. The mood was somber. You can see in people's expression that they knew they might die today. I didn't spot Oblivio, but Ciro was rushing me so I kept on going. We picked up Amabilia on the way and kept her gagged. I didn't want to hear about any more of her initiatives. Luckily, Ciro volunteered to tell me more about his past atrocities while walking towards committing more atrocities. To be fair, I'd much rather hear Ciro's sadistic stories than Amabilia's annoying anecdotes. Lennis caught up with me and Ciro. She thought it would be a good idea to split into two teams. One could attack the back and one could attack the opposite entrance Ciro and Amabilia would be at. Ciro agreed and told Lennis that was a great idea. They actually continued the rest of the way without arguing. Perhaps Ciro knew his minutes were numbered and did not want to spend them on useless bickering. When I saw how amicable they were acting, I thought I should find Oblivio and make peace with him. I looked around but couldn't find him. Lennis and Ciro kept asking for my input as well, which hindered my attempts at finding him. We reached our destination. NASA's headquarters were in sight. Lennis broke down the plan to the rest of the nebulas while Ciro took Amabilia and walked towards his position. She split us into two teams arbitrarily down the middle. I was on Lennis's team. Our team was going to take the back entrance while the other team was going to storm the side entrance. This was only going to happen after Ciro lured enough troops away, and the bazooka did its damage, of course. After the split, I looked backwards and finally spotted Oblivio. He was on my team, luckily. We locked eyes but had to remain quiet to avoid being spotted by NASA. Though we couldn't say our potentially final words to each other, we had a non-verbal understanding. I nodded my head and he nodded his. Whether we were thinking the same thing at the moment is another story altogether. Ciro was almost in position and our two teams split to be closer to the respective entrances. All the nebulas were quiet, clenching their weapons. Some of the people looked petrified and some had more of a neutral grimace. We were all waiting for Ciro to begin his rampage and hoping he lured enough troops away. We were all also hoping that the bazooka blast took care of most of the remaining troops. Everyone began to tense up but remained quiet. Everyone was showing a nervous tick of some kind. It resembled the composed anger I used to see in Oblivio when I was talking to him in class. I looked back at him and got a reminder which made me smile. The smile quickly faded as I remembered what was coming up and I saw Ciro was making his way towards the troops. Ciro approached the troops. I couldn't hear what he was saying but I heard faint sounds of yelling. The yelling was then followed by several gunshots which came from Ciro's gun I presume. Slowly, I noticed the troops began to aim their weapons at him and Amabilia and followed him into the forest. I couldn't see Ciro anymore but I still heard gunshots and yells. He was able to lure about 6 troops away. When we couldn't see the troops anymore, Lennis gave the order to start firing the bazooka. We wanted to make sure this was done quickly to avoid the remaining soldiers changing their formation to better protect the building. The rocket was fired and made its way towards the building. I wasn't sure where it would hit as the person firing it only had a crash course from Ciro the day before. Luckily, the rocket hit right in the middle and took out several troops. The chaos and panic were set in motion and Lennis called out telling both teams to charge. We started running down the hill making our voices heard. The nebulas in the front were firing their weapons further confusing the troops who were still standing. After several minutes most of the troops were either dead or injured. A few troops managed to get inside the building and barricaded themselves inside. I looked for Ciro and the other troops when we made it to the bottom of the hill but they were nowhere to be found. A few of the nebulas tried to rush through the entrances but were shot by the troops who made it indoors. I knew we had to fire another rocket and told our bazooka carrier to fire one straight at the back entrance. I was not anticipating the blast to be so powerful. It took out the door, parts of the wall and several nebulas that were closer to it. I was far enough not to get hurt, but my ears were ringing loudly. Once the smoke cleared, I could see the troops that were inside were now incapacitated. I felt somebody touching my shoulder. I turned around and saw it was Oblivio shouting at me. I could not make out what he was saying, but his hand was gesturing to move forward. I nodded and we ran towards the building. We were the only ones who went inside. Many of the nebulas were taken down by NASA and the blast. We entered the building, which was in shambles. Walls were filled with bullet holes, fixtures were hanging from the ceiling, and all the employees were trying to escape in panic. All the troops were down, so Oblivio and I only had to threaten the NASA employees and they would run the other way. I had a vague recollection of where Dex's office was, so Oblivio and I proceeded to go there. Most of the employees left the building and the hallways were empty. I was worried that ducks already escaped in the middle of all this chaos. We were scouring every room on our way, but they were all empty. Even Dux's office had no signs of life. We 
We kept looking and looking to see if we could find anyone at that point. Anyone that could point us to ducks. Where do you think she went? I asked Oblivio. She could be anywhere, he answered. We walked around the debris-filled hallways for a few minutes when suddenly we heard a sound. It was coming from behind the staircase. I raised my rifle and went to check it out and Oblivio was close behind me. I looked behind the staircase. It was ducks hugging her knees and shaking in fear. I pointed my rifle at her and she started shaking even more. No, please don't kill me, she whimpered. You kidnapped me and killed my love. Now it's your time to die, I said and began squeezing the trigger. Wait, Oblivio said and grabbed the barrel of my gun. If we kill her, we won't get answers. I don't care what they're hiding. I told you I'm here for revenge, I said and pointed the rifle at her again. Aren't you a little curious? We can kill her after we find out, Oblivio pleaded and I agreed. I'm not telling you anything, Ducks cried. Listen, you're gonna die either way. At this point, it's about how painful and long do you want it to be, Oblivio threatened her. Trust me, I'm very eager to inflict pain onto you. I said and hit her in the stomach with the butt of my rifle. What are you hiding? Why all the secrecy? Oblivio pressed her. There's nothing out there. Ducks whispered and coughed in pain. You don't get to say that. I said and raised my rifle again, but Oblivio calmed me down. What do you mean there's nothing out there? Oblivio asked. The universe, galaxies, stars, it's it's all a lie. There's nothing out there. We've been fabricating all this information for years. Existence ends about 104.67 kilometers from the Earth's surface, Duck said in a shaky voice. That's impossible. That doesn't even make sense. If you're going to lie, you might as well use aliens again. Oblivio scoffed. I'm not lying. That is the truth. Why do you think all these inconsistencies happen that you guys keep on pestering us about? But how can that be? How can't... Oblivio was struggling to speak. Where did you get all your information about the cosmos? From us and the people before us. We made it all up, Ducks explained. Oblivio sat down on the floor and was confused. He could not utter a single word. I was also bewildered, but I thought that Ducks was trying to pull some sort of stunt on us to stay alive. The more I kept thinking about it, though, the more it made sense. Skiesko's psychotic yells of there's nothing out there, the inconsistencies. It was all adding up to the non-existence of the universe. There were still a lot of unanswered questions to the motives behind this conspiracy, but in essence, I believe Ducks. I still wanted to kill her, but her words sparked my curiosity. I decided to keep her alive until we found out the whole truth. Chapter 22. It was all for nothing. I pulled ducks outside the building to meet with the rest. Oblivio was walking quietly behind me as he was still in shock. I stepped outside and saw a lot of bodies lying on the ground. At this point, I was already quite desensitized to death. Most of the nebulas did not survive and some were injured pretty badly. I was going to take count, but there was something else piquing my interest. Ducks. This time, it was not due to her being a short brunette, but for what she had to say. The few injured nebulas that could move came and surrounded us. Lennis was among them, and she seemed unscathed. I explained to the group what Ducks has said so far, which was met with shock and awe. Most were in arms claiming Ducks was lying to hide the real truth. Lennis decided to take over the interrogation. She looked at Ducks and asked her to confirm what I said. Ducks nodded to her, indicating that it was all true. How is that even possible? Lennis threw her arms in the air. It's not about how it's possible, it is how it is. I didn't create the planet, I just know how it all works. Ducks explained. That's preposterous. You lied before and you're lying now. Just tell us the truth already. How many more have to die? Lennis was getting frustrated. It is the truth. I'm not going to gain anything by lying anymore. Ducks let out a loud sigh. Can you even prove this? Yes, but it'll take about a day. How convenient. Lennis shook her head. How? I decided to ask. We need to drive up to the space station. From there, we can take a space shuttle up to the edge of existence. Ducks explained. What's that even like? A wall of some kind? I continued questioning. It's hard to explain, but I've personally seen it. Lennis walked away because she couldn't take it anymore. The other nebulas were murmuring amongst each other. Oblivio was still distraught sitting on the ground. I was going to ask more questions, but it was interrupted by a NASA security personnel which approached us. He was unarmed with his arms in the air saying he was surrendering. I told him to sit next to ducks where I kept my rifle pointed at them. The soldier was one of the ones that followed Ciro into the woods. He seemed mortified, so I asked him what happened. He was shaking recalling the last hour of his life. Ciro killed all the troops that went after him along with Amabilia. The soldier barely escaped. He said that he had never seen such a psychopath. Him and the other troops put about 36 bullets in him and he was still fighting back like nothing happened. He started telling me what Ciro did to Amabilia, but ended up vomiting and couldn't finish the story. The soldier mentioned that eventually Ciro died with his eyes open and a huge smile on his face. I guess he died doing what he loved, destabilizing a government institution. I still had questions and decided to keep asking. Ducks was answering all of them. She described the journey that we should take up there. 
Once we reach the space station, we will need to get on the space shuttle to take us up 104.67 kilometers into the air. According to her, that was the highest we could go because there was nothing beyond that point. She went on to explain that all the space shuttle launches we have seen on television were essentially a hoax. The shuttles would usually only reach the mesosphere before landing at another location. Very few of the shuttles actually went all the way to the edge of existence. There was a docking station there that the shuttles could connect. We could get out there and touch the edge of existence, which was referred to as the Margo Wall. I was fascinated listening to Dux's every word, but I could tell that the other nebulas, the scientists, were much more skeptical. What she was saying was going against everything that they have learned. Most would shake their heads and interrupt to say that what was being said was nonsense. After some time, Lendis decided to return from her little walk of rage. She stomped her feet as she approached Dux. Her face was red with anger. She pointed at Dux and said, Enough with the bullshit! No universe? It makes utterly no sense! How did this all come to be then if not for the Big Bang? I don't know. Dux shrugged her shoulders. God, probably? You must think you're so funny! How do you explain all the stars that we have seen through the telescopes? How do you explain the day and night cycle caused by the Earth orbiting the Sun? The moon landing? You could have stuck to your alien fib, at least that one made sense. Lena spoke until she was out of breath. Well... Dux took a deep breath. Those stars you see are really just balls of light. I knew it! I interjected. We have yet to find their real purpose. We know that they move around the Margot wall, but from what we gather, they're mostly decorative. The only things on the wall that actually have a function are what most people call the sun and the moon, Dux explained. Right, Lena sarcastically answered. There's no sun, how could I forget? It's not like it's shiny right now. Quit your bullshit. Of course the sun exists, but it's not a star that is light years away. It is a round dot on the wall which provides heat and light. It does move along the wall with the moon dot which creates the day and night cycle, Dux explained. Lennis kept firing questions at Dux, and Dux was explaining everything without skipping a beat. Lennis still didn't buy it, but I could see that she was starting to have more and more doubts about what she has known to be true. After a while, I realized the only way we could figure out if Dux was lying was to actually go see the Smargo wall at the altitude of 104.67. I stopped the dames debating, demanding a demonstration of what has been discussed. Dux reluctantly agreed and insisted the soldier come with her to fly the shuttle. Lennis agreed as well. I looked at Oblivio who was still at loss. I asked him if he wanted to join and he mumbled something. I decided that meant he agreed to join. Dux mentioned that only six people could fit in the shuttle, so we decided that only five of us will go. Aside from the fact that I like to put my feet up, most of the surviving nebulas were in no condition to be taking a trip like this. I found some handcuffs on one of the deceased troops and put them on Dux and the surviving soldier. Dux pointed us towards the nearest vehicle and we walked towards it. I had to drag Oblivio as he was still not fully there. I told Lennis and Oblivio to take the back seat with the soldier in the middle. I took the driver's seat with Dux in the passenger seat. I thought this would be the best way to guarantee we would get there safely. I made sure to mention to them that if they try anything we would not hesitate to kill them. After all, we were only keeping them alive to find out the truth. I looked through the rearview mirror and saw Oblivio was looking out the window, absent-minded. I turned around and told him to snap out of it and to watch the soldier. I started the car and we were on our way. The car ride was silent at first. The soldier was looking through the windshield and the rest was staring out the side windows. I was watching the road and trying to make sense of everything. I understood what Dux was saying, but unlike the rest, I was not interested in debating the logistics of how the Earth functioned without the other planets. I was more interested with why this lie was created and perpetuated this whole time. Dux described a fairly simplistic concept which most people could understand. The story they sold the public was far more complex and intricate. I remember reading my astronomy textbook. I would read the same paragraph multiple times and still not understand the thing. Was this lie pushed to confuse the public? I was trying to wrap my head around the motives and could not come up with a single plausible answer. I wanted to ask Dux some questions but was worried Lennis would hijack the conversation again. I looked at the rearview mirror and saw Lennis was dozing off, so I decided to wait until she passed out. I looked over at Dux and she seemed wide awake. When Lennis finally closed her eyes, I turned to Dux and quietly asked her if she knew the motivation behind this cosmic conspiracy. She started speaking rather stridently, so I said to be more silent, signaling towards Lennis' side. Dux understood and started to speak softly. Oblivion noticed she was talking and leaned in so he could hear better. He seemed much more focused, which was a huge improvement over his distracted demeanor. In essence, this all boils down to two things, money and politics, Dux concluded. Dux went on to explain how NASA kept on raking in millions in government funding for research. This has started out in the millions and has grown to be in the billions of dollars. The more complicated it would make something sound, the more likely the politicians who approved the budget were to be confused by it. Dux chuckled when she was telling us about some experiences she had with some upper echelon politicians. She said that most of the times politicians did not want to appear ignorant and ask for clarification, so they ended up praising the scientists for their work. 
Once she had one politician on board, others would join as they did not want to seem like they were the stupid ones. It sounded absolutely crazy, but it worked like a charm. The budget kept on growing and growing and the scam became more lucrative. Doug said that government funding provided some great steady income, but it paled in comparison to merchandise sales. Telescopes, lenses, textbooks, software scopes, dew removers, focusers, the list was endless. Universities, schools, research facilities, and millions of backyard astronomers worldwide produced a healthy revenue stream. I looked back at Oblivio when she was talking about this point, and I could see that he was calculating how much he has spent over the years on everything she mentioned. NASA owned a piece of the pie of all sales of the equipment needed and ensured new information came to light so that new textbooks can be printed. It was working well for a while, but there was never a cohesive plan to verify all the made-up information matched up to each other. The inconsistencies started showing up in great numbers which led to the creation of several groups, like the Nebulas. Oblivio took a break from calculating the money pit his hobby has cost him and asked Ducks a question. Wait, how is NASA still making money? Didn't you just hear I told you we have revenues and government funding in excess of 40 billion dollars? Ducks didn't understand Oblivio. But your organization has expenses, large expenses. The newest technology and talent in the country doesn't come cheap. The space shuttles alone cost billions. Oblivio was beginning to raise his voice. Well, all the numbers we report to the media are overinflated. If we didn't max out our budget every year, we would receive less money the next year. Plus, our biggest expense in the last few years was protection against organizations like yours. Ducks paused momentarily. In hindsight, I should have not pinched pennies on that one. We were netting over 20 billion a year for fuck's sakes. I could have spent a million more on security. I even cheaped out on the extraction team. I should have fired a Bowden's ages ago. All he does is talk about his fucking petunias. So you just lie to the people to make money? Where are your morals? Oblivio asked almost in tears. Morals? What do they have to do with anything? In fact, it's immoral to turn down a seven-figure salary in my opinion. Ducks scoffed. The conversation between Oblivio and Ducks began to be more heated. I would have stopped it, but I had to keep my eyes on the road. We reached a particularly winding road with poor lighting, which required my full attention. It soon turned into a screaming match, which woke up Lennis. Lennis calmed everybody down and diffused the situation. Wait, no, she did the exact opposite. I had to keep my attention on the road while all three were yelling insults at each other. Lennis got so upset that she pulled up her rifle and pointed it at Ducks, threatening to shoot her. The soldier quickly grabbed it from her hands and I slammed the brakes. Oblivio began reaching for his gun, but could not find it. Looking for this? The soldier asked, showing Oblivio his gun. How did you get free from the handcuffs? I yelled. These things? He lifted the open handcuffs. These are pretty easy. I train with these handcuffs and know how to get out of them. Please don't kill us! Oblivio cried out. You think I couldn't have killed you all this time? The soldier spoke and everyone seemed confused. I took your gun while you were looking out the window. I got out these handcuffs before we even got in the vehicle. You guys are amateurs, and I'm a trained professional. If I wanted you dead, you would have been dead already. Why haven't you killed us then? I asked. You kidding me? I'm going to see the Margot Wall. This shit is blowing my mind. I want to see if she's telling the truth. The soldier exclaimed. You were not in on it? Lennis asked. Hell no, he enunciated. I was just a hired gun who wasn't even paid nearly as much as he should have been. He looked at Ducks as she hung her head low. I got no loyalty to her. I want to find out the truth. Matter of fact, let me drive. Your driving sucks. We'll never get there with your geriatric driving. I switched seats with the soldier for two reasons. I was tired of driving, and he now outgunned us. I was relieved to find out he was just as curious as us to find out what has been happening. This way, we only had to worry about ducks escaping. Another benefit of the soldier being on our side was that Lennis or Oblivio will behave a lot better. They were scared to death of the soldier and would not want to step out of line. I couldn't tell for sure, but I think he liked me the most out of all three. He could have interfered at any moment, but chose to do so when Lennis and Oblivio were shouting. I thought he liked my line of questioning, as it did not resort to childish name-calling. For two scientists that wanted to find out the truth, Oblivio and Lennis sure did a lot of arguing against it. Oblivio and Lennis sat quietly, and I decided to ask some more questions. I could see the motive behind all of this because greed is probably the biggest motivator for most humans. I was beginning to question Ducks about the history of all this. Surely, a conspiracy of such astronomical proportions could have not sprung overnight. NASA was not the only space agency in the world. How did all of them agree on keeping this conspiracy going? Ducks was answering my questions and completely turned off her filter. She was swearing like a sailor who sat on his sack. It was hard to make out the story between all those expletives. According to Ducks, this, like most of America's decisions, boiled down to the competition with the Soviets. The space race began in 1956. America announced the intention to launch an artificial satellite. And the Soviet announced the same two days after. 
This was the beginning of the space race, or dick measuring contest, as ducks called it. The Soviets, or those dirty commies, as ducks referred to them, took an early lead which put a substantial pressure on then-president Dwight D. Eisenhower. In turn, he decided to set up a new organization, NASA, which would specialize in the civilian space program. By 1961, the first satellite was launched by the Soviets, the famous Sputnik took flight, and Yuri Gagarin completed his first human spaceflight. Things were looking grim for the old US of A. The pressure was on NASA to produce some serious results. This was not just a technological race, but an ideological one as well. The US government needed to show the world that communism was just a pipe dream that cannot work. The freedom of democracy had to generate better results for the common good. Or blah blah blah, as ducks refer to it. The ideological tide was starting to change from defeating the Soviets by actual technological advancement to fabricating feel-good stories to the media. It started with small fibs that were hard to verify at first, but more creative liberties were taken later. All the fibs were still fairly insignificant until one day it all changed. Valentina Tereshkova became the first woman to enter space. The news shocked the world. The Soviet did not only send a man to space, but now also a woman. When Dux was discussing Tereshkova, Lenis decided to interject. Why would it matter that they sent a woman to space? The change in social dynamics, those dirty commies showed that they are more progressive in their technologies and their views on human rights, Dux explained. Okay, Lenis scoffed. So the government invented the universe for women's rights? You're not making any sense. Can you at least think your lies through? What the fuck is the matter? Hey, the soldier intervened. Let's keep it civil. You have to understand one thing. It was the Cold War. It's not about whether the government cared about women. They didn't and still don't. This was a struggle to show which ideology produces the best results. We sold the American dream to the world, a place where everyone is free to do as they wish. This freedom was supposed to produce the best scientists, athletes, etc. How could it be such a free place if women hardly had the freedom of employment and higher education? Ducks went on. Women were in the workforce by that point though, Lennis proclaimed. They were, but in low-level positions. Forget about science and math. Most women were still homemakers. The Soviet Union gave women the right to work way before the US did. Same goes for other women issues like abortion and marital rape. Those dirty commies were way ahead of those issues than the good old US of A, Ducks continued. But they didn't have the right to vote, Lennis argued back. True, but neither did the men. So in reality, there were equal rights between men and women, Ducks rebutted. Lennis was at a loss for words. Dux smirked because she knew Lennis had no rebuttal. Dux was about to continue speaking, but the soldier indicated we were approaching the space station. We sat quietly while going through all the security checkpoints. The whole process was pretty smooth as Dux had the highest level of security clearance. We drove up to one of the shuttles and the soldier parked the vehicle. We got out of the car and followed Dux towards the shuttle. We had to put on some gear to make sure our bodies can handle the change in atmospheric pressure. Once we were all set, we went into the shuttle and buckled in. The soldier went through all the launch procedures. How much time until we reach? Oblivio asked. Looks like it'll be a few hours. The soldier looked at the coordinates. And my name is Miles, by the way. Not that anyone asked. The soldier seemed upset. I asked Dux to continue explaining the whole ordeal while the soldier launched the shuttle. It was difficult to hear her during liftoff, but became easier as time progressed. After Tereshkova, the real big lies began. Dux went on to explain that most of the Gemini missions never actually happened. It was around that time that NASA began to realize how much their funding increased when they showed their victories to the world. Dux stressed that though during this time much of the accomplishments were false, some research was still being done yielding legitimate results. She mentioned Ed White's spacewalk. I knew nothing about this, but Lennis and Oblivio seemed to follow what she was saying. Dux took a moment to take a breath. I did have something on my mind, so I decided to ask. So were the Soviets in this conspiracy with NASA? Capitalists and communists in the 1960s working together? Ducks laughed. Absolutely not. Wait, Lennis chimed in. Your story doesn't add up. If the Soviets had all their discoveries independent of NASA, how would they have missed something as big as the non-existence of the universe? They went up to space too. How come they found out the same things we found? Those dirty commies found nothing. They either made it all up or copied what we did, Ducks explained. Well, how convenient for you. Lennis sarcastically uttered. I sense your sarcasm, but I don't know what's hard to imagine. The Soviet Union lying to the world? They didn't even tell the world the nuclear reactor melted in Chernobyl until other countries noticed radiation levels rise up. Ducks raise her arms. Even if they lied, how do you discount all the other great thinkers of our time? They used telescopes and found out things that were later verified by scientists. Lennis cried. Oh lord. Ducks shook her head. Who are you referring to? The ancient Greeks and Romans? They just made stuff up all the time. 
Most of their culture was built on listening to oracles. Oracles that were drugged and sexually abused underage girls, I might add. They were also pretty much fine with being pederast and thought that knowledge was transmitted sexually. These are the people you think got it right? Lennis was at a loss for words. I believe that is the usual response when someone brings up molested kids. Ducks went on to berate the greatest ancient astronomers and thinkers one by one, or those primival pederasts as Ducks referred to them. She went on to say that the Soviets were tasked with a stricter burden of proof for their fabrication because, at that point, humans needed photos or video evidence to believe something. In the days of ancient humans, people just took their word for it. Ducks went on a tirade about the Romans and Greeks again, so I asked her to stay on topic. She then began berating the Soviets. She had a lot of hate in her heart. I understood everything that has happened until that point, but one item was still missing. When did NASA find out about the non-existence? I stopped Ducks' hate speech to clarify this point. She explained that NASA found out about the Margo Wall on December 1968 during their Apollo 8 mission. The plan was to orbit the moon. The entire crew almost died crashing into it, but ended up slowing down at the last moment. The crew got credited with being the first humans to orbit the moon, which technically was true, but the moon they orbited was not a mass of rock and metal. It was merely a ball of light. When they returned with this information back to NASA, everyone was shocked. Some of the scientists couldn't believe it, but the evidence was right there in front of them. That was the true day the space race ended. Finding out the Margo Wall wasn't the only discovery that day. NASA also discovered that the Soviets were fabricating information this whole time. It was at this time the decision was made to fake the moon landing to defeat the communist threat once and for all. The risks were great, so NASA hired the best set designers and actors Hollywood had at that point. Ducks joked about if the Soviets had a better film industry, they would have landed on the moon first. NASA officials knew that the Soviets would not be able to deny this as fact on the world stage as it would risk their own lies being brought to light. It was similar to the mutually assured destruction doctrine, but with lies in the seat as opposed to nuclear weapons. After that, Ducks claimed the rest was history. NASA had the largest win which guaranteed plenty of funding for the years to come. Moreover, the rest of the world looked up to NASA for information and assistance, which meant more dollars funneled into NASA's pockets. The secret was safe until some scientists started picking holes and realized something was up. Most of them never reached as far as we have. Lennis was still skeptical and made sure we all knew about it. Oblivio sat quietly and hasn't said a word. I believe ducks, but also kept quiet. I wanted to see the Margo Wall before saying anything. Lennis kept on making a spectacle of her skepticism until ducks said we're only minutes away from docking the shuttle. Lennis and ducks kept bickering back and forth until the soldier yelled at both of them to be quiet. I asked Oblivio if he was fine, to which he nodded and looked at the floor. It was hard to see the docking station through the bullseye window, so we had to wait to fully experience this infamous wall which has caused so much trouble. My anxiety was going through the roof, and my hands started to shake. The shuttle finally docked and the soldier said we could now exit the shuttle. We went out of the shuttle onto the dock. I looked around me and can only see black with dots of light. It looked the same as the sky that night that I went stargazing with Oblivio except closer. Ducks was right, it was difficult to describe. It didn't seem like a wall, but rather an endless void. I reached out to touch it and was met with resistance. I couldn't go past the black wall. I tried touching the glowing lights and could not penetrate through either. It didn't feel like a traditional wall or barrier. I've never felt anything like this. I looked down to see what the earth looked like from this perspective. It looked like all those photos I've seen before. I looked at Lennis and Oblivio frantically touching the Margo wall. They were pushing on it and punching it saying it can't be. The soldier was stunned but kept quiet. Ducks stood there with her arms crossed. I could see she had a smirk on her face. I was confused and was trying to make sense of it all. I asked Ducks, what's behind this wall? Ducks looked at me and said, nothing. Lennis cried out, how can it be? There has to be something. She went back to punching the wall, eventually collapsing onto the dog plate on her knees. She wept hysterically until she grabbed her knees close to her chest and laid down in the fetal position. Oblivio sat down on the dog plate as well, looking destroyed. I came up to him and shook him, asking if he was fine, but he didn't respond. He kept on looking forward, being unbothered by my actions. I shook him for several minutes and then stopped as I was not getting a reaction. I saw his lower lip began to quiver and he was whispering something under his breath. I knelt down closer to him and I heard him say, There's nothing out there. The End Thank you for listening. This has been Miles Danko, the author and narrator of this book. I hope you enjoyed it, as I did not enjoy any second of recording this audiobook except the finishing part of it, as I did not expect it to be so much work.
So if you didn't enjoy this book, you can take solace in the fact that you and I both hate this audiobook the same way. If you did enjoy it though, I'm glad you did. Uh, you can definitely contact me and let me know. I always like the praise. Uh, if you didn't like it, you can still let me know that I'm an idiot and I should never write again. Both are equally appreciated. Thank you so much.